Myers? Here. Peterson, here. Ray? Here. Williams? Here. Weininger? Here. Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Moving into item number four, Board of Education Committee recognition, and I'll turn it over to Superintendent Kane. Good evening, board directors, audience. Um, we are here this evening where we want to recognize the amazing volunteers and community members who have served on our Douglas County School District Board Committees. These individuals have completed their service, so most of them weren't able to be here tonight, but I still want to make sure we recognize them. We want to take a moment to say thank you to these volunteers who have served our district, volunteered their time um, to advise the Board of Education and to serve our district. We recognized outgoing members of the Student Advisory Committee last month. So tonight, we will thank the outgoing members of the District Accountability Committee, the Fiscal Oversight Committee, Long Range Planning Committee, and the Mill Bond Ad Hoc Oversight Committee. So let's start with outgoing members of the District Accountability Committee. This committee, often refers to as DAC, meets monthly throughout the year. DAC makes recommendations to the board on a variety of topics, including budget priorities, our district improvement plan, educator evaluation rubrics, and much more. With the following committee members, if you're here tonight, please join me up front. Stephanie George, Siri Goslin, and Stephanie Murphy. I don't think any of them were able to make it, but we want to make sure that we thank them for their service. I wonder if Dak Chair Chester Shaw would be willing to come up to take their certificates? No? <laughs> well, you can help us applaud uh, these members too. <laughs> Dak Chair uh, Chester Shaw. <laughs> you are welcome to say something if you would like to about the do that. Yeah, thank you. All right, great. So we have uh, three outstanding uh, DAC members here that have done a great job at their, their terms with DAC. Cannot say enough. Um, DAC works very well with the diverse group of individuals that we have. Uh, these three definitely will be missed. So just thank you for all their hard work. Thanks. And for your work, Chester. Thank you. All right, next is the Fiscal Oversight Committee. The Fiscal Oversight Committee assists the Board of Education in fulfilling its fiscal oversight responsibilities. The FOC gathers information, reviews facts, and makes recommendation to the Board in areas of budget, accounting, audit, and financial reporting, banking, and other fiscal matters as assigned by the Board, and in fact, will be doing so tonight. So I'd love to have former Fiscal Oversight Committee Chair Jim Mars come join us up front so that we can thank him for his uh, dedication and service to our school district. Thanks for everything. All right, can we wait, picture? No, now you're stuck. Yeah, you get to take a picture you're gonna in the middle of the girls. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Next is our Long Range Planning Committee. The LRPC studies school district sites, boundaries, and capacity needs. With the following outgo outgoing LRPC members, if you are here, please join me up front. Bob Binder, Michael Formento, Kirk Harris, Jennifer Hewitt, Leah per uh, Pirazzi, sorry, Stephanie Van Zant, Katie Wyatt. And that was the whole list after all the page turning. Um, <laughs> so um, it, our LRPC chair is with us tonight? Not yet, okay. All right, John, come on up if you wouldn't mind. Um, yeah. All right, do you guys wanna say anything about LRPC? Or John, would you like to say anything about your outgoing members? Okay. See, I'm not the chair, by the way. <laughs> 
but I guess I'm here. So uh, it definitely it's been an honor to serve with each and every one of them. And we could, could not have gotten the work done you know, without each and every person's contribution. So thank you very much for serving. Thank you. Uh, sure, you certainly can. Yeah, we just definitely want to thank all of our board committee members. Um, they help the board do incredibly difficult work. And LRPC, really, they help put those puzzle pieces together for us. And the pre-work that they do that comes to the board is just invaluable. So we really want to thank them. The same with the DAC. The DAC has official duties that they need to perform with budget recommendations, engaging the community, engaging our school accountability committees. And we would be lost without those committee members. And we very much appreciate them. Thank you. All right, thank you, LRPC. And last but not least, we have the Mill uh, Bond Ad Hoc Oversight Committee. The MBOC has been invaluable in serving as a citizen oversight committee for our 2018 Mill Levy Override and Bond. The MBOC has monitored the progress of the improvements and programs being implemented and worked to ensure that the 2018 MLO bond expenditures are in alignment with ballot language approved by voters. With the following MBOC members, please join me up front. Sabrina Deramis, Jim Mars, so you get to come back up again, Jim. Um, Mona Rojas, Barrett Roth. Come on up, Jim. <laughs> And John is uh, John Freeman is the chair of MBOC, so come on up. Do you want to say anything about MBOC? Okay. John, would you like to say anything as the chair of MBOC? Yep. <laughs> well, again, it's been quite an honor to serve uh, with these individuals, and especially Jim. He always makes our meetings interesting. <laughs> no shortage of that. Um, de de definitely like to send a shout out to our, uh, our student representative, Mona. Uh, it's always amazing the the, the different opinions and different facts and so forth that the students present uh, always you know, always takes us down a different road and a, and a good road uh, you know, to reach that better conclusion. So thank you. OK, how about one more thank you to all of our committee members? Thanks again, Jim. That concludes our recognitions for this evening. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. And now we move on to item number five, acceptance of agenda. The recommendation is that the Board of Education approves the agenda as presented. Do we have a motion? So I move to amend the agenda to remove item 31, the proposed revisions to policy KBB, parent and family engagement and to add a brief discussion item related to the recent court ruling on the Marshall versus DCSD Board of Ed. Second. We have a motion as stated by Director Meek. We have a second by um, Director Ray. Do you intend for those to be voted on as one item? We can separate them if that's easier. For everyone. Okay, and I'll take uh, individual motion and seconds as individual items. Any discussion? Uh, first one we'll take up is removal of item number 31, which is proposed revisions to policy KBB. Uh, discussion on that item. I'll give rationale for why I made that proposal. Um, I unfortunately missed the DAC meeting last week, but um, it's my understanding that the DAC passed a motion to ask us to hold off for moving forward. I can read what that motion was. Um, I believe, and, and I don't know, um, Director Myers, would you prefer to, to speak to that since you were in the meeting, or do you want me to read the? Go ahead. Okay, okay, perfect. So the DAC, a diverse parent group desiring to be collaborative with the school board, is requesting more time to review policy KBB in compliance with state statute. The Board of Ed shall work with the parent members of the District Accountability Committee in creating, adopting, and implementing the policy. DAC would like to thoroughly stakehold KBB with school accountability committees and other parent organizations. Additionally, the DAC requests that changes to policy KBB 
be free of political influence so as not to further divide our community and district, thus potentially affecting the success of a mill levy override and or bond. So given that language and that conversation happened at the last DAC meeting, I wanted to make sure the full board was aware of that request. Other directors, comments, concerns, discussion? Uh, Director Ray, then Director Weiniger. Yeah, I, I can I concur, and I know Director Myers and I both were at the last DAC meeting, and Director Meek presented their their motion well. Um, certainly, the motion that I made at the last board meeting um, stated that we wanted to postpone the revisions until DAC had proper time to review and provide adequate input. So I think it upholds the motion that was approved that I made. Um, back in, in May, so I, I would also support the motion to uh, remove that from the agenda. Um, I would also suggest that this item could become an area of focus that we, you know, every year we determine the areas of focus for all of our committees, and I could certainly see this item being uh, tasked for them to work on. They, they had some great conversations. I think Director Myers would concur, um, but they just kind of, it was the tip of the iceberg. They, they really didn't have enough time to delve as deeply as they'd like. And, and given that the law really does say that they are the ones to provide us um, that input, I, I think it would be prudent for us to, to remove it from the agenda as well. Director Weiniger. Um, did DAC come, or I guess their one recommendation recommendation was to not have political bias in it, but did they have any other um, recommendations or insight into what they'd like to see different on the policy, or just that they want to postpone it? I can respond if unless Director Myers wants to, because um, since you're the no, liaison. Uh, I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, they really didn't delve that deeply into actually making recommendations of how to modify the policy. I think there was the realization that, wow, this is, this is a big task that we can't do in our 20 minutes that were allotted for us to discuss. They broke out in, in individual uh, breakouts. Uh, Mr. Reynolds uh, facilitated those as well. Um, but I think they came back with a general consensus that said, we need more time. Um, and they also wanted to make sure there was a statement that they were concerned that they didn't want to see a policy get pushed through that had some political bias. And I think there were a couple of them that were concerned by that too. But as far as to answer your question directly, no, there were not specific recommendations of how to revise the policy. Other directors, concerns, comments, Director Myers. I do know that we had some DAC feedback. We got it from the jam board from that night. And we also had a little bit of SAC feedback, correct? And so I, w and I was present for the meeting on Thursday and I, I do know that we were six weeks out from the last time that I supported that resolution as a DAC liaison that we give more time. And they again expressed the fact that they felt there was a time constraint on gathering the feedback and other parental organizations. I'm not real sure what that is. There were a couple of things. I did meet with Chester Shaw at the next day, and I, there was one thing and I said just totally as one board member that I was going to take SAG. SAG was going to be off the table for this policy for me as one board member to gain input from, just because we've got a busy fall coming up. We're going to have them concentrate on their student policies. And I detailed this reason with Mr. Shaw. Now, while I do not support the exact wording of the resolution, I did tell DAC that I would support the resolution to allow a little more time for DAC to weigh in. But I also was, and I'm, and I'm just, I'm I'm a little bit confused because there were some things that that night it pending that DAC saw a little bit different version from the DAC that was brought then agenda on Friday. So there was uh, some, you know, we did we did update the standards, the national standards. We did. Uh, I think we're looking at aligning with CASB. I don't know if we have a true CASB model. But there was very much support for parental uh, engagement, which was in that second um, 
um, paragraph about the district accountability, and there was a great sentence in there that was not at that one on Thursday night. So um, while I support the resolution with some changes in the KBB policy, I would still like to look at that, the KBB policy tonight. Any other directors' comments, concerns? Uh, Director Meek. Yeah, Director Myers, I'm not sure I followed. Are you saying we should still keep KBB on the agenda tonight? I, I wasn't sure I was following what you said. Yes, I still wanted to keep baby KBB policy on because I wanted us to, because of the changes that happened on Friday, the few changes and a little bit wording, we did get a little bit more feedback, so I wanted to address some of that. I'm sorry, which changes on Friday? Well, it was the one that was discussed on Thursday night during the uh, the breakouts, and De Director and I, Ray and I were not part of the breakouts, but when looking at the uh, policy that was read Thursday night and then the policy that came out Friday, I think with the second paragraph, the board recognizes the fundamental rights of parents and guardians to raise their children in accordance. And then I did see this part. I, I understand. I think okay. I understand okay. now. So okay. what was posted on the board agenda on Friday yes. Yes. did reflect some changes. Some changes. Is what I'm hearing. So I yeah. think I felt like there, there needed to be discussion of that tonight because after looking through the DAC feedback and some of the SAC feedback, which I do know there could be more of that, I felt that this we could open for a conversation on that tonight with the KBB policy. Thank you for explaining. Okay. I wasn't okay. following. So, so our, our board committee that we task with parent engagement, and they've been central with the development of this policy since its creation, has asked us to allow them to authentically engage in the development of the policy. So I, I still feel really strongly that pushing it through as a second reading tonight would not be showing the respect to the committee that we have asked to be engaged in this process. Um, you know, our policies are how we govern. It, it reflects our values. It reflects the voice of our community that we make decisions on behalf of. And we have a board committee that is tasked to really help us with that linkage. And if they are asking us to have more time to help them, I feel really strongly that we ensure that whatever policy we're passing, we have clarity from them on, on what they're telling us that they would like to include in that policy. Um, they're such a thoughtful committee. They, they provide amazing feedback. And just, just to be real honest, I've heard from that committee and I've also heard from our student advisory committee, that sometimes they feel like they're just a rubber stamp. So we came to them, we, we showed it to them, and now we've engaged with them. And I think if we push this through, we're only furthering that concern that I've heard from our community at times. Any other directors? Director Williams. So I agree that we need to have our committees in, involved in all of these things. I also believe that all policy is somewhat fluid. Our policies change sometimes year to year, sometimes every other year. And so while I think that, Director Ray, to your point, we can absolutely put this um, on the DAC's agenda for next year of, of looking at, I also think that we can make changes to give a good starting ground for and then they can absolutely come back and I think that that's fair as well. Yeah, and as one director, uh, when you look at the content of the changes here, the current existing policy on KBB, uh, Detail 6 PTA, our national PTA standards that they have put forward, the standards that are in the current policy are from 2018 
and the national standards were updated by the PTA in 2021, so they're getting almost a year and a half old uh, since that was passed. So it, at a minimum, I'd like to open that and update that. That's not coming from our DAC. That's not coming from this board. We're simply reflecting um, linkages that we've already established in the current policy. Uh, the second part that would modify that policy in any way that's proposed for item number 31 tonight is around parent voice. And when we pass policy ADB, uh, it made a reference to the partnership between uh, respectful mutual partnership between our staff, the educators, and our parents. And I think that's something even earlier today in the, the previous meeting, we heard seven applicants for the open, uh, the vacancy in the Board of Education. And some of them talked about stakeholder voice and things. And, and that's something that, that frankly I ran on as a candidate a year and a half ago and something that I think is long overdue that we address. I agree with Director Williams here that this is not a, uh, an ending point, but especially parent engagement, many of our other policies, even, even ADB is a continuous discussion and we should be committed to the board as a board to continuous improvement that this, these conversations never end um, and, and I think if you look at the draft for this evening that the board may take under consideration it explicitly codifies that the uh, DAC should review this p policy and particularly on a periodic basis and in fact every time the national standards change so so for that reason I'd like to keep the item on the agenda director Ray yeah, I don't. I don't disagree. Again, Director Peterson, with some of your your rationale, but I I think again it goes back to process. And again, this process has been backwards. Um, when we have other policies, we typically turn that over to a staff liaison who then begins researching and and bringing together people to begin helping us hear what recommendations need to be made. And this policy wasn't done that way. You know, this policy was really brought and initiated by you um, without consulting with um, our community engagement liaison, uh, without consulting with our DAC. And it, it was kind of felt like it was kind of after the fact. They're like, oh, yeah, because I brought up the fact that it is the law <laughs> that we have to consult with DAC. And that, so, so the process is backwards. I, I don't think that there's, I, I can't uh, debate some of your rationale and reasoning for the importance of amplifying parent voice or the importance of engagement. I can advocate that our process needs to be cleaner. And this is again a, an example of a very wonky process. Even our DAC, um, they said it in a nice way, but they were somewhat um, disappointed that we hadn't consulted with them first, that it was after the fact that revisions were already being made. And it seems to me like it's just replicating effort if we try to make some revisions and then we say, oh, and DAC makes some more, why not just do the process correctly, which is to start with DAC, have our community engagement liaison, also represent them in bringing forward their recommendations for revisions, and then we can insert whatever thing, or whatever ideas that we want to add to those recommendations. So I just think the process is wonky and that's why I would recommend that we remove it, clean up the process, do it right the first time, as opposed to doing this piecemeal approach. Uh, Director Myers, then Director Meek. So I think what it was for me, which I spent all weekend and uh, in conversation with quite a few people, and I, what I had pulled out and I, was a question when we were possibly going to talk about KBP is it says in there our district accountability committee serves to bridge the gap between SACS and the district and will conduct a periodic review of this policy at least by NLE or whenever national standards for family schools partnerships are updated. I felt like this was a green light for the DAC to go ahead and go forward in creating that subcommittee. Because of actually one of the things that I asked the night of that Thursday night DAC was I asked if there was a possibility to have a timeline. And so, and, and, I, and I feel like the 
time before that when I went ahead and extended and I do and while I do understand that it was the end of the school year that and and we couldn't get to our sacks completely we did have quite a bit of feedback that we read through with the SACs and I and I didn't think it would be so bad to go forward with our policy because some of the suggestions in the poli in the DAC and the SAC was to update our national standards, which we did, and to look at a CASB model. And then we and feel like if it al aligned with that. And also the, this is 2023. This has not been updated till two, since 2018. We are way beyond when this policy should have been reviewed. And I just believe that going ahead and, and I encouraging the back the DAC to get on their subcommittee to start feedback. And I and I this might be a question for the board, but maybe even after that's created, if they wanted to push forward something to come forward to the board again, if there was really some egregious um, wording in that policy that they just did not like. But I think some of the things um, that I heard, that I read through the DAC and SAC feedback was they wanted to include the parental rights and exclude the politics. And so actually two actual quotes were to achieve parent, student, and school rights. And I'd love for this document to be a win for students, schools, and parents. And so I believe in this current KBB policy in paragraph two, it supports that educational triangle of student, parent, and teacher, and now protects our students. And I know we have opposing views. I know that we have people that think that we might not particularly be taking care of or putting into that policy. But what I think that I and want to say is that we have to be very careful that we, as, our, as a board, we do not take the stand of of placing one person's rights over another person's rights. So I just wanted to, uh, I've, I felt like there would probably be a discussion of KBB. I didn't realize you were gonna try to pull KBB off. I wanted to, I wanted to support that resolution, but at the same time, I wanted to give you that time limit, but go ahead and get this KBB so we can start off the, the new year. Uh, director so, A. Just I was to, next, I'm remember? Sorry. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, sorry if, if I said I would I give you Director I just wanted to chime in kind of quickly, uh, kind of to what um, Director Myers brought up. So the other thing I was going to bring up, it was my understanding that the DAC offered to have a subcommittee and, and dedicate, you know, the next month to work on it and have feedback ready to go in August. So I, I feel like my understanding was they felt very dedicated to moving it forward as quickly as possible, having 20 minutes on their agenda wasn't sufficient to really do the work that was needed to be done. And so, again, I, I feel like pushing something through with the idea that we're going to change it again in a month is, I, I guess it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, but that was the only other point I wanted to make. and I. Don't want to belabor it too much. Director Ray. And I was just going to call the question because I think the motion is about whether to place it on the agenda or not. It's not to delve deeply into the merits right. of the review. Right. And so. we can, <laughs> if there's a discussion on KBB, we can certainly have those discussions then. I, I agree. I don't I don't think we need to call the question because I, I think we've established because then I have to take a vote. We got to get two thirds and all that stuff. But it, uh, I think everybody's relatively established their position. So at this time, I'd like to take a vote on the singular motion. And then there is a second motion on the table that we'll come back to. So on the motion of removing item 31 from the agenda, uh, the motion was to remove an I vote is removing the item. A no vote is maintaining the agenda as written for item number 31. Uh, Director Meek. Aye. Director Myers. No. Director Peterson. No. Director Ray. Aye. Director Williams. No. Director Weiniger. No. 
The item is, the motion is defeated by a vote of two to four. We'll now take up the second motion on the Tatum, uh, excuse me, the second motion on the table, which is to add a discussion regarding uh, the Marshall lawsuit settlement and fees. Uh, motion made by uh, Meek, seconded by Ray. Discussion on that motion. Sure, my rationale for adding a brief discussion item, no more than 10 minutes, um, on the court ruling is that it's timely and it's relevant. It's something that has consumed this board and our community for the past 15 months. With the board making its ruling last Friday, this seems like the appropriate time for the board to have an opportunity to respond to that ruling and to comment on it. Um, I think it's, it's just as you said, you ran on accountability and transparency. I feel like this would be accountability and transparency to our community. Director Williams. So um, I don't believe we need a separate agenda item. I am planning to make a statement uh, during my vice president reports around uh, the case, but I don't feel comfortable having um, a conversation until we can speak with our attorney who unfortunately is out of town. Yeah, I would echo um, Director Williams to caution that there are still some times for other motions, whether those be appeal, whether those be other motions. Uh, there's certainly the, metal, uh, the matter of fee settlements. There is some, even though there was an order by the judge, and I'll be happy to make a statement at the end of the uh, meeting on that. I think we should be very careful of having open discussions while there are still some pending items to be cleaned up. Um, as a uh, matter of transparency, uh, Mr. Blue is unable to be here tonight but I will plan on putting in executive session uh, for the board to receive legal advice on this matter and then go forward however we need to on the 27th. Director A. It, just, it seems to me that everybody is ready to make a statement that it doesn't harm us to put all of those statements together on one agenda item. Um, I agree we have to be cautious that we don't broach uh, legal vulnerability or discuss legal strategies, but I think all of us are probably eager to um, let our community know our reaction to what happened last Monday. And so it just makes sense to me to add an agenda item where all, all six of us can make those statements um, as, as Director Meek has, has moved in her motion. Any other directors, comments, questions? Uh, Director Myers. I'm also uh, uncomfortable about uh, putting it on an agenda and just because in the name of making sure that I don't say anything incorrect per our uh, lawyer and so I just would like to if this is something we want to do next week on the that's fine but not I'm not tonight I'm not comfortable with it. Okay. Any other discussion or statements questions? Director Ray. Just the only, only thing I would say, I think Director Peterson, you mentioned uh, many times that when there's blanks, people fill in the blank. And I think this is a situation where clearly there's a blank that um, we ought to fill in, at least with our statements. Um, and I think we owe that to our community. I think Director Meek's correct. Uh, when you spend hundreds and thousands of dollars on legal fees and it's a 15 month project, I think our uh, community deserves to hear from its uh, elected officials, even if it's a brief reaction. And, and I, I will help Director Myers in making sure she doesn't broach the uh, line of legal vulnerability. Um, I'd be glad to, to take that responsibility, but um, I just think we owe it to our community to um, respond. And it sounds like we're already prepared to do that. It sounds like Director Peterson, you were, Director Williams was, I know I was, Director Meek is, so it just seems prudent to put it all together in one agenda item. Uh, Director Williams. I, I just didn't want it to be a discussion. So that's that's kind of where I was. Like I just want to be able to make a statement and move on. And so that's um, that's why I don't think it needs to be an agenda item and it can just be a statement at the end. Yeah, and, and I don't disagree with you either, Director Ray. I think we do uh, owe it to the public, which is why I was going to make a statement. But I also, uh, to err on the, the side of caution with uh, for the reasons I stated earlier, I think a discussion then gets uh, outside of bounds. But I, I certainly welcome every director at the end with director remarks. If they would like to make a statement, to please do so. And if you do not feel you'd like to make a statement, that's your right as a director as well. But uh, I'm opposed to actually adding a discussion item to encourage uh, discussion. So would, the, would you accept a friendly amendment to simply call the agenda item director statements 
regarding court ruling? Because it's not a discussion, it's just simply, a, again, statements. I mean, I, I just think yeah, it's I, inefficient for us if, to... If you think that's an efficiency, and if we would put it right before president remarks at the end of the meeting, I'd be happy to make it director statements. If you'd like to have a... Uh, I believe it was Director Meek's motion, though, so it would be for Director Meek to accept the friendly amendment. Yeah, my friendly amendment would be that we would title this agenda item director statements regarding the court ruling on Monday, June 16, 2023. Yeah, I accept that friendly amendment. Okay, so. we have a friendly amendment to the motion made by me, seconded by Ray. And uh, with that, I'd like to call the roll unless there's any other further discussion. Director Meek. Aye. Director Myers. I'm going to say no. Uh, sorry, Myers is a no. Peterson, aye. William, uh, I'm sorry, Director Ray. Uh, aye. Director Williams. Aye. Director Weiniger. No. The motion passes as amended, four to two. And with that, do we have any a motion uh, concerning the rest of the agenda as amended? Director Pearson, I'd like to make one small uh, agenda item revision, item number 31, since it appears we're keeping that on the agenda. If we could denote that as a third reading as opposed to a second reading, because we already have had two readings on this policy, just to help us keep track of the number of times we've discussed the policy. So I would motion to accept the amended agenda, uh, amending item number 31 to denote a third reading as opposed to a second reading. Do we have a second? Second. I'm sorry? Second. Okay, motion made by Ray. Second is by Weininger as amended to retitle item number 31 with third reading. Uh, I will now take the roll. Director Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson, aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weininger? Aye. Item passes six to zero as stated. Item number six, superintendent updates, 10 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, we are really, really excited to announce that we have officially hired our executive director of special education. After a comprehensive search uh, process, it is with great enthusiasm that we announce Ms. Liza Meyer as the new executive direction, uh, director of special education in our school district. Liza has worked in the education field for the past 23 years. Over the past eight years, sorry, my computer is suddenly restarting. Um, over the last eight years, she has worked in various special education district leadership capacities, including assistant director, director, and executive director for special education in a large metro school district. During the interview process, her skills and experience with a diverse student population and her passion for advocating for students with disabilities was clearly evident. She brings a wealth of experience, effective communication, consistency, a strong partnership with families, a student-centered focus, and a servant leadership approach to our community. While Liza recognizes the challenge that comes with this work, she is fully committing to ensuring that our students, families, and staff receive the support that they deserve. Um, so welcome to Liza. Um, also, you should know that our students continue to learn this summer. Our, extend, our extended school year program is in full mode, and many of our students with disabilities are learning from some of our amazing special educators over the summer. We have eight extended school year sites, Cimarron, Pioneer, Flagstone, Mesa, Summit View, Mountain Ridge, um, Plum Creek, and Bridge. It is four weeks of programming for approximately 350 students in pre-K through 21. Thank you to all of our special educators and our staff who have been working this summer um, to support the learning needs of our students. Um, next, congratulations to our Thunder Ridge High School girls soccer team state champions and their coach, um, Mike Parsons, who was also named coach of the year in girls soccer. Um, you may recall from the last meeting, it was a matchup between Thunder Ridge High School and Rock Canyon High School for the state championship. So congratulations to our Rock Canyon girls as well. Also, congratulations to our Mountain Vista High School students who recently competed in the national speech and debate competition. And finally, um, right hot off the presses, um, our very own Amanda Thompson 
has been selected as the Colorado Association of School Personnel Administrators for the Sandra Shrevey Award for 2023. This award recognizes a CASPA member who has gone above and beyond to benefit the work of human resources in all of our Colorado schools. Her work in helping host the very first um, Colorado-wide job fair here in Douglas County and helping it make a success is just one of the many reasons she was selected. Um, she's also been a past president of CASPA and a former board member of the American Association for Employment and Education. Um, so I just wanted to do a shout out to our very own Amanda Thompson. making a big difference in Colorado. And then finally, uh, just to our staff out there who may be listening, I hope our staff is enjoying their summer and are able to um, have some time to refresh and we look forward to seeing them in July. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. With that, we'll move on to item number seven, public comment. Purpose of public comment is to balance the ability to hear diverse viewpoints from a broad spectrum of citizens throughout the district while allowing the Board of Education to conduct business in an orderly and efficient manner. Time has been adjusted to allow all speakers the opportunity to speak during the allotted time for public comment. Three minutes will be allotted th this evening for each speaker. When speaking, please remain respectful, address the board rather than guests and staff in the room. To respect a speaker's free speech, please not interrupt them while they're at the podium providing comments. You will have a 15 second notice prior to the end of your time so you can wrap up your comments. When your time is up, please leave the podium. If the audience wants to react between speakers, feel free to do so while being respectful and honoring the next speaker's time to speak. However, please do not engage speakers or other audience members in a disruptive manner. Attendees who create a disturbance or disrupt speakers will be asked to leave the room after a prior warning. We'll start this evening with Luke Johnson, Kelly Mayer, followed by Kristen DeBeer. Mr. Johnson. Okay, he was at our earlier meeting, so we'll come back to Mr. Johnson if he returns. Uh, Kelly Mayer, Kristen DeBeer, followed by Jen Iverson. So the three of us are speaking together, so I'm Kristen DeBeer. I'm actually going to start. Good evening. I spoke to, you some of, to some of you in 2018 about my son Jack's situation regarding his IEP at STEM. And I'm back tonight to tell you about our efforts since then to improve this system. At the end of his sophomore year at STEM, Jack was invited and accepted into the CareerWise Apprenticeship Program. However, STEM told us they were terminating his IEP because his apprenticeship conflicted with the single class in which they were willing to offer his IEP services the following year. Jack would either lose his IEP services or this career development opportunity, but students without disabilities at STEM did not face this choice. Because Jack's rights were being violated, we used the free state complaint process to seek guidance from CDE. The neutral complaint officer investigated and found that STEM had acted unlawfully and ordered the team to write a new IEP based on Jack's needs. STEM did not follow that order, so our only option was to file a second complaint, which resulted in findings of additional violations. So CDE ordered that a portion of the services that Jack should have received by then be made up. His team finally completed a new IEP a full year after our first complaint, which al allowed Jack to receive services the following year, but he never received any services during his junior year, which we expected STEM to make up according to the state's order. However, days later, we received notice that DCSD didn't agree to the order. So this school district filed due process against us his parents to appeal the state's decision. We were confused and frustrated. We had used a free process to resolve a dispute and now we were facing a personal lawsuit which required us to hire attorneys about a decision made by the state because this district disagreed that our son was entitled to services ordered by the Department of Justice, uh, by the Department of Education. This felt unjust. The use of due process to appeal a state complaint favors school districts like DCSD with deep pockets funded by taxpayers. In our case, DCSD spent upwards of $161,000 in legal fees to fight this, whereas providing Jack services would have cost pennies in comparison. Parents do not have the luxury of those deep pockets while also trying to ensure our children with disabilities get their needs met. So many families do not file state complaints because of the potential retaliation of a due process lawsuit. We spent the last five years trying to ensure that no other families find themselves in our situation. 
Last fall, in partnership with the ARC and Disability Law Colorado, we introduced HB 23 1168, a bill in the state legislature which balances the scale by providing a state-funded rotating attorney pool to provide representation for parents who find themselves in our situation, being taken to court by their school district after winning a state complaint. It allows parents the legal representation they need to have a fair remaining. or presenting their case before a judge and helps ensure that they don't face yet another undue burden when advocating for, for their child with disabilities. The bill passed both houses of the state legislature unanimously and was signed into law in May. It's our hope that parents of students with disabilities can now exercise their rights for a free state complaint process without fear of being on the hook for legal fees if their district sues them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Beer. Uh, Ms. Iverson. My friend Kristen just shared some poignant and infuriating experiences. The knowledge that DCSD could turn around and sue a parent to avoid fulfilling a legally mandated order from the state with deep pockets of taxpayer funds. It's infuriating. When I testified for this bill, the incredulity on the faces of legislators was very blatant. It is mind-boggling that DCSD and its legal team decided to take this course of action on something so minor that became common during the pandemic. The motions that were taken by DCSD and Kaplan and Ernst were egregious. Thankfully, now families can file state complaints with the knowledge that they are not shouldering the burden completely when the district doesn't like what the state finds and then decides to file a due process against the parents of children with disabilities. None of this should have occurred and if DCSD actually put kids as the priority. The conversations and actions should always be student-centered. These maneuvers do not reflect a student-centered mentality. I have heard the excuse before that if the district gives that service to one student, they will have to accommodate all students. But that's not how this works. It is individualized. It is the I in IEP. That is the mandate of IDEA, a free and appropriate public education. All students get the chance to learn so that they have an opportunity to be functioning, contributing members of society. I would like to see data that it says it costs more to provide services than it does to sue families of children with disabilities. Most parents, including myself, have not filed state complaints for fear of the repercussions we have seen inflicted on our friends. Many also do not have the money to hire lawyers after paying the numerous outside therapies and essential tutoring because their students do not receive FAPE. State complaints are meant to help school districts and parents resolve disagreements about how to support students. It is not meant to penalize. DCSD staff cannot resolve problems if they don't acknowledge they exist. I believe that when you know better, you do better. You set the tone. Please show us that's true. Thank you, Ms. Iverson. Ms. Mayor. Good evening, Board Directors and Superintendent Kane. My name is Kelly Mayer. Um, I'm a longtime resident and mom of many. The concerns you have heard this evening about the DCSD legal team spending taxpayer money to sue parents has happened too many times. Often the fix that a family is asking for is merely to follow the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, a federal law that is over 47 years old. In the case of the De Beers family, a simple video conference would have solved the founded state complaint. In other cases, similar changes to DCSD protocol would have negated the need for lawyers to be involved. DCSD is litigious with our money. Most special education families cannot afford to be sued. We use our money to pay for therapies and tutors. This tutoring is not to get scholarships through ACT or SAT scores. The tutoring my community employs is to bring our students to grade level. The fact that so many kids need outside tutoring to get to grade level should be a red flag for all of you. It is denial of FAPE, free and appropriate public education. There are families who cannot testify to their experience tonight because of non-disclosure agreements they sign to protect their child's access to FAPE. These NDAs allow, allow the district to continue unlawful practices without having to fix them. The use of taxpayer funds to pursue legal actions has been a systemic issue in DCSD 
from vouchers to Andrew F. to the De Beers case to the Colorado open meeting lawsuit and so many others that have occurred. It's time to reassess priorities. All of these lawsuits were lost. None of them were student-centered. No changes to current actions were addressed or corrected. None of these suits benefited children. They are about adult egos and nothing more. One solution to these issues is for the district to prioritize supporting legislation that centers on students in the district. A DCSD lobbyist can work with the Senate and House of Representatives to promote positive intent towards our children. In the end, following the laws put in place to protect our students and encourage staff costs less, less in money, less in trauma, less in damage to DCSD's reputation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Next will be Luke Johnson, Valerie Thompson, and Julie Gooden. Mr. Johnson. Sorry, thank you for your patience. I was running late from another meeting. Uh, good evening, board directors, Superintendent Cade, administration, and staff. It's been a while since I've spoken at a board meeting, and it's good to be back and see familiar faces. I'm here tonight to speak to the board selection of finalists to fill the board director vacancy at District C. I'm a resident of Highlands Ranch District C. As a parent and community member who worked hard to elect the kids first board directors, and who has been actively engaged in the education issues affecting our DCSD students and teachers, I strongly encourage this board to select District C vacancy candidate David DiCarlo as a finalist for the position. I attended the candidate interviews earlier this afternoon. I'd like to thank the eight candidates who stepped forward to fill the District C vacancy. It takes courage to step forward and offer yourselves in service to your community and the students, staff members, teachers, and administration of our school district. After reading through the eight candidate applications submitted and listening to their board interviews today, I believe that there are but a few qualified candidates with the requisite experience to fill the vacancy and hit the ground running. Of those three, candidate David DiCarlo stood out as the most qualified to represent the voice and vote of the residents of Highlands Ranch District C. Mr. DiCarlo has been a longtime member of the community who has been actively engaged in the education issues of the district for at least the past 15 years. His children attended DCSD schools, and he was an advocate for them and other children when the district cut funding and eliminated a number of bus routes. He has been a past member and two-time chairman of the District Accountability Committee, developing a wealth of knowledge of the inner workings of our school system and the current long-range challenges confronting our schools. He has a deep knowledge of the funding formulas, finances, and education policies that exist within the district. He cares deeply about the future of DCSD schools and the students who attend them. He seeks to maintain and improve the academic and financial performance of our school system in order to preserve the status of Douglas County as a destination community for our families. And lastly, as he stated in his interview today, he provides a unique perspective on the budget and teacher pay issues that our DCSD schools are facing. He would represent the voice and vote of at least half the Douglas County citizens who have not had their thoughts and opinions heard or respected thus far in this room over the past year on the issue of raising taxes on the citizenry in one of the worst economic environments of our lifetime. Personally, I think that a balanced perspective and some fresh and creative ideas on how to better address education funding shortfalls and 15 pay seconds gaps remaining. would be a good thing. For these reasons and others, I strongly encourage this board to select him as the finalist for this position. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Valerie Thompson, Julie Gooden, followed by Amy Winju. Ms. Thompson. Hi, good evening, directors. I'm here tonight to comment in support of the District Accountability Committee's request passed June 15th requesting additional time to review and provide feedback on changes to the KBB. This would permit the DAC to organize, research, and work together and better include the involvement of other stakeholders, such as our school, school accountability committees who are out for the summer. Colorado revised statutes states, it's 2232-142, that each school district board of education shall adopt a district policy for increasing and supporting parent engagement. It further states that the Board of Education should work with parent members of the District Accountability Committee in creating, adopting, and implementing this policy. 
The Parent Engagement Policy, or KBB, is a policy our district and our school community should feel great about, and your DACs and your SACs should feel appropriate in helping in its implementation. Currently, we are still in the need of adequate space for effective dialogue with your parent members. Again, as in my last public comment, whenever we fail to properly engage stakeholders, it provides right breeding ground for misinformation, confusion, and dissent. My case in point, tonight's version of the KBB, that's an actionable item on your agenda, has similar language seen in anti-LGBTQ laws and policies that are being pushed in other states and districts. Even more problematic is that the language in the KBB policy tonight is vague enough to be argued that it's not anti-LGBTQ+, but also just vague enough to absolutely be enforced in a way that is anti-LGBTQ+. I will leave it to you to clarify on its intent. Either way you slice it, Douglas County School District's Board of Education should not be passing vague policies that can be so broadly interpreted or passing anti-LGBTQ plus policies. We know this will harm students. It can open us up to litigation and cause further divide and turmoil in our community. Our role as engaged members in our school community should be to support all of our students in an equitable learning environment, regardless of if their life choices differ from our personally held beliefs or preference. Instead, I ask that KBB used as it's intended as a tool to build relationships with our families. Like the CASB examples and the other district policies modeled on the CDE website, our KBB could be written in a way that is action and goal oriented. I personally found the indicators from the national standards useful. We should always consider what outcomes we want when we develop policy and the strategies to implement that policy. 15 seconds as remaining. As a parent member of the DAC, I wish for you to understand that I hope to collaborate with you and the other parent members to develop a policy that is meaningful and that we will all have buy-in for supporting its implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thompson, Julie Gooden, Amy Winju, followed by Deborah, Deborah Flora. Ms. Gooden. I'll be the first to admit I didn't write anything because I'm naive that you were actually going to go through with what you said. Really frustrated. And I have all of my notes from DAC. And the things you decided to cherry pick out of there were not liaison relationship building. It was, I can't tell you how frustrating that is. It was your idea, to be honest, that, oh, well, I think if you guys present something that has a timeline to it, I would be happy to support that. Tonight, you're going to vote on it, and it's going to be done. I don't understand, and I'll speak to all of you, I don't understand how you can do a parent engagement and the parents that stand up in this district to volunteer their time are ignored. I don't care about the people who decide to just, you know, chime up your email or send you text messages, but the ones that are dedicated to this district that show up and give their time to be completely ignored is absolutely insane. You're destroying the district from the inside out. I'm not going to go anywhere. You're not going to fight me away by ignoring me. But it is something everyone here needs to know, and I'm so glad this is televised, because it's egregious. It's absolutely atrociously frustrating, because to be a liaison is to be a fact finder, to relay information. Director Meek wasn't even there, and she got the facts right. Director Ray stood up and said the facts. You decided on what you wanted. Nobody, nobody said, these pieces are our favorite parts. That was, that's junk. We didn't even have time to talk about that. We had documents people had commented on. Two different people from two different sides of the aisle offered their drafts. We had a ton of information. But to just pick what you want to pick to get on your soapbox and then turn around and backstab your DAC, it's not going to play well. And you really, really hurt the people that are here for the district. So I just needed to make sure I said that on record. And I'm sorry it wasn't prepped and ready, because I really had faith I didn't need it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kidden. Amy Winju, Deborah Flora, followed by Jonathan Flora. Ms. Winju. Good evening. Um, I would like to thank all five of the board members for the hard work this school year, for what may have seemed at times a thankless unpaid job that took you away from your family and kids. You all are the very definition of a volunteer. 
I would also like to thank the board for the proposed updates to the KBB policy. I appreciate that the proposal mentions that it recognizes the fundamental rights of parents and guardians to raise their children with their own personal beliefs, particularly the statement to ensure students will not be compelled to share personal info that, con that conflicts with personal beliefs. The option to opt in is also fantastic. As a parental figure who raised three teenage girls, I appreciate this very much. Maybe I missed it, but I noticed that the opt-in mentioned selected resources and activities, but didn't mention testing or surveys. I would like to propose that state surveys and testing also be added with the option of opting in to the proposed KBB policy. The proposed policy update mentioned that the board supports the national standards for family school partnership, which comes from the national PTA org. The National PTA states that its mission requires that diversity, equity, and inclusion be central to their work. The National PTA's guide has resources for PTA partners so they can educate themselves about systemic racism, one of which states that ongoing institutional racism and deeply embedded injustices, prejudices, and inequities in the fabric of our nation have caused the violent deaths of innocent black and brown men, women, and children over the years at the hands of a percentage of police officers and ordinary citizens. It further states that the national PTA recognizes that African Americans have suffered from institutional racism for over 400 years. This is from the 1619 Project. I would highly recommend that the board reviews the national PTA standards for family school partnership further. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Winju. Deborah Flora, Jonathan Flora, followed by Linda White. Good evening to the board and the superintendent. I'm Deborah Flora. Good evening, and it is nice to say that I do believe this is a very good evening. When I first spoke in front of this school board a few years ago, I was one of many district parents who were outraged that under the previous majority, parents were shut out and circumvented. In fact, the linked Gemini CRT training for educators that was hidden from families actually referred to parents as dissenters and encouraged teachers to exclude those of us who know our own children best. That is why the Douglas County community elected a new board majority, one that would focus on education, not indoctrination, one that would focus on partnership, not partisanship, one that would focus not on right or left, but simply stand for what is right. And that's why I'm here tonight. I ask you to continue to stand for what is right and pass a new parental engagement policy without delay. This new policy rebuilds the trust that was lost, rightly referring to families as trusted partners, not dissenters. As the founder of Parents United in America, I represent countless engaged mothers and fathers who are extremely grateful that the new KBB policy recognizes this. The board recognizes that the fundamental right of parents and guardians to raise their children in accordance with their own personal beliefs and conviction, and that this policy also protects students from being compelled to speak or act in a way that conflicts with their deeply held beliefs. There is nothing radical in this policy. It is for every single parent, every single student to live their life the way they see fit. These common sense principles are the key to flourishing of all students from every walk of life. This is parental engagement policy is very much needed as shown recently by what happened at Thunder Ridge High School, where students were taught about pansexuality, how to get gender transition surgery, all without parents' knowledge or consent. In addition, when it comes to academic achievement, the thing that every single one of us wants for every single child, study after study shows when parents are full partners in their children's education, students' graduation rates skyrocket, their grades improve, and achievement on all levels increases. That's why I ask you to pass this KBB policy right away. 
so that we can fulfill and restore the golden triangle of education, which are teachers being supported, partnering with parents for the good of all children. Thank you so very much for the hard work that you've done leading up to this new policy. Thank you for passing it tonight, we hope. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Flora. Jonathan Flora, Linda White, followed by Krista Gilstrap. What a difference a year makes. Um, you've done some great work, but I, as we all know, we've got a lot of work to do ahead of time, even still. I'm a Douglas County School District parent. It was the anti-parent policies of the previous school board majority that not only got me engaged in the policies of fighting for parental rights, but also led my wife and I to create the movie, Whose Children Are They, that I directed. Whose children are they is the question that the previous board majority answered by authorizing a CRT training that was hidden from parents and referred to us as dissenters. I'm grateful for the new board majority answering the same question, whose children are they, by introducing the new parental engagement policy that I urge you to adopt tonight without delay. This policy rightly states the following. The board recognizes the fundamental rights of parents and guardians to raise their children in accordance with their own personal beliefs and convictions. That our children will not be compelled to share personal information or make statements about themselves or regarding others that conflict with their deeply held personal beliefs or circumstances. That this board majority, unlike the previous board, supports open communication and disclosure of information with parents concerning our children's health and education. And no one in Douglas County Schools will ever, ever instruct children, do not tell your parents. This policy includes everyone and is good for all. And speaking as a dad, I think of the studies that show when fathers are actively engaged in their children's education, children are far more likely to succeed academically with higher grades and graduation rates. That is why it is so important that we parents, moms and dads, are not circumvented. This new parental engagement policy will restore the trust that was not only broken but destroyed by the previous board and allow teachers to teach, parents to be partners, and students to flourish. I'd like to again recognize the new board majority members. Thank you for seeing a wrong and stepping up to correct it as you were elected to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flora. Linda White, Krista Gilstrap, and then we will go online with Sandra Brownrigg. Good evening, directors. My name is Linda White, and I have two comments on the parent engagement policy. First, please reconsider the PTA national standards. Douglas County can develop our own standards. As a board, your job is to create educational standards for K through 12 students. A teacher's job is to educate. Thank you for knowing your proper lane and recognizing that parents have a fundamental right to direct the upbringing of our kids, including their education. You recognize this fundamental right in paragraph two of the parent engagement policy. While researching and developing this parent and engagement policy, I'm sure you've had many experts advising you on what's best for students. I have a 54-year-old son, eight grandkids, two grandkids. As I look around this room, I bet I might be the most experienced person here when it comes to parenting. My length of experience tells me that we, the parents, are the experts in regard to our kids. Thank you for leaving parenting in the hands of parents, and please pass this policy tonight. Thank you, Ms. White. Krista Gilstrap, then online, Sandra Brownrigg, followed by Tiffany Baker. Ms. Gilstrap. All right. Good evening, and thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. I wanted to come here tonight to speak in favor of putting an MLO or bond, and bond on the ballot this, this November. I took a look at the staff recommendation presentation that will be given later tonight, and I'm in full support. I'm glad to see that they are recommend, recommending additional funding for enhanced security as part of the, of the MLO, and was pleased that they are keeping the needs of the bond ask the same. 
It appears the burden on our taxpayers will be modest, which we all know is important given the current economic state. I look forward to hearing Superintendent Kane and her staff's presentation later with more details. I also wanted to let you know that the Invest in DCSD committee is still up and ready to support the effort should you decide to vote to place them on the ballot this November. We have a subcommittee that has been busy planning a private fundraising event this summer and we will be working on additional fundraising and volunteer coordination efforts to make sure we are ready to carry the baton in August. If you are listening and would like to help with this effort, please reach out to us via our website investindcsd.com. Tonight, you all heard from some excellent candidates for the vacancy, and you all have a hard choice to make. My only ask would be that you select candidates as finalists who will support our efforts to secure more funding for this district. Regardless of who's, who you select, I'd like to invite each of the candidates who said they supported the funding effort to join the campaign efforts. Many shared they would like to help the campaign be more successful this time, and we would welcome their help. Again, they can reach out to us via our website, investindcsd.com, or email us at investindcsd at gmail.com. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ms. Gilstrap. Mr. Blair, is Ms. Brownrigg online? She is, sir. Ask him to unmute. Ms. Brownrigg, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, we have you. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, before I start, I'd also like to express my admiration for the eight applicants for the board position. Uh, the public comment, as well as, as their interviews today, show that parent engagement is alive and well in Douglas County. It may not be an agreement, but we have a very active and engaged community, and I'm thankful for that. I was particularly impressed by the number of dads who applied to serve as interim board director. Historically, fathers have been less familiar with school funding than mothers, and that was clearly not the case today. So regardless of who you select tonight, I think our leadership is in good hands. I wanted to speak on funding as Krista did. I know that the district's going to recommend tonight we place funding on the ballot in 2023. One of those candidates today when asked if he supported it, summed it up well. We should do it. We should just do a better job of explaining why we should do it. My friend and colleague Brad also summed up the why very well. Competitive compensation, new elementary schools for high growth areas, and expanded middle schools to relieve capacity challenges. Several candidates mentioned security and safety, which are paramount and good for everyone. One candidate disagreed. He said that 50% of the community had spoken last year, and we should not revisit funding this year. I disagree with that perspective. The MLO failed by a scant one half percent in an astoundingly chaotic year. No one thought it had a chance because of the political turmoil, but we came that close. Follow-up polling indicates a substantial number of no votes were based on misunderstanding of how school funding works, how urgent our capacity issues are, and just how short-staffed and underpaid we are. Another candidate said we needed to place funding on the ballot repeatedly until we pass it. Our inability to reach and convince our community last year did not remove or reduce the funding shortages. Instead, they grow, maintenance alone at 30 to 35 million a year. No good outcomes emerge from chronic underfunding. Quality simply degrades, employee turnover increases, morale decreases, more bus routes are canceled because we don't have drivers or mechanics. Safety could suffer and schools can be not as well maintained. Most of all, we cannot cut our way out of a staffing shortage. Some of your candidates expressed a desire for transparency, and I am not worried about that. The financials are on the website, the master capital plan, the budget, all the remaining. details are readily available. And I also don't worry about fiscal responsibility from leadership. I've served on board advisory committees for 15 years. Those gave me direct access to the finance department, district and board leadership under multiple administrations. I respect your financial acuity and your commitment to the well-being of our children. We're in good hands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Brownrigg. Tiffany Baker is next. I'm reading for a teacher tonight. 
Board directors, I feel the need to speak anonymously tonight based on our district's sad history with the reformer boards and your actions that have established yourselves as potential reformers. I have seen both Corey Weiss, a career DCSD educator and administrator, as well as Maddie Richardson, an effective and adored Parker performing arts teacher, be shown the door for speaking up against your far right views and agenda. Who is to say you wouldn't continue to retaliate against those who disagree with your actions? Board majority, a conservative Douglas County judge just determined you are in fact guilty for abiding by for not abiding by open meetings law. I am wondering if you will even acknowledge this or if you will continue blowing it off and blaming others for your illegal activity. One of you recently stated at a board meeting that you didn't choose to get sued. This sounds a lot like our younger elementary students who are struggling with taking ownership and developing responsibility and humility. As at adult elected officials, ownership, responsibility, and humility should be traits that you exhibit. It is time for you to take a good, hard look inward and admit to our entire community that you messed up. We need to hear that you understand the financial and moral hit that your actions have cost our students, staff, and taxpayers. Placing blame on the party that sued you is a, like a little kid who gets caught with his hand in a cookie jar but gets upset with his sister that told on him. Why are you blaming others for your actions? Grow up, take responsibility, and make appropriate changes. Our district deserves at a minimum that after the mess you have created. Veteran board members, I applaud you for your tireless work and advocacy for public education, your reasonableness, inclusivity, and knowledge of what educating our youth entails does not go unnoticed by the teachers at DCSD. A recent survey ran by a district showed that the number one issue this board faces is being too political. I checked that box and I can tell you that the reason I feel this board is too political is due to the far right agenda the majority is pushing, accepting awards from CPAN, speaking as, as board members at political events, ignoring recommendations at committees, and unilaterally making changes to policies are just a few of the many examples of being too political. There is a vote coming up this November for three seats on the Board of Education. Staff members, parents, and citizens must ensure our civic responsibility to vote for the candidates who are not running for political gain or to push extreme agendas. The only agenda that should be on the dais is one that truly considers the well-being of all students. Kids First has not lived up to his catchy name. It is up to the citizens of Douglas County to make sure we do not have a board that can run reckless and unchecked. Take note and stay informed. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Speaker. And our last speaker who I informed is in the audience is Ms. Holly Horn. Ms. Horn. Good evening, I'm Holly Horn, and I'm here tonight to speak in favor of policy KBB. During the school board campaign in 2021, we had the opportunity to hear from a lot of community members from all walks of life regarding all things school district. The main conversation we had with stakeholders was surrounding one topic, parent engagement. Community members without children, parents and grandparents all agreed on one thing, parents know what is best for their own children. The vast majority of this community wants parents to be involved in all decision making surrounding their child's health and education. This policy helps to ensure just that. Parent engagement is a no-brainer, no process necessary to know that. If someone has a problem with that, then the problem is with them. Parents were not ignored. This is the accumulation of hundreds of parent conversations. I applaud you for listening to the DCSD community in addressing this policy and hope to see it pass with the unanimous vote from this board tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Horn. That ends public comment. We will now take a 15 minute recess to 630.
Education will come back into order. We're now on item number nine, adoption of consent agenda, staff recommendations detailed and agenda items number 10 through 23 organized for board block approval. Do we have a motion concerning consent agenda? Motion to approve agenda items 10 through 23. Motion by Ray, is there a second? Second. I'll take Williams quick on the trigger. I will now take the roll. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weininger? Aye. Consent items are passed by a vote of six to zero. Next is item number 24, adoption of joint motion agenda. The recommendation is that the Board of Education approve the board minutes as presented. The board minutes attached to this item are for the May 23rd regular board meeting and two special meetings on June 6th. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes as presented? Motion to approve minutes as motion, presented. Motion by Myers. Is there a second? Second. Second by Williams. I'll take the roll. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Passed by a vote of six to zero. We are now into study action items. Item number 25, adoption of the 2023 Master Capital Plan. We have a 10 minute presentation followed by a five minute board q and I will turn it over to the superintendent for introductions. Thank you. I would like to introduce the LRPC chair, um, Larry Mugler. He's here to present the Master Capital Plan. It's all yours. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. Uh, greetings, President Peterson and the board. Uh, as the introduction said, I'm the current chair of the Long Range Planning Committee. And uh, tonight's our item on the agenda here is the master capital plan for the coming year. Uh, just some overview items, and then I'm going to plow through this presentation as quickly as I can. Uh, we have almost 7 million square feet of building space in, that is uh, the responsibility of the school district and how we maintain that is through keeping track of all the needs that we have and hopefully finding the resources to uh, fulfill those needs we're going to look at uh, some of those major items in it hopefully you'll have a chance to look at the full report i know it's many many pages long uh, and i would encourage you to um, particularly look at items that you're somewhat familiar with i always turn to the schools where my granddaughters go, uh, either their elementary school or their Mountain Vista High School, so we uh, can see some of the things that uh, that they are looking forward to. Do I get to push the button or? I can push the button for you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the outline for the Master Capital Plan is pretty much the way it has been the last few years. We have an executive summary, which uh, hopefully everyone will read. Uh, the expl explanation of how we do the uh, calculations with the district staff's major support. We look at new construction needs, uh, details for each of the district's buildings. That's where you can find the school that you're particularly interested in. Information that we obtain from the charter schools is included. Uh, they voluntarily provide that. And whatever they provide, we include. And then a number of appendices that provide some of the details. There were a few changes this year. We've added a Stone Canyon outdoor adventure to the master capital plan. And uh, the $24 million is to really bring that up to a full functioning facility. My granddaughters were just there as uh, high school assistants. Uh, and I asked them, how does the facility look? And they said the buildings they used were fine, but there are a lot of buildings there that are not being used at this point. And it's going to take some resources to bring those up to need. We're also uh, trying to clarify exactly what's included in the capital plan. Not everything is uh, desks or chairs. Some of it are things that uh, wear out. Uh, computers, for example, we do include those in there. And the needs of our transportation staff as well. Uh, the opening and closing of uh, various sites are now included in here. You can find out the history of not just school buildings, of the other buildings that the district owns. A couple of things for next year. Uh, on the next slide. Uh, we're, we have mentions of the Vail campus and the Legacy campus in this current document, but we have not included any of the needs because they're going through major 
renovations now. So watch for that in next year's master capital plan. We'll be looking at what things might be needed in the future to keep those facilities functioning well. The highlight I think this year is this. We have now passed in the next five years uh, a need of over a billion dollars if you look at the high end of the various estimates for costs. Uh, these, and in addition, the six to 10 year capital needs looking further out is another billion dollars. So it, it, it would, John and I before the meeting here were saying if we just had someone who would walk in with that $2 billion check, we'd have this master capital plan covered for a while. But that's going to be a, a major uh, demand that over the next 10 years, we have to come up with, what is that, $100 million a year. Now we'll look at some of the details here. Uh, the schools here in red on the slide were ones that were in uh, the bond issue that did not pass. They have not gone away in terms of needs, and those are the needs that uh, with inflation now of what we anticipate that they will uh, will have. But you can see some of the other major items that are on this list for uh, the next five years as well. So a total cost in that of $392 million there. <clears throat> and then six to 10 years out, uh, again, it would be another billion dollars. The two big items in here are two joint middle and high schools, run one in the Ridgegate area and one in the Sterling Ranch area. Uh, Sterling Ranch at this point has no district schools in it. So uh, in Ridgegate, students are now going to other areas within the, uh, in the district. But you can see there a high school at this point is estimated, if we start building it six years from now, to be $340 million or so for that campus. Uh, we wanted to show you kind of the history here of what uh, the, the costs have been. And you can see uh, that from year to year, they fluctuate quite a bit. And some of that's based on what the district's been doing. Uh, so as we uh, provide funds for various facilities, the costs will go down in the next year. But then we'll have more needs that come up, and then it goes back up again. This is a really good example, I think, because it shows what the impact of the last bond. Uh, you can see the needs in 2019 when we started spending those bond dollars dropped from uh, the year before by uh, $10 million, only went up by $10 million. And then the next year, when we were fully into doing the, the items from the bond, uh, it went down, went down by $58 million. So we actually did accomplish a significant event there, still showed up in the following year, but now in this year's master capital plan, the costs are starting to go back up again because we haven't had those resources to cover those particular items. So there's more work to be done. Most of what I've talked about have been big facilities, high schools, elementary schools, the legacy campus, but there are a lot of other needs that are covered in the master capital plan uh, we go through a process with the district staff of uh, prioritizing things through a number of different tiers. Uh, and some of those are uh, things like roofs or uh, I know we had in here, we've talked about this at the meeting, uh, toilets at a, a school facility are not like the toilet you have in your house. We have to put in facility features that last a lot longer, well, hopefully will last as long as the one at your home, even though they get a lot more use. So uh, some of those things that show up here are replacing those items that keep our schools functioning well. And that's there in that plumbing fixtures item there in the yellow. Uh, but we also have other needs that are, make uh, schools function better. So that would be playground equipment. Uh, and all the way down here to looking at the additional buses that we're likely to need. Uh, even if we get this bond issue passed, we're still going to have some schools where we're going to have to bus students a fair distance uh, because we don't have a school right in their neighborhood. That's a very quick overview of uh, the master capital plan. We've got a couple of the members of the committee, including the chair of our uh, master capital plan subcommittee. So uh, if you have questions, I'm sure uh, either they can answer it or we can get the staff to help out as well. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Muggler. I'll open it up to board directors for questions. Uh, Director Meek. Sure, not a question. Really a thank you to our committee. This is just this immense undertaking that happens. And I don't think most people watching understand what we're talking about with the master capital plan. I don't think we have a printed copy here by any chance, do we? It is a document that is this thick that goes into tremendous detail with every facility throughout the entire district. And um, the amount of work that goes into producing this is just exponential. So thank you very much for that. And it is just an amazing resource and a transparency and accountability tool that we can use to help explain to our community you know, exactly what our needs are, exactly what exists. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to echo Director Meek's comments. Even though it is, I think, the thickest document or darn near that the district produces, it is one of the most digestible. And I, as one director, find it invaluable. I get calls from constituents, whether it's around growth and decline, whether it's around bond mill, and I constantly go to the master capital plan. And I know we're going to get briefings around, say, Coyote Creek later this evening and yes. look at capacity. Right. Uh, or there are two Roxborough schools and where they're heading, heading in terms of capacity. And to have that data and statistics statistics there in such a digestible format is incredible. Um, if you can go to the previous slide, Mr. Blair, um, one comment, and I put this back to the 2018 bond, I think there was some confusion around tiers and priorities, that within each tier there are different priorities, and it, and it doesn't mean it's all tier one first and then all tier two, and I think uh, I think it's better to explain those now. I like the, uh, the way it's broken down for schools, but I think that's a job that we, the board, uh, can do a better job of explaining differences between tiers and priorities. And as you have it out there, if it's a tier one, it's going to close a school down. If it's a tier two, it's probably going to close an area within a school down. And then we get into landscaping, probably not going to close a school down. So uh, it's really important to understand the impact and the fact that the Long Range Planning Committee has done that work to help us in our decision making is incredible. Last thing I'll call out is, and I won't make you go to the slide, is there's a discussion of joint middle schools in Ridgegate area and Sterling Ranch. So when we look at potential bond measures coming up this November, and we look at three particular areas that are targeted, those are the down payments on feeders. Ultimately, what the Long Range Planning Committee is telling us is this is not a singular school fix for these areas. This is the first step in a down payment in feeder areas. And with every year that we delay that building, knowing that those initial schools are three years out, we really disrupt the plan to, to build those anchors of our community, which are our neighborhood schools. So uh, again, just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Other directors, uh, comments, questions? Director Ray. Thank you again, and please thank the entire committee. As Director Meek pointed out, the work you do for us is, is incredible, and it's so clear. Um, I do want to just take a moment um, and acknowledge the addition of the Outdoor Ed Center um, into our master capital plan. I had the pleasure of opening the Outdoor Ed mm -hmm. Center as one of the directors with uh, Denny Ingram. And, and back then we were uh, held to a enterprise program where we had to literally show that we could make the program work uh, and it to be self-funded. And to see it now being valued as a critical program for our kids in the district to the point of investing into the site um, just does my heart well right now. So I'm, I'm just kind of celebrating that. Could you talk, uh, and I don't know if this is Mr. Cosgrove or, or Mr. Um, Muggler, if, what, are, what are some of the anticipated improvements on that site? Um, I know we, we recently approved, improved the cafeteria and expanded that, but if you could just give a quick oversight of, uh, a high level oversight of what we're intending to improve with the $24 million investment. Mr. Cosgrove has those details. Very good, thank you. <laughs> Director Ray, thanks for the question. Board, Superintendent Community, just wanted to bring out speed on, uh, on the Outdoor Education Center. Basically, it's 13 buildings. We use seven of the 13 right now. There are six that we can't use. So as Director Ray said, it is operating, thanks to Jolie Jones, and Danelle Hyatt, it's an unbelievable program for our students. Instead of going up on the foothills or in the mountains, Dettis Park, they can go right here in our county and get a wonderful experience. However, those six buildings can't be used because they cannot be occupied. 
um, that we have a two-story facility, which we call the Lodge, the Wilder Building, which is a dorm. We have Liberty Lodge, uh, the Liberty Lodge. We have various storage buildings and maintenance facilities. And one of the main reasons they can't be occupied is because uh, they're not fire sprinkled. There's one facility on that campus right now that's fire sprinkled, and that's Building 100. That's the Education Center. And this bond, thanks to the Board of Education and the voters, we were able to upgrade the kitchen to increase the capacity, not only seating, but food service, because that's critical for that long overnight uh, stay. But um, we need we need a well, we need a cistern, we need a major infrastructure upgrade. 14 million of the 24 million is simply for the water system and sprinkler system for all of the buildings. Um, these facilities, as reflected in the master capital plan, it's a little bit different of an algorithm in the MCP. It's conceptual and narrative in form. They would basically have to be renovated, almost gutted and not only replacing items, but upgrading the entire facility. So there's a major investment, but once you make that major investment, the program can expand exponentially. So that's why the cost increased to 24 million. And there was a fundamental shift. Several years ago, we added it to our facility backlog. We maintain it fully, but we wanted to document all of the long-term needs in addition to just repairing and replacing the components in the, in the seven buildings that we currently use. I hope that answers your question. So the primary cost is, uh, is for the water is yes. what this, uh, in, this is identifying for us. Yes, so 14 of the 24 million is for the water and cistern system for all of the campus. Um, the rest of the 10 million is for facility upgrades and major upgrades to those six buildings, as well as some component repairs to the seven buildings, which are already fully code compliant, fully safe and being used. Perfect, thank you. Other directors? I just have a couple of things I want to highlight. Nick, did you? If I might. I, I do want to just highlight something out of the executive summary. Um, under celebrations, funds from the 2018 bond have allowed the DCSD to address security upgrades at all neighborhood and charter schools. The most urgent capital improvement projects needed purchases for information and technology and buses. And I read that because I hope we can read that same statement three years from now um, to be able to say that the 2023 uh, bond has has done that. But I, I think, Mr. Mugler, you, you captured it well, the significant improvements we were to make out of that 2018 bond um, was incredible. And, and um, I think it just, again, just accentuates what we can hope for in the future should we be able to secure the funding for continued yes. improvements. So thank you for that. Sure. One other thing we did add in this year was uh, where the district was able to raise some funds, like the sale of the Cantrell School. So there's a, set, a paragraph, I think, in there that talks about the various things that we generated revenue from, not just spent money on. Yeah. And one last. Well, I'll go to Director Meek and then back to Director Ray. Okay. Forget that you're my left. <laughs> Cut off. Okay, it's working. Um, has the committee ever brainstormed ways to use the document to communicate to the community? I know that's probably not part of the charge for the LRPC, but I'm just wondering, is that something that's ever been brainstormed with the committee? Um, we've not had a long discussion about it, but we have had some discussion about would it function better, for example, in two volumes rather than one that's a, a mighty tome? Uh, and if so, would that be more useful to folks? Or are the ways that we could easily have packets that have those individual school sheets available to principals so that they would have that available when they're talking to their PTA or their, uh, their school uh, funding committee? So we've had some discussion, but I think it's something that we want to continue looking at is, is this the best format? It, now that it's electronic and on the website, it's a lot easier for people to search. Are there other ways that we can do that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I asked that for us to think about as well as a board, just because we went through multiple interviews earlier this evening, and a common theme was we need to do a better job at educating folks. You know, we need to help 
people understand. And sometimes it's great we can produce materials, but thinking about how we make the most of those materials to help educate the community and to also explain, you know, if these costs continue to grow, right? And if we're not able to fund them, they come out of the operating costs of the district, I believe. That is how I think it's happened in the past when we were unable to pass a bond. And so then it is taking money that would otherwise be used to educate students in order to do maintenance and you know the most tier one urgent needs. And so I just think there are some ways that maybe we could utilize this to help advance how we're educating the community. And maybe that's something for us to think about as a board when we have a retreat. Director Ray. Just one last thing I want to, to accentuate and, and celebrate. Um, and John actually was, uh, I think, the catalyst of this. But, uh, and I think Director Meek is also alluding to this in terms of all the different resources we use to come to the decisions that we do. But um, specifically, the section that talks about the capital improvement plan versus the master capital plan versus the, the bond plan. And I think that was such a tremendous improvement that we did a couple of years ago. Thank you, John, for, for being persistent on that. But I think it really shows um, our community that, that there's different tools that we use to identify the tier needs. There, there's different tools that uh, Mr. Cosgrove uses to monitor capital improvements versus projecting out what are the capital needs. And so I, I just think that, again, I, I, I know we can discuss the format, but I love everything that's there in one place that really, to me, is an incredible reference tool for any community member what, that wants to understand the why of why we're asking for more monies. They just need to pick up that book and, and, it's, and they see it. So, so thank you, John. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mugler, yes. um, as well, for leading, yes, the, leading the group. Yep. Thank you. Any other directors? Okay, thank you, Mr. Mugler. Uh, I'll make a motion if we want. Uh, you may make a motion. <laughs> and I'll, we move, do I'll want. move that we accept the master capital plan as presented. Second. Motion by Ray. Second. Second by Meek. Without discussion, I will take the roll. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Thank you, LRPC. Aye. <laughs> Weininger? Aye. Passed six to zero. And thank you again to our LRPC. Next, uh, uh, actually, uh, approval of boundary changes for Coyote <laughs> Creek Elementary and Trailblazer Elementary. So, Superintendent, uh, whoever you'd like to introduce for this round. Planning Director Siobhan Caldwell will be presenting this one um, with, with some help from COO Rich Cosgrove. Okay, we're looking for 15 minutes and then five minute Q&A. Thank you. Good evening, directors. Um, I want to start off by acknowledging our new planning specialist, Chris Meehan, in the audience. Our planning department went from one to two this year, so getting this done on a quick timeline, he was very instrumental in. And we also have on the line our uh, consultant from Western Dem Demographics Incorporated. He's our school planning and demographics consultant. So I'll give the presentation, but he'll be available for any questions. He has a very long history with this uh, project in this area. Um, so we're going to start with the, the agenda. I always like to provide an outline of what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about why there's a need for this additional overflow elementary school and boundary assignment. The additional overflow elementary school and boundary assignment that's being recommended by staff and the district uh, planning consultant. Why we're recommending immediate action. So why we're recommending that we act now. The outreach and engagement that we've performed since the need was identified. Um, go over and acknowledge that there are impacts uh, to this decision, but that we've done our absolute best to engage with our stakeholders and accommodate any input and requests that they've had. And then go over questions and considerations um, that were posed primarily by the LRPC, but also by the builder and development community members we met with. And then we have a lot of data to refer to in the appendices if there's additional question. So the need, um, why is there a need for this additional overflow school? And what is that need? In short, Sterling Ranch and Solstice Developments continue to generate students and the current overflow elementary school, which is Coyote Creek for these new developing areas, um, is exceeding its ideal capacity. <clears throat> so you can see from the table that next year Coyote Creek will be at 115% of its facility capacity 
Two portable classrooms will be added this summer to provide the needed seats. Um, but by the 2024-25 school year, and then especially by the five years out, um, we are projected to be 210 seats short at that school, even with all the mobile pads occupied. Um, so with the need for a new neighborhood elementary school in this area identified in the MCP, uh, but funding unknown at this point, uh, and the soonest that a school could be open would be 20, the 26-27 school year, um, this is an immediate need. Uh, as you can see from the table shown, there is available capacity at Roxboro Elementary Schools, um, but we're not recommending boundary assignment to those schools at this time uh, for a few reasons that I'll just go over right now. So primarily, Roxboro Schools are not being recommended as the additional overflow location um, because the developments most adjacent to those schools are about only one half of the way built out. Uh, based on our student generation numbers and forecasts, we're thinking that Roxboro um, is poised to see a potential additional 500 to 570 students upon those filings being fully built out. Um, so can we click on the, the, that link right there? So this is, this is in addition to Roxboro's uh, stable enrollment, which is in the non-growth areas, which makes up about three quarters, about 78% of Roxboro's current enrollment. So we're not anticipating that enrollment to go anywhere. So this would be in addition to that almost 80% of enrollment that's coming from non-growth areas. I wanted to go to page seven of this. This is what was uh, presented to the board at the February work session um, on, Thunder Ridge, on the Thunder Ridge feeder and some of the strategies that we were thinking about. So at the time that this document was presented, uh, when the Coyote Creek overflow system was being, uh, being considered, we were thinking of this east side, west side, west side strategy. It's what was being recommended by staff, um, the WDI consultant, and the SCUBA subcommittee at the time to manage enrollment growth from Sterling Ranch and Solstice. Um, so in short, uh, we are trying to not impact the current DCSD students and families already attending Roxboro. At the time the overflow system was developed, most of one and two had already been built out. Those families were always already going to Roxboro schools. And we wanted to save room for those filings number three and seven most adjacent to Roxboro. So you can see that there's kind of a line that bisects the whole development. So we, the strategy was to assign the Northwest and West filings to Roxboro and to assign the East filings to Coyote Creek. Um, we also knew that the build out of just the, the currently approved Sterling Ranch plans alone required additional capacity than what Roxboro and Coyote Creek alone could provide. So we were looking for a long term boundary solution that had a longer life and we were looking to not have to reboundary kids in and out of Roxboro and Coyote Creek um, continuously to keep up with development. We can go ahead and go back to the slide. Uh, we could go to the next slide. So what is the recommendation? The current overflow system is here. Uh, Sterling Ranch, south of that big utilities easement that you see there, uh, was assigned to Coyote Creek in 2020. And then Solstice 4 and 5, our sol all of Solstice except for 4 and 5, which is the westernmost portion of that development, um, were assigned via the SLIP process in 2021. Um, our recommendation, go over the recommendation right now, is to assign additional overflow school and boundary areas shown in red. We are recommending assigning these to Trailblazer Elementary, effective immediately for the 2023-24 school year. This is recommended and seen as an opportunistic time to implement this um, because of the status of development in these areas. We have five filings, total of 921 lots that could be assigned to a second location with little to no DCSD student and family impact. There is no 2022-23 enrollment in any of these areas at Coyote Creek, and we identified a handful of students and households enrolled at Coyote Creek for the 2023-24 school year. Um, there are very few homes closed in these filings. Uh, these areas are still primarily under uh, developer builder ownership, so we have very few homeowners in these areas as well. And then there in the red at the bottom kind of sums it up. We know that intervention is needed if until a new neighborhood elementary school is available.
available. So it's not a question of if, but more of a question of when. Um, so why act now? Why the, why the if, or why the when? Uh, we want to assign overflow as complete neighborhoods rather than an, on a home by home basis. So we really want to keep neighborhoods intact and avoid fragmenting them in a way that homes in the same neighborhood, neighborhood on the same street, potentially next door to each other, are assigned to different elementary schools. Um, and this may be our last chance to do that. So we are asking for action now. Uh, as opposed to a 2024-25 implementation, which was what was briefed when we um, briefed enrollment projections back in January, um, to lessen the impact to DCSD households because of what we're currently seeing in the residential development of these <clears throat> of these developments, to achieve operational efficiency and to lessen the impact or to balance the impact of development on DCSD schools. So we are seeing an opportunity due to the interest rate situation. Um, constru construction has been stalled and resulting in delayed and speculative construction. It's kind of disjointed across multiple filings in Sterling Ranch and Solstice. Um, so we're seeing homes continuously being built, but occupancy is very low. We don't have people in those homes right now. Our fear is that the interest rate situation will resolve in 2024. Um, resulting in more affordable homes, and those homes will fill up quickly <laughs> with DCSD students. Uh, regarding operational efficiency, we're recommending a sooner rather than later implement implementation. Um, our opportunity is to avoid double busing of multi multiple neighborhoods, so having uh, duplicate routes running in multiple neighborhoods to Trailblazer and to Coyote Creek. Um, this change would result in the addition of one route, um, but we are, I personally am thinking of that as a now versus later impact, so it is an impact that we will fill in 24-25 as well, um, but we would need that route added by the beginning of the 23-24 school year. Uh, regarding impact DCSD households, the opportunity here is to impact a few household, the few households enrolled for 23-24 as opposed to an approximate estimate of about 40 additional households. Um, those new households that we've identified enrolled at Coyote Creek for 23-24 for are all new to the district. Some are coming from out of the state. So they have different expectations of what their neighborhood school should be as opposed to more, homes that had been more established over, over the course of the year. Uh, regarding impact to schools, we want to balance the impact to schools. We have an opportunity where we have two very similar schools. One's overcrowded, one's undersized, and they are very close in proximity to each other. So we have an opportunity for a minimal change regarding current route times and available programming, but to right-size our schools at the same time. Uh, the risk that we want to avoid is uh, Coyote Creek continuing to experience challenges with overcrowding and Trailblazer continuing to experience challenges with being undersized. This is an overview of the outreach and engagement that we did. I want to add that in addition to the external outreach and engagement we did, we did extensive staff engagement and coordination prior to going out to the public. Um, to identify the recommended additional additional overflow school, gain concurrence on the proposed action plan, and to determine impact to individual departments and the overall budget. So EDOS's cabinet, transportation, student data, principals, and registrars were all brought in on this discussion and participated in developing the action plan. Um, the chart shows uh, the external to district staff outreach and engagement that was done. While this, was being, while this was under consideration, we individually contacted the five families with the seven students we found enrolled at Coyote Creek for next year. They explained the proposal, given opportunity to engage, given our personal contact information, and they were um, asked what their school of preference was and if they had a need or desire for DCSD transportation. So you'll see in the next slide that some of, some of the households that were contacted actually preferred or didn't have a preference and are going to be going to Trailblazer instead of Coyote Creek. Uh, four developers and builders were contacted personally to review the pr proposal and provide engagement opportunities. Um, and then we, we 
We visited individual sales offices to review the proposal and provide notice of engagement and provide them with informational staff for their staff, informational materials for their staff and their prospective buyers. Uh, we held two virtual uh, sessions for builder and developer engagement. Provide, that was more of an informational um, engagement, just provided an hour for Q&A. And then all parties were provided written notice via email and certified mail that this was under consideration. Um, and we will do the same following tonight's decision. We'll be following up personally with those families that we found, doing an additional sales office visit, and notifying everybody via email and certified mail. Uh, the LRPC was a big part of our outreach and engagement and considering this, I want to thank them as well for hurrying for, <laughs> and attending uh, a special meeting and then the June 7th meeting. Uh, so <clears throat> at the May 25th special virtual meeting, it was just an opportunity, two hours, for staff to present the proposal and for LRPC to pose their questions and identify what additional information was needed. There was no vote at that, at that meeting. Um, we followed up at the June 7th regular meeting, uh, the SCUBA subcommittee, their subcommittee of the LRPC that looks specifically at this, recommended adoption of the proposed, um, as, of the proposal as presented by staff. And there is the actual motion that was uh, moved, seconded, and approved unanim unanimously by 10 of the 14 members that were present. Um, so this slide is an attempt to summarize and identify stakeholder impact and the feedback that they had um, and how, what we did to mitigate or address that feedback. Uh, so like I said, we identified five households that um, are enrolled at Coyote Creek for the following year, seven students in those households. Three of those households and five total students said they did have a strong preference for Coyote Creek. Um, so we mitigated this by providing them close individual engagement and all of those families under this proposal will be given legacy attendance rights and also transportation will be provided. So that's not typical of these types of changes, but it is off calendar, it's short notice. So we have confirmed that transportation can be provided for these three households. Um, regarding the budget, we've confirmed that this is a very minimal impact to the schools as well as the overall budget. Uh, in, in summary, it's not really an exception to the current site-based budgeting true-up process uh, where the dollars follow the student and they have a central account reserved should um, the principals need it. Uh, and it also helped that the reassignment scenario forecast is actually closer to the principal adjusted site-based budget than our original uh, forecast. So, so in terms of the monies that have to be moved, it's, it's very, very minimal. Uh, regarding transportation, there will be one additional route added. It will be initially underutilized as these areas grow out. Um, but how we're, what we're trying to mitigate is the double busing and duplicate routes of neighborhoods, issues with bus stop logistics. So having two buses at the same stop, potentially issues finding safe, pla safe places for bus stops. And we have an opportunity where we have confirmed that there's really no difference in the existing route times between the current overflow location and Trailblazer. Uh, the builder developers, the four builder developers impact, impacted, we did thorough engagement and provided opportunity to respond to all their questions and provided resources for their sales staff and prospective buyers. I will go over um, from one builder developer, we had a question that we had to have about three meetings to, to work through why, why it wasn't a viable alternative, but we have their support now and they're, they're fully on board. Um, so that's, uh, that's Shea Properties. So they are, they're fully on board right now. So property and homeowners, 14 homeowners were identified. We did individual engagement again with those that had DCSD students enrolled next year and thorough notification and opportunity for engagement via certified mail and email. So these are some of the additional questions and considerations that were posed by LRPC and the builder developer community. Um, the main question was, why now? What's the urgency? What's the, what's the call to action? Why are we in a rush? 
So we are responding to unprecedented residential development environment that we have not seen before. Uh, like I said, you guys were briefed at, enroll at when enrollment projections came out that mobiles would be used to handle capacity um, and that this would be a 24-25 implementation. So we are okay from a capacity lens. We have the needed seats next year. What we did not foresee was speculative disjointed development across multiple filings and many empty houses. Our consultant is calling them zombie subdivisions. So lots of empty houses that could fill up very quick. And we had to do a field survey to identify that condition. Um, and we didn't expect Sterling Ranch to not slow down. We expected them to follow the same trend that the rest of Douglas County uh, followed, which is a significant decline in the fall of last year. Um, after mortgage rates went up, Sterling Ranch has not slowed down at all. Proportionally, they are a very large proportion of the development that's happening in Douglas County right now. Another question we were asked is why weren't two overflow locations and boundaries initially recommended and implemented? So how come we haven't had longer known boundaries if we knew that we didn't have the capacity? We didn't know the effectiveness. This had not been done before at the time that the boundary overflow boundary was uh, developed and adopted. We did not know what the compliance rates would be and if households would adopt their assigned school. Um, we found very good adoption rates. We have found that this community has adopted their uh, address assigned school very well. They have high compliance rates um, and we expect to see the same pattern with this proposed reassignment. And then how were Roxboro primary and intermediate schools considered given that their proximity is much closer? They are closer to some of these filings being recommended for reassignment to Trailblazer. Um, we did a thorough analysis of all the currently approved residential development in Sterling Ranch and Solstice. And like I said, we are anticipating and reser reserving room for a potential additional 500 to 570 students to be added to the current Roxborough attendance area. Um, again, this enrollment growth is in addition to their stable enrollment, which we're not projecting to, to decline significantly. Um, and that's about 78% of Roxborough's enrollment right now. So we are reserving room for those areas that are going to be developing at some point that are very adjacent and very close to Roxborough, closer than the areas proposed. Um, so we were asked if this is a long-term solution, can adjustments be made so all of Solstice goes to Trailblazer and all of Sterling Ranch goes to Coyote Creek? That's the question we got from our builder developer community. Um, preferred to keep Solstice intact. So our explanation was that this is possible, but that we prioritize reducing and avoiding, if at all possible, disruption to DCSD students and families. So this would be prioritizing developers' concerns above our DCSD families and students, and that's our top priority, is to not disrupt their educational career. Um, and they understood that, and they did prefer to implement this on a neighborhood filing basis as opposed to a lot-by-lot lot date of occupancy basis. They, they did agree with that approach. Um, should boundary adjustments be designed with the assumption that no new elementary schools will be, we will be built in this community? Can this be done, and if so, how? This can be done, um, but this would require students to be permanently bused across Highway 85 and further into Highlands Ranch to schools with capacity. So this would be a permanent change to our service model of providing neighborhood schools where needed. So this is not only a solution that would be addressing this area, but a permanent change into what we recommend in the master capital plan, the LRPC previous recommendations, Board of Education approvals, and it also does not align with the initially proposed growth and decline plan. Um, this alternative may, not also, may also not be feasible from a transportation perspective. We don't know if we could uh, staff and transport all those students. <coughs> Boundary adjustments should be designed so that students are not moved more than once, so their educational career is not interrupted, regardless of whether or not a new neighborhood school is built. Can this be done? That is what we're trying to do. <laughs> that is the number one priority of this recommendation, is to have longer lasting boundary changes and to not interrupt uh, DCSD students' educational career. So we are trying to avoid imposing multiple changes to individual students, and this is 
our top priority when consider considering overflow designation and boundary adjustments. Uh, we do still believe that the ultimate resolution of this overflow system is a new, new neighborhood school in the region. Uh, we believe that disruption of movement to a new local neighborhood school would be minimal. In the words of our planning consultant, who's, who has done this across the nation, across the state, they all come home willingly. So students all go, go when the new school is built, they all go to the new neighborhood school willingly and, um, yeah, without issue. Will DCSD continue to be faced with the same tough considerations and requests for recommendations? This is from an LRPC member. Uh, wouldn't grade reconfiguration, moving sixth grade to Ranch View Middle School, provide a longer lasting and less disruptive solution that doesn't require constant evaluation and overflow reassignment? So in summary, yes, we will continue to be faced with these same tough decisions on an annual basis. The SCUBA committee will have to be activated and do these reviews um, as part of their charge uh, until we have a new neighborhood school built there. The sixth grade reconfiguration to Ranch View Middle School is just not an alternative that is available to us right now with the current funding available to us right now. Um, it's been thoroughly discussed and considered since the establishment of the SCUBA Action Plan in the committee in 2019. It was the less preferred approach in comparison to boundary changes, portable classrooms, and new construction, according to a district-wide survey we did. Um, and like I said, this alternative requires substantial funding for the needed modifications and additions to accommodate sixth grade programming. Um, in addition, the, the majority of the enrollment that's being generated from these developments right now is in the lower grades. So this would provide just a portion of the uh, capacity that's needed and you would still have overflow busing on top of that <laughs> at that cost. So it's not, it's not a preferred alternative. Um, and then again, this alternative may not be feasible from a transportation perspective. You still have to transport all those overflow kids and then you have to transport the sixth graders to Ranch View. And then we have, so I have a lot of appendices. If anybody's interested, I will end there and let, let you guys ask questions of me and the uh, consultant, Shannon Bingham. So if, if you would like to see the history of the overflow system, how it was developed, um, how we are, doing this via quick action, via the streamlined limited impact process, uh, what we're estimating for build out of these developments and student generation, uh, what this proposal looks like currently under the proposed scenario for, um, for student generation and facility capacity. We have an updated enrollment forecast for those two schools. And then we have a slide that kind of explains how this reassignment aligns with our five-year capital plan. So I will let questions be asked and sit down. Okay, any questions? And we also have Mr. Bingham online if required. Uh, directors, questions, comments? Director A. First of all, thank you again. Thank you, committee, um, for all your great work. Boundaries are, yes. <laughs> I was thinking of a different adjective, but hard, I'll, I'll go with that, Mr. Geiger. Uh, um, and so the fact that we don't have a room full of, of emotional people um, is, a, is a real clear sign that you have honored the values of least disruptive solutions for our family. So, so I thank you for that. Is, and, and you may have said this, but is, is the, let, let, let's consider best case assumptions. So we, we get a bond election. We, we win, we get a Sterling Ranch built three years from now. Um, the students that are overflowed at Trailblazer, what's the expectation? Is the expectation they pop to their new school after three years or, um, or they have the option? I'm gonna let uh, our consultant WDI Shannon, Shannon take first and I'll, I will add to that because I have additions Thank to you. that. Shannon, are you able to respond to that? Thanks. So oh, I, I don't have video. Can you hear me? We can hear you. So um, uh, when we provide a new school, um, the majority of these families and children will be delighted with that because they'll be coming home, so to speak. So um, I would assume that it will take probably two years after election, probably three to get um, new space provided. And so we believe that now that we are 
subdividing into two overflow locations that we would be able to accommodate children without significant crowding in these two locations um, through that kind of a time frame. Um, I would hope that would be all that we would have to do. Um, and then when the new space opens, we will discontinue both overflow systems as we would elsewhere where we have facility voids and the children would return home with the children that live in their immediate subdivision filings and um, they would only um, experience a change of scenery. Um, they would not continue on with children at Coyote Creek who live on the north side of Highway 85. Uh, they would have normal choice enrollment alternatives available to them if they wanted to continue without transportation in case they engaged significant friendships with students that don't reside in their neighborhoods. But for the most part, uh, after doing this for 40 years, most children and families are delighted with the opportunity to come home to a brand new elementary school. I guess so, I can add to that too. So our current reboundary policy, it's they, they have the option to stay at Trailblazer. What goes away is the transportation provided. So there's always the option to stay um, if capacity is available, but the 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 change would be the, the provision of transportation. And that's under our current uh, legacy boundary redrawing. Uh, policy, which drawing the boundary for a new school would fall under the, the same process and policy. So with these two filings that were overflowing then, what at the three-year mark, what is our estimate of student generation of those two filings? Oh, I have a build-out scenario that I can go to. <laughs> so for all the, is that what you're asking? For wondering, all yeah, the at that three-year mark, how many students would then be going home, as Mr. Bingham said, or have the option to, to remain at their Can we go school. to the um, enroll, the projected enrollment slide, the updated forecast scenario? I will. So I think this is, sorry, no, keep going. That link right there. So this is an updated forecast for Coyote Creek and Trailblazer. Let's go down to the bottom. Um, the oh, Let's go to the middle, sorry. It just shows us the delta. So by year three, 2025, um, there's an estimated 84 okay. kiddos that this reboundary is, is reassigning. Great, thank you. Any other board directors questions? Director Meek? Really just to thank you for such a comprehensive presentation that stands on its own. So I really appreciate all of the appendices with the links so anyone who has questions can understand the process and um, the engagement that has happened that led us to this decision. And so thank you very much for that thorough analysis. Yeah, I'd also commend the committee. I think you really got your priorities right and they're well explained by putting student stability first over developers or other things. And uh, frankly, this is what uh, I've not seen in surrounding districts. The capital things seem to be reactive. This seems to be very preemptive and thought out. And you've given people, at least for the temporary, and we'll see where the bond takes us, but you've given them predictability. You've given them um, some degree of stability and you've given them expectation management, which is the key to that relationship and the trust between those communities. So uh, thank you for being preemptive. Thank you for having your priorities straight. And thank you for the incredible amount of work that went in here to uh, inform a board decision. Director Williams. Just a quick comment. Um, yes, thank you for all your work, but also to the community that we're going to continue to have to have these conversations if we don't do something as as a community as a district by by giving the, the district more funding and so it's kind of a plea i mean it's just sad that we have to continually move uh students from well we don't move the ones that don't want to move but that we have to continue to redistrict um 
and bus kids so far. So I hope that we're not having these conversations forever that we're able to fund so that these, these conversations don't have to be had. But thank you so much for the, the proactiveness. Director Ray. Yeah, I motion that the Board of Education approve the boundary change for Coyote Creek Elementary School and Trailblazer Elementary School as presented. We have a motion by Ray. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Weininger. I'll now take the roll. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weininger? Aye. Six to zero, passed. And again, thank you to the committee. We will now move to number 27, approval of school year 23-24 budget, budget resolutions and financial plan and budget. Uh, turn it over to the superintendent, a 10-minute scheduled presentation followed by board Q&A. Budget Director Colleen Doan is here to present. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So we'll keep this um, very concise as we really did not have much change since we were last before you for the proposed budget in May. And so we are primarily here today to actually seek your vote on the two resolutions, um, but we'll provide a, a brief summary and then articulate um, a highlight of the changes over the last month. All right, so to set the framework first with the overview, I've added an additional column to the graph to the right to indicate that our fund balance at, in our adopted budget is approximately $1 million different from where we were in the proposed. And so again, not much has changed in what we are bringing forward to you today. And so still a, a sustainable budget that will be strategically drawing down the unassigned fund balance compared to our current year 22-23 estimated balance. Overall, per people revenue is going up 8%. In general, the general fund revenue overall is going up 8% while expenses are increasing approximately 7%. And again, the, um, as we just have to emphasize as bolded on the slide, our comparative position remains unchanged as the per people revenue affects all school districts within Colorado. So speaking of all school districts within Colorado, this is the same slide as in the proposed budget um, as the School Finance Act was finalized and um, signed into law prior to our proposed budget. And so to refresh your memory, the base per people is increasing 8% year over year which includes a budget stabilization factor drawdown of $180 million, bringing it to just 1.5% of the budget. And the budget stabilization factor is set to be repealed a year from now in July of 2024, which being, brings our per people revenue up to $10,145 per student for Douglas County School District. Again, every school district um, will see increases to the School Finance Act, we each have a different makeup between our state share and our local share, as shown in the dark blue local and the green um, uh, state share of the bar graph. But then you add on top of that the mill of the override um, piece, and that is what really differentiates the per people funding across the school districts, and that is locally generated and remains local as well. All right, so our priorities, we are investing over $51 million of increased resources into our students and staff this upcoming year. That's a $1 million change from what we were last showing. So again, emphasizing not much has changed from the proposal when we showed $50 million increase. Uh, the priorities are the same. They are investing in our staff, our schools, and our support systems. The staff proposal has not changed. Staff have received their compensation statements for the next year indicating how, um, where they will be paid on the um, license schedules if they are a licensed teacher or what their salary will be if they are a non-licensed position. And these are the increases that uh, the Board of Education has already um, supported for the year. So compensation increases for all of our employees, um, benefit costs remaining flat, Retention stipend is actually out of this fiscal year, not the 23-24, but that will come in September. And then all employees will receive the additional personal day. 
So enhancements in schools, this is where we actually see an addition compared to our proposed budget. So in our proposed budget, we showed increases of $9 million, and they were in mental health, special education, gifted and talented, and then maintaining the school's purchasing power within their discretionary funds to cover for cost of living. The enhancement here is additional substitute support. So our schools are um, budget out of their non-discretionary funds, meaning they're given in a prescribed manner, and they do not carry over resources to pay for substitutes when teachers are um, out for um, absences due to sick or personal day use. And we have found since the pandemic that with the shortage of subs and increase of illness that we have been exceeding that budget and schools have been on the hook for that difference. And so we listened to our principals. Our principals um, had a great conversation in May and we pulled together um, an increased proposal um, that uh, Superintendent Kane's cabinet recommended um, to increase the support um, financially for substitutes within school budget. So it doesn't change the rates for substitutes, but it increases how much money is held within each school budget to cover for substitutes. And then investing in support systems. This total um, is the same as it was within the proposed budget. Um, a little um, small shifts in some departments, but really um, nothing um, to a financially material level uh, changing the support systems within our proposed budget. And so all of that detail um, at the amounts per department is included within the actual adopted financial plan and budget that you have within your materials today. So as we look at the summary um, here with, uh, within a pie chart, um, we are seeing that shift but from district managed student programming to school managed student programming, but overall the pie of dollars is um, slightly increased as we um, did invest those additional dollars into substitutes. And so 72% of the combined general fund will be budgeted directly within schools. These are the dollars that are um, under the financial ownership of our school principals. So what we're actually asking for today, like I mentioned at the beginning, is your vote on two resolutions. The first one is our appropriation resolution. This is the authority to spend money. This is really important because we are not authorized by law to spend any money July 1 until we receive a vote of the Board of Education. We are not allowed to exceed these dollars, um, even by a single dollar on over $800 million. And so this is what we are asking for you to approve. And if there's a zero by the fund, that just means that we will not be utilizing that fund um, in the upcoming year. And then our second resolution that we are seeking um, your vote on tonight is the use of fund balance. This is indicating that we are intentionally drawing down or using our reserves across a variety of funds so that our ending fund balance will be less than our beginning fund balance. And so the funds where we are intentionally drawing down the reserves are our general fund, our capital projects fund, the transportation fund, our pupil activity fund, the child care fund, our certificate of participation lease payment, the building fund, and short-term disability. Um, again, these are all intentional. None will create any long-term financial stability issues. So then finally, um, to assist you in your um, decision making on the vote, as well as to provide additional clarity to you and our public, we've included within the board agenda item all the supplementary information. So our full financial plan and budget um, is comprehensive review of all things financial related to this upcoming school year. It includes the fund level financials on all school districts. It includes a three-year forecast um, on each of these same funds to provide that multi-year perspective. It includes five years of financials on every single school, neighborhood alternative and charter, and every single department. Um, and then there are the resolutions within there as well. So this does need to happen by statute um, by June 30th. That is the legal deadline. And then later this summer, we will be releasing our full uh, budget book, which will include a bunch of uh, non-financial information that is pertinent to the budget as well. So that wraps up this presentation, and now happy to take any questions on our 23-24 budget. Director's questions, comments? Director Weiniger. Um, 
Thanks for the presentation, Colleen. Um, just for the board's benefit, the FOC did view this presentation at their June 8th meeting and provided a memo with their um, comments, which I'm sure you all saw because it was attached. And just a very quick summary, they um, recognize that our spending is more than our revenue due to us investing so much in our teachers, which we should, and our staff, and all the other great things that keep our schools running with the people. Um, and they just had comments around how that is unsustainable um, in the long term and you know funding is needed and other um, changes would be needed in the long term. So um, just want to thank the FOC for putting that all together and thought they had some great ideas and recommendations and things to look closer at um, maybe for this next year. But I, I think this is a great job well done and thank you for your presentation. Other directors? Thanks, Director Winnegar. Director Ray. Um, yeah, Director Winnegar, uh, a question about that. And I'm, um, I'm wondering about how we pace our timing with FOC. Because I was a little surprised that FOC is giving these recommendations. And I agree that certainly they can be worked on for next year. But kind of my understanding has always been that the FOC um, is kind of the um, they see this first, and then they give us recommendations regarding approval. So I'm just wondering, is there is there a reason why FOC is making this recommendation so late before staff have had a chance to really respond to it? Or And should we be looking at a different timeline where we get the FOC's recommendations before we're asked to approve the final budget? Does that make sense? I believe it has to do with staff's um, workload and getting the final budget put together. <clears throat> I'll let Superintendent Kane expand on that because she knows more on this. Timing. Thank you for the question. Um, also, the statutory deadline, um, staff needs sufficient time to be able to prepare the budget to have a budget presentation to be able to give FOC. Um, and then normally we would address their questions during the FOC meeting. So I, I hope that helps. I don't know if you want to add anything, Ms. Doan. Um, I just want to add, we did survey the FOC months ago, I believe it was in January or February, regarding their priorities. Uh, we just um, did not have a formal memo from the FOC indicating a formal recommendation until um, earlier this month. Which I think is my question is, do we need to look at that differently? Do we need to look at having FOC provide the memo um, sooner than, because I, I, I understand the urgency of getting this approved before the end of the month. I'm just not, I guess I understand that it couldn't be presented to FOC at a certain time, but is there a reason FOC can't provide their memo sooner, I think is my question. Well, there's not a final budget until, when, when is the final budget ready, Colleen? Like right before the FOC meeting, I feel like sometimes. Um, yes, but this is pretty much the same as the propose, which the FOC did see in early May. Yeah, and then they get any changes. That's my question is, is why not a memo in early May? Uh, and I, I'm just I'm just looking at how we can improve our because it just feels like that it, that when we get our committee's recommendations after the fact as opposed to helping us hear from them just like we listen to LRPC with their master capital plan it just seems like it would make more sense to do it earlier so I'm just wondering if there's a way to move that timeline up in the future so that there we're truly getting feedback from our committee before we're asked to approve the budget. And I, and I don't know, Superintendent Kane, is that averse to what you're thinking can be done or? No, um, from staff's perspective, that can absolutely be done. Um, I think it's probably a discussion um, that, that you all would want to have with FOC. OK. Director Meek. I mean, I think part of the challenge is the legislature isn't making their final decisions, which, and I think this year it was even later, <laughs> right? I think it was later for them to kind of agree to some things. But I think part of it's driven by the legislative timeline. But I agree, the more advance notice we have as a board from our committee, the better. Maybe it's something we can talk about. I just think it's a tough thing to do. Yeah, the one question I would have, and maybe it's for Director Weininger and, and, and for others, there is a recommendation in the FOC memo of using in the future some of the undesignated reserves to create designated reserves for operating and capital improvements. And the, the FOC said that would provide greater stability for the board to adapt uh, to the unknown financial needs in the future. It's just wondering if 
you could expound upon the committee's thoughts on that or maybe get a superintendent comment on that recommendation for future budgets. Yeah, from my understanding, um, the discussion at FOC was, um, wow, we have all these unassigned reserves um, and it was building up, like why don't we use that money maybe to build schools or maybe to do this? And I think they um, felt like it was kind of like, okay, why do you have all this money in savings? You're not doing anything with it. And there is, um, it's good to have a healthy balance of cash that you're holding for just in case, but I think they, their thoughts were just labeling those more um, specifically than what we have them. Superintendent Kane, thoughts? Well, as um, Director Doan mentioned, we are strategically planning to draw down fund balance so that we can hold on to our people. So that is, um, that is a, a significant piece of it, but certainly if we are unable to get any capital funding, that is where we would have to look um, in order to be able to meet our capital needs. While keeping in mind, I, I do wanna also remind um, the board that part of our financial stability is our credit rating, and our credit rating does depend on um, a certain amount of reserves. So there's just a really, really careful balance there because if we lose our credit rating, um, that's, that's a significant impact on not only the district, but our taxpayers as well. So um, it's just a delicate balance. Thank you, Superintendent. Director Ray. So is there a concern? I, I, I mean, since we are kind of in the deficit spin down the, the, the fund balance, is there a concern that our rating would change? Uh, I'm sorry if that's what I communicated. No, no there is not a concern. Again, Ms. Colleen has shown, um, in her last presentation, she showed the fund balance um, being strategically drawn down and then how it will be all right um, in a few years, it'll be back to where it was. Um, my comment was with respect to the idea of spending all of the unreserved fund balance on capital projects. Um, that's the balance that I was referring to. We are absolutely not in any danger of our credit rating changing anytime soon. But if we spent everything we had on capital, um, that would be a different situation. Thank you, Superintendent. Other directors? Director Ray. So, so one of the things, and I, I know I've talked with Ms. Doan and also Ms. Leishner about this, I think one of the things we don't celebrate enough in, in your financial plan is how we differentiate funding for needs of students. And, and I would love, you know, I, I know we're not prepared to do that tonight, but one of the, th the, the moments I had as I was looking through the, the financial plan was just really seeing the variation and really seeing equitable distribution of funds um, in a very concrete way. And, you know, that's something we've worked on for a long time where we don't just say every, you know, you get your $10,000 per student and good luck. We, we listen to uh, whether or not there's a highly impacted school or whether the school has extraordinary circumstances that requires additional funding beyond just the, um, the, the, the standard amounts of some time, not now. But I think it would be worth, because uh, I know we've had lots of questions about equity, you know, and I think we tend to get a narrow lens that equity is just about uh, marginalized populations. Well, equity also means making sure that all students' needs are being met regardless of where they are on their path. And, and I think the budget, uh, you've aligned that beautifully, Ms. Leisner, as well, um, to really show that we differentiate based on need. It's not just, um, you know, a formula and we say good luck. We, we listen and, and we, we finance your school's needs accordingly. So sometime I'd like to see us emphasize that because I think that's something that I don't know that all schools, all districts, I mean, do because we do have this mechanism of a student-based budget that really already set the framework to accommodate that. Um, but I think we could go into even more detail to show that off a little bit. So that would just be a recommendation I would make for future considerations. So. Um, just to, to comment briefly on that, um, yes, our, our site-based budgets use what we call our weighted student funding formula. And our budget book to be published later this summer will include an overview of that and which different student um, characteristics and school characteristics we use to assign weights to our student populations. Director Meek. Yeah. 
Colleen, thank you so much. I'm glad to hear that's going to be in the budget book. You read my mind. I think that will be really helpful for the community to understand. And really, I just wanted to commend you on all of the work that your small but mighty team does to pull this together. And I know it's a, it's a heavy lift at this time of year. So okay. thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion or questions by directors? Director Ray? Yeah. And, um, I also brought up the notion this the board at our last meeting approved a $10 increase in student fees across the board. And that's an increased revenue stream that we didn't anticipate. My understanding from your budget team is that we'll see that reconciled in the January 2024 report. But if you can just kind of give our community an overview of when they're spending that additional $10 where does that revenue show up? Where will it show up in our budget? And how will schools benefit uh, from that additional mm -hmm. revenue? Uh, yes, instructional material fees, I believe is what you are referring to, um, are site-based discretionary funds. And so they'll be retained with the school. So um, that would be something that would be recorded at the individual school's cost center and um, can directly offset any materials or curricular purchases made by that school's budget in that year. And should the revenue exceed the expense, um, it is eligible to carry over within the school's balance. And we estimate that to be somewhere between 400 to 600,000 600, additional revenue for just that increase in um, fee? I'm not prepared to answer that right okay. now as I haven't done that analysis yet. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other questions or comments by directors, I'll call the roll, the rec or sorry, I'll entertain a motion, <laughs> then call the roll. The recommendation is the Board of Education approved the school year 2023-2024 adopted financial plan and budget as presented. Do we have a motion? A motion that we approve the financial plan, which also includes the appropriation resolution and the use of fund balance resolution. Thank you for the clarification. As motioned by Director Ray, do we have a second? Second. Second by Myers. I will now take the roll. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Passed six to zero. Thank you, Ms. Stone, who was already seated. Um, item number 28, funding options to meet capital and operating needs. Uh, this is an info only item scheduled for 15 minute presentation. You have the um, the outgoing chair and the incoming chair of the Fiscal Oversight Committee. Gentlemen, I'll have you introduce yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. Uh, my name is Jim Morris. I'm the outgoing chair of FOC. Um, I'll introduce my, been my vice chair for a number of years and will now be, as of July 1st, the chair of FOC going forward. So um, I just take a couple minutes to say that the five years I've spent on FOC has been an incredible learning experience. And, you know, with the board changes and staff changes, there's been two faces that I've seen at every meeting for five years, in the UAE, and that's the two ladies sitting back here. Where, where did Jana go? There she is. Um, Jana and Colleen. So I want to thank them for. Um, all their information and, and taking time uh, to work with FOC and, and putting up with some erroneous questions sometimes for me. So um, I'll just cover this real briefly. Um, so when we started the school year last year, uh, the board uh, gave us a list of things they wanted us to do this year. This was one of them, to look at, you know, what else can the board do to increase funding for the district. And so this information literally comes right from the um, CDE website. And we've taken it and put it into memo form and then given you a little bit of FOC comments um, on the discussion that we had on this memo. So obviously, number one, uh, as the district has used in the past, bonded indebtedness to raise money to do things. Um, and obviously, it takes a, a vote of the voters in the district uh, to approve that. And of course, then, you know, the district's required to pay principal and interest going forward. Um, the district is limited to outstanding bond and indebtedness of not in excess of 20% or 25% for rapidly growing districts. That's not an issue for us here. Um, district shall invite charter schools to participate in the discussions regarding possible ballot questions. And so again, our comments here on the bottom of, of number one is this is historically how DCSD has used bonding authority. 
it involves significant issuance costs. So based on the information, you know, you can look at the, the 2018 approval and the bond that was issued in 2019 and see what kind of issuance costs were involved. And based on staff discussions with FOC, you know, they're estimating that a $450 million bond, for example, would have about a $25 million issuance cost. So that's the people you're paying, what I call the players, um, in the environment that it takes to issue bonds, okay? Um, the second item I want to talk about is number two on the list here, the Special Building and Technology Fund. So again, the district would have to hold an election, get voter approval, and you could levy up to 10 mills for no more than three years. Money generated by this levy could be used to purchase land, construction, purchase maintenance of facilities, purchase and installation of building security, instructional and informational technology. So again, pretty broad, just like a bond, very broad. So again, it's similar to though, like an MLO where it would be you know, annual money for a certain period of time, in this case, up to three years. So 10 mills, so prior to the you know, what's coming with property tax valuations. One mill here in the district, I believe, generated about $8 million. And the projection, um, based on comments from staff, that with what we're seeing coming down the road, unless something happens, um, one mill would generate about $11.5 million in revenue. So that would be, you know, if you did 10 times 11 and a half for three years. So it, you know, it's a, uh, where you issue a bond, you get the money up front. Or if you issue the bond in two issuances, you would get some now and some two years from now. And then you'd repay that bond for 20 years with interest. With this fund, like the MLO, it's annual money. There's no issuance costs, but you only get the money for three years. Okay? All right. On to the next page, the... Third thing and final thing I want to talk about is item number five, which is also called a Supplemental Capital Construction Technology and Maintenance Fund. So again, voter approval required. You can expand your tax revenue, providing ongoing cash funding for capital construction, new technology, existing technology upgrades, maintenance needs of the district. So again, uh, you have to ask the charter schools to have those discussions with you. Um, you know, again, you'll see that this maybe doesn't seem a lot different number number two, but this was new as of fiscal year 2016, 2017 that the state set this up. So again, more like a MLO type of fund where the money comes every year. Um, this one doesn't have the three year time limit on it. So it would be like MLO ongoing unless the election would sunset the MLO levy for this. Uh, and so again, you know, the one mill would, you know, be the $11.5 million estimated based on the new valuation. So again, this recurring funding source would not involve any issuance costs or interest payments because the money would just come each year with tax revenue. Uh, and this funding source could also more classly, uh, closely match the period over which, you know, shorter lived assets, you know, would be used. So, for example, you wouldn't necessarily take 20 year bond money to buy computers uh, that you're going to pay that money back over, you know, a longer period of time, potentially. So, so um, data from the CDE for school year 21-22, which was the latest data that I could get, said that six districts in Colorado use either the Special Building and Technology Fund or Supplemental Capital Construction Technology and Maintenance Fund, MLOs. Cherry Creek, Littleton, Boulder, and Denver are nearby districts that have these sources for funding. And I will open it up for questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, any questions from directors? Director Weiniger and then Director Meek. Thanks for coming and presenting, Jim. I actually um, asked to have Jim present on this. And just so you know, this isn't to talk about this year's funding. Um, I think we put in a lot of work to, well, the staff has put in a lot of work to figure out what to um, do on the ballot this year. This is more for future years and just another way of thinking, hmm, maybe this, these ones are more appealing to our taxpayers if, if need be. Um, and then also, I just want to note the reason Jim skipped number three and four is because we're not eligible for those ones, correct? Right. So, so the loan program for capital improvements, there's no districts in the state that use that option right now. And then the other uh, best program is only for uh, most dangerous and most needy facilities, which um, comments from the staff were that the district doesn't qualify are there either. So, yeah. so I, I, I put them down because they're on the CDE website. 
but they're um, literally not available to the district here. Yeah, so, makes sense. I just yeah. wanted to clarify yeah. why this got skipped and, over, but thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll also say that, you know, there's pros and cons to every discussion and every question. So, you know, the pro to the bond and MLOs, it's you got two ballot questions and you either get it or you don't. The con is if you don't get it, you get nothing. The, the pro to these other funds uh, is that you could get one and maybe not the others. They'd be smaller amounts, uh, but then you don't get everything. You know, you, if you do a, you know, a 10 mils for three years, you may get that, but then you don't have, you know, the $450 million bond. So, so again, you know, it's again, you know, Kaylee asked me uh, during the break, she goes, well, what do you think we should do? And I said, that's a dangerous question to ask me. And she knows that as the staff do. Um, what I think you should do is educate yourself, gather the information, look at your options and make an informed decision. Your informed decisions are always going to be better than uninformed decisions. Mr. Uh, Coop, you got any comments? Or there was another question from Director Ray. No, go ahead, and then we'll go back to director questions and comments. Jim did a wonderful job presenting. <clears throat> um, I thank Jim for his service as well. We, we recognize it for the last meeting, but I look forward to working with you and the team uh, next year moving forward. So thank you. Director Meek. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I like your advice. Inform ourselves and then make an informed decision. Do the research. I'm curious, um, is this an exhaustive list or are these just the ones that you would recommend that we research? Well, um, this is the list from the Colorado Department of Education. What they list is options for school districts. Okay. Um, so if there's something other than this, I'm not aware it would be, and, and CDE doesn't list it as an option other than, than these five, I guess, even though theoretically there's only three available. I think the discussions I had with staff when we started talking about this at FLC several months ago was, you know, well, you're never going to hear about this from your bond attorneys or your fiscal advisors. And I go, well, why? It's the $25 million question because they're not gonna get paid if you do something other than a bond. Um, just like the people that did all the work for you prior to the last election, they didn't get paid because the bond didn't get approved and didn't get sold. They only get paid when it gets sold. So, so you know, keep in mind that all your consultants from the financial side that are coming to you are not gonna bring these up because that's not what they're in the business to do, which I get it. I mean, I, I was a finance guy too, so I get it. But one of the conversations I had with a political um, consultant regarding a bond election on another present on another job that I do on the side um, and I asked him because I, I was asking him about well how do we educate our voters and get them on board with this and you know we need to get this information out there I said what's your goal he said my goal is one vote more than I need to pass this and uh, so if you take from a political perspective I think that the goal to get these done is you got to have one vote more and uh, if we get that we'll get this money so yes yeah, so thank you yeah. um, I do think there are other MLO types like transportation MLO I think there there's quite a few mm. options that are out there and I think the Colorado School Finance Project actually tracks every district um, and the yep. type of bond or MLO. And so that might be a good research effort for us is to kind of look and see what other districts are using or have been successful with. Yep. Um, so thank you for this presentation. Yep, it's really educational. Any other directors, comments? Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. And then we are moving into item number 29. Again, info only, staff MLO bond recommendation. It is a 30-minute presentation followed by 15-minute Q&A. Okay, 10-minute recess right now, sorry. And uh, then we ready. will have our presentation since it is scheduled for 30 minutes with 15-minute Q&A. It is, uh, we'll just call it 8 o'clock. We'll reconvene at 8.10. Thank you. Sorry, staff.
We'll come back into session. We are on item number 29, staff MLO bond recommendations, a 30 minute presentation. Okay, take two. <laughs> All right, um, this is our uh, staff recommendation on a 2023 bond mill levy override. And before I start, I want you to see that um, all of cabinet is sitting here behind me. While I'm presenting the majority of this recommendation, um, this was a team effort. Every detail in this recommendation, and if you've had a chance to look at the details behind it um, in the plans that have been posted on the electronic school board, um, the amount of work that has gone into this by um, everyone on cabinet and their staffs has been remarkable and outstanding work. And so we do this together as a team. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that we made that part clear. Okay, I'm pointing it over there. See, I got it. All right. <laughs> he said, don't point it at the slides, point it over here. Um, which is a little backwards. Okay, so we are going to talk about our continued funding challenges. Um, the changing tax environment. One of the things that was mentioned um, by the FOC chair um, was needing to make an informed decision and making sure that you have all of the latest research. Um, and so we'll talk about the changing tax environment, including um, our most recent polling that we did in response to the changing tax environment. Um, our 2023 mill levy override recommendation, the bond recommendation, an analysis of the impact on our taxpayers, which is very different than it was last time, um, proposed ballot language, and then a question and answer. Um, you don't need to decide anything tonight, of course. This is just an informational presentation, but we hope getting all of this to you now will give you a lot of time to do your own analysis. As always, we are focused on the board ends um, of academic excellence, outstanding educators and staff, safe, positive culture and climate, collaborative parent, family and community relations, and financial well-being. All of these ends are touched by our proposal. Okay, so let's start with our continued funding challenges as a school district. Um, the impact of local taxes on comparative revenue. So you saw this from Budget Director Doan um, a little while ago, that the comparative revenue with other districts is still a significant challenge for our district. Um, and in particular, that light gray on the top is the uh, is Milevi override dollars per student. That is where our disparity is. The black boxes are the state dollars. Um, Ms. Doan actually showed an updated version of this graph for um, the 23-24 school year in terms of the local and state balance. So when local funding goes up, state funding goes down. State, state funding always makes sure you get to the top of your box, um, but no further. And uh, so our neighbors in Cherry Creek and Littleton Public Schools receive $2,000 per student more in mill levy override funding. So I'm gonna say that again, $2,000 per student more in mill levy override funding for Cherry Creek and Littleton, which equates to a gap of about $130 million. This is why we can't pay competitively. Looking at this challenge over time, and I know the board has seen this before, but for our community, looking at this challenge over time is really important. Back in 2009, which is the far left of this graph, our, our mill levy override dollars per student were not drastically different than our neighbors. Um, and so our ability to pay competitively, which was much stronger. As time moves ahead and our neighbors continue to increase their mill levy override dollars, the gap became larger and larger and larger um, to what it is today, which is a significant gap. Um, and it has also a direct correlation to the significant gap in average teacher salary between us and the competing districts. Our current starting teacher pay is 45,209 and that is for next year. Um, a college degree teaching professional cannot afford to live in Douglas County for 45,209. I'm going to have CFO Schleisner talk a little bit about um, the changing tax landscape. Thank you. So property taxes and home values are a really, really hot topic right now. 
So mine, I assume all of yours, went up significantly as those values are based on the 2020 and 2022 sales that happened in the market. Um, so what I want to make very clear is that while that increase in property taxes can mean imp increased property, increased taxes to many, many entities, that is not the case for school districts. Our funding is still based on the School Finance Act and all it does is change who pays the bill. It does not change how much money we get. So that's a very confusing point, to, I think, to a lot of our, our community that they think we're going to get more funding. It stays exactly the same. The state's proposed solution to these increased rates are, is Proposition HH. What this does is it, it decreases the assessment rate to 6.7. It should be 6.765, so it reduces that rate just a little bit. What that does is takes the market value times that assessment rate to give you an assessed value, and then that assessed value is what they apply the, the mill rates to to come to the taxes. So that would go down a little, and it would also exempt the first 50,000 of that property value for the primary residents. In return, they are asking voters if they can keep an additional 1% of the Tabor refunds that would be refunded to taxpayers. That is the only reason why this needs to go on a ballot is for that Tabor refund reason. The rest of it they could do without a vote of the taxpayers. The constitutionality of Proposition HH is being briefed to the, um, the Colorado Supreme Court on June 30th. So well, we'll either know in July what this means to our tax rates and our tax our home values, or we will have to wait until November when this hits the ballot for what the voters decide. Thank you. So as I mentioned, we did do um, additional polling. Um, we felt that the investment of doing additional polling was um, well worth it to make sure that the Board of Education had all of the information that they need, um, especially since taxpayers received the letter that CFO Schleisner mentioned um, with your new tax or your new assessed value of your home. Um, I know we received one at my house and it was quite the sticker shock. And I think that um, people across our county have, have seen that same sticker shock and then the uncertainty of Proposition HH. We felt that environment was something where we needed to see if we were still in a good position. Um, so polling occurred the week of June 12th and it was the same, um, the same parameters as the previous poll that we had done just with fewer questions, um, but the same parameters in terms of the end size and all the other um, everything else. The, the memo that we received, it just closed, so we don't have, you know, detailed PowerPoints or anything yet. But the memo that we received, um, they put together the preliminary memo on Friday for us to be able to attach. Um, the bottom line is that support for 5A is actually slightly stronger than the March poll, and support for 5B has stayed essentially the same within the margin of error. Um, and that is even when voters are reminded that about their higher taxes. You got your letter, right? You know that your assessed value is going up. Um, and so 95% were aware, um, had gotten their letter. They were aware of the um, increase to their taxes. Um, and again, this is all um, likely voters for November of 2023. They are also aware generally of Proposition HH um, and their support again stayed the same to slightly increased from our March poll. Uh, we did expect a slide given the um, tax environment, so um, our consultant and us were very excited that, that support stayed the same. I think that is the best outcome we could have hoped for. Okay, so given that, what is our, I, I love these, I love these pictures. I'm going to interrupt for a moment. I love these pictures and the reason I love these pictures, these kids are who we are fighting for. My daughter, my youngest daughter has already graduated and thanks to Douglas County and a great education in our county, she has an incredibly bright future, as do all of my children, as do many of your children. It is these children that we want to make sure have the same bright, amazing future and opportunities that our children benefited from. 
Um, that little guy under 2039, he will be a third generation Douglas County School District student. Um, amazing. Okay. Um, Mill Levy override recommendation overview. So staff is recommending a $60 million from the Mill Levy override for competitive compensation. Very similar to last um, November when we made this recommendation last summer. And a $6 million um, part of the Mill Levy override for enhanced security staffing. So we've talked to the Board of Education that that would be coming. Um, so it is a total of a $66 million mill levy override. Um, as always, we share our mill levy overrides with our district authorized charters, um, and we share those 100%, so they receive a per student share for the same purposes. So our charters would use their uh, share of the mill levy override money for the same purposes that the district um, would be using them. So you can kind of see the district allocation and the charter allocation. A quick note about charter schools that are residing in Douglas County that are not authorized by our school district. The School Finance Act included a commitment that um, starting next year, all CSI schools would have equal mill levy override share to their local districts. What this means is if we have a successful mill levy override, um, election that generates about a thousand dollars a student for us and for our charter schools that are authorized in our district it would also generate a thousand dollars a student for the CSI schools that would come from that state fund um, so they would receive the proportionate increase but from the state fund okay oops I'm going backwards so district compensation changes so let's talk about that first this is very, very similar to um, the recommendation made last summer. We are still struggling with competitive pay for our teachers and for our staff. And actually, I would like to pause here for just a moment and ask um, Assistant Superintendent Windsor and Deputy Superintendent Hyatt to just give you a real brief, um, some real brief examples of what the impact has been on our district of not being able to pay our staff competitively. So let's start with Assistant Superintendent Windsor. Thank you very much, Superintendent Kane. Good evening, it's good to see you, Board of Directors. Um, this is a, about a, as a real and everyday conversation I have with our school leaders. So you can imagine in February we went out and start hiring teachers. The conversation we have about not only retaining our teachers, but recruiting teachers is one of our greatest challenges. I can tell you, as of last Thursday, we lost the following teachers due to pay from certain categories. Spanish, art, math, counseling, moderate needs, assistant principal, dean, sixth grade elementary teacher. And that was as of Thursday at about 3.30 p.m. as of to this morning due to pay. And so when you look at the impact this is having on our ability to be able to recruit teachers, already in a very thin pool because there's a teacher shortage and on top of our pay where it is we are putting ourselves at a disadvantage and we have been as creative as we can huge thank you to um, um, our incredibly awarded uh, chief human resource officer as well but we're trying to be as creative as we can and so this is a very real issue that we potentially could limit programming opportunities for students if we don't do this work Good evening, directors. Let me share a little bit of, of my story with you as well. And it really actually speaks to um, Director Ray's comment earlier about the, the pride we should have in our district around equitable distribution of resources. Um, and through our weighted student formula, we acknowledge that we need to support our students with different uh, staffing um, and positions to support their individual needs. That becomes increasingly difficult to do in our very hard to hire and hardest to hire positions. So all of the special education related positions, mental health, safety and security are all positions right now that we are struggling uh, with filling our vacancies. And so 
so many good efforts on behalf of all of us to do what's right by our students in supporting what their individual needs are in our schools. We need to be able to compensate our staff in order to um, attract and retain the incredible folks that are working with our students. Um, one I hear frequently, and I'm sure you do as well, is our educational assistant for um, positions. Those positions are our folks, our educators who support our students with disabilities. And there are often pleas in our schools by our principals as well as our staff around what can we do to help increase their compensation. We increased their hours this year to be able to give them time for development and planning. What can we do for compensation? And so there definitely is such a need in supporting all of the individual needs of all of our students around compensation. Okay, so what would we do about it if we won um, a mill levy override? Here's our recommendation. Our teachers, licensed staff, would receive an average of 9.2% increase. Um, you can click on this link, anyone in the public can click on this link and see the salary schedules as they would look if a mill levy override was successful. Um, the salary schedules are also contained in our MLO bond plan that is posted on the Electronic School Board and will be posted on our website. Um, the, we would, uh, all teachers, for teachers, again, it's a 9.2 average increase, a minimum of 7% for our regular teacher, our regular employees. So, um, those who are oversell, et cetera, everyone would, there would be a minimum of 7%, an average of 9.2. Um, we even would do a 3.5% increase for our post-retirement 110 employees because we need them too. Um, they have been so critical to our system and we want to make sure that they um, stay around as long as we can keep them around. Our support staff, um, so Danelle just gave a specific example of our support staff, would receive a flat 9% increase. Um, so that's for support staff including EA4s, custodial, kitchen, um, folks in front offices, registrars, et cetera, who are supporting the needs of our schools and our students and are critical to the success of our schools. All other staff would receive a flat 7% increase um, because we are struggling to be competitive in every single aspect of our school district. Um, Assistant Superintendent Windsor just mentioned how many assistant principal candidates we have lost. Um, we have recently hired principal candidates. That's been really challenging um, based on our pay being so much lower than surrounding districts. Um, we have information technology professionals, et cetera, that we need to try to pay a little more competitively as well because we have major stash staffing issues in those areas as well. All the increases would be retroactive to July 1st. Um, the January 2024 payroll would contain a lump sum um, payment for the retroactive part of the increase and then their new rate would begin in February. So um, that is a little bit of what the compensation changes would look like if an MLO passed. Um, if the board so desires, we could put a resolution, a proposed resolution before you all that would solidify these compensation changes in advance of a mill levy override going on a ballot so that there is assurance to our staff and our public exactly what the compensation will look like instead of guessing. Um, so what would this do for, um, what would this do to make us more competitive? Because that's what we really need to be is more competitive. So you can see here, if you look at um, a starting teacher pay, for example, which is the first line, um, last year, starting teacher made 43,680. Um, next year, starting teacher will make 45,209. If we pass an MLO, our starting teachers would make 50, um, 50,182. So we would finally make it over that $50,000 threshold. Um, you can see in the notes what starting salary is for um, surrounding districts. Um, so that would make us much more competitive in terms of our ability to get starting teachers. Education assistance um, would go up to 19.21 an hour. Bus drivers, we would actually be um, very competitive in the area of bus drivers for like five minutes. I also don't want to set expectations high. We would be competitive for five minutes, but the minute we're able to put our rate at 24.92, everyone will everyone else will go up to 26. 
But still, 2492 is a great rate and can really get us um, some bus drivers. We have 660 bus driver openings in our district, as you all are painfully aware of and our public is, um, as we've been unable to provide the kind of transportation that people have come to expect in Douglas County. Security, campus security specialists, custodians, et cetera. So you can see how we would get more competitive in some specific examples. Um, a few important notes about the mill levy override in terms of compensation. Once um, we would rerun the data on July 1st to make sure that we have the most accurate data possible. The comp if, you, if the Board of Education passes a resolution for compensation, if the election is successful, that resolution will automatically kick in and the changes will automatically be made. Um, upon finalizing and, and once the board has decided to put something on the ballot, our employees would actually receive a statement in September that would tell them exactly what their individual compensation would be post MLO so that there aren't any surprises. The um, other component of the MLO is for safety and security support for our schools and our students to make sure that we are doing everything in our power to keep our schools and students as safe as possible. So that includes a couple of things here. First of all, um, we want additional school resource officer support. We are so grateful to our law enforcement jurisdictions for partnering with the school district in terms of school resource officers. Um, our district has incredible access to school resource officers. We have an SRO in every middle school and high school, and we have SROs that share our elementary schools. However, we would like to increase that coverage across all of our jurisdictions so that um, as our set SROs take um, time off or need to be off for training, we can fill in those gaps with coverage and we can um, increase the coverage in our elementary schools. We would also like to be able to hire a campus security specialist for each of our district-run elementary schools. Again, charter schools will get their share of this security money to be able to do the same for their schools if they choose to. Um, campus security specialists are currently on site for our high schools and our middle schools, uh, multiple, multiple in each of our high schools and our middle schools, and have been really key personnel in terms of, not only in terms of watching out for safety and security and monitoring um, who's entering the building, et cetera, monitoring visitor access, et cetera. They've also been really key in terms of relationships with students and building those really positive um, relationships. So that would be a component. And then finally, there would be an annual equipment allowance to make sure that um, our security team has the ability to replace outdated equipment as needed um, on a regular annual basis instead of waiting for a bond every four years. Okay, that is the mill levy override. Um, the recommendation for the bond. So the total bond that staff is recommending is $484 million. This is more than what was recommended in 2022. Um, we had a discussion at a previous board meeting about, we, we had two choices in front of us, um, because what cost $450 million a year ago costs more now. And so the question was, do we decrease scope to make up for inflation, or do we keep the same scope, understanding that the total bond is going to be a little bit more? Um, and so we did the latter. $484 million is the total bond request. Um, these are the components of the bond, and I'm going to go through each of these components individually. So let's start with safety and security for 15 million. Um, we need to do some equipment replacement and upgrades that um, mill levy override ongoing budget will allow us to be able to continue to do that, but we need to do some sweeping um, upgrades across our system with radio communication, security equipment, and general upgrades to our buildings for safety and security. We also want to um, be able to expand our career and technical education programming. We heard a lot tonight as we listened to candidates who um, interviewed for the Board of Education, and we heard a lot about needing to invest in career and technical education. Um, this would allow us to complete phase two of the legacy campus, which will allow us to include a lot more of the trades um, 
uh, in career and technical education would also allow us to have an automotive program in the Highlands Ranch area. Currently, we ha offer automotive programs in um, Parker as well as in Castle Rock, but we do not have an automotive program in the Highlands Ranch area for our students, and the demand for that program is very significant. 145 million in capital renewal and replacement. So this is making sure that our buildings um, are functioning. These are those needs that were talked about um, in the master capital plan um, to ensure that our critical maintenance is happening as well as maintenance that just needs to happen. Um, so from you've got uh, district educational facilities, capital maintenance. Um, most of those projects are listed somewhere in the master capital plan, but we have them detailed in the bond plan. Um, charter facilities, capital maintenance, so that's $8 million. Um, that's about less than 2% of our overall bond, and it's compliant with the law. So the projects um, all meet the same criteria in terms of age of the building, et cetera, how you would qualify as our neighborhood school buildings do, and um, the whatever's being replaced or renewed in theory could be um, picked up and recovered and um, if the charter school, if something should happen to the charter school. Um, emergency capital maintenance allowance, this is for those urgent issues as they arise. Um, an LED upgrade district-wide, this would be expected to um, increase, uh, to have energy savings significantly over time, which will help us with our operational dollars. You may remember this is something, um, a subgroup of our student advisory group um, looked into and researched, and we certainly agree with their research and have done some ourselves. Um, so that is an LED upgrade district-wide, ADA-related improvements, playground upgrades, school bus and vehicle replacements. Um, we have many, many school buses with many, many miles, um, and so we need to be able to replace um, our older school buses to make sure that we're continuing um, to provide safe transportation to school. All right, neighborhood school construction of 226 million. Now, the first thing I wanna note is the amounts that you see here differ from the amounts on the uh, master capital plan presentation. Um, and that is because the timing is different. The master capital plan was um, cut off in January in terms of pricing, but we had to project out pricing um, for when we would actually spend the dollars. So the difference is an inflationary difference. The second difference from the MCP is the Sterling Ranch neighborhood school in the MCP has more square footage than the other neighborhood schools um, due to the demands in Sterling Ranch. That would be the ideal situation. We scaled it back a little bit um, for a bridge facility. So I'll talk about that. Um, in a little bit. So we would, we definitely would like more square footage in Sterling Ranch, but we also tried to stay within a reasonable range. So these are, this is what we need. Um, a neighborhood school in the canyons, Sterling Ranch, Crystal Valley, Mesa Middle School expansion, and a Sierra Middle School expansion. If you look at the appendix, and for our, our public, if you look at the appendix, um, there is a, a more detailed justification for why there are, those are the neighborhood schools um, that are desperately needed based on the one to five year master capital plan and also based on, um, I believe what Shannon Bingham called voids. We have voids in our district. We have large, large geographical areas that have no schools. Um, and so we are busing students from one place to another place that is quite a distance away and it's not a long-term solution. $17 million investment in special education. Um, and I'm going to start with the Parker Bridge facility. So at the quarter of Dransfelt and Longs, I believe, there is um, a district facility where, is, where one of our bridge programs is, but it is, a, it is essentially a mobile um, on, standing on a site. And that is, that is our facility for our students um, with special needs in our bridge program in the Parker area, and that's not okay. Um, our students need a real building, a real parking lot, um, and just the ability to have what we would expect from um, an educational facility anywhere else in Douglas County. Um, and that would include child find and early childhood education as well. Specialized career and technical education capital improvements, 
um, for specifically to make sure that we increase access um, for our students with special needs. Additional center-based programming throughout our district. Um, replacement of special education vehicles, so the school buses that transport our students with special needs to and from school need to be replaced, um, and other special education related improvements. And athletics and activities. So you can see as I go through this that this bond really touches every single student in our district in some way. Um, our athletic facilities need some upgrades where we need to do um, replacement of tracks and fields because they are old and have degraded. Um, and some of our auditoriums have become very old and degraded and we have broken seats, um, torn curtains, all kinds of things that need to be upgraded. Um, we need to do a, st a staff and student device refresh across our entire school district. Okay, so that is the recommendation for the bond. And now let's talk about the impact on our taxpayers. So the combined net impact on taxpayers um, is actually $20 per year per 100,000 in home value. That would be the change from what taxpayers are paying currently. Um, and so that's about $100 a year for a $500,000 house. And again, that's a change from what the taxpayers are currently paying. So here are some of the details. For the new mill levy override by itself, the increase is $40 a year for $100,000 in home value. So about $200 a year per $500,000 home. Um, but the existing MLO, the impact of the existing MLO on taxpayers is about to go down. If you remember, our mill levy overrides are fixed dollar amounts. And this means as we have more residents moving into Douglas County, the impact on any individual resident decreases. So our existing MLO will actually cause um, a decrease about $16 per year. So the overall effect of the new and existing MLO when netted together is $24 per year per 100,000. So this is just the MLO. And then the bond, if the bond passes, it would save taxpayers $4 a year per 100,000. So even if that bond passes, taxes still go down on the bond, the mills still go down from 6.7 6 mills to 5.75 mills. If the bond does not pass, we would drop all the way to five mills, which would save taxpayers about 11.50 a year per $100,000 home. So when you net the $4 savings with the uh, per 100,000 with the $24 increase for the mill levy override, the net of that is $20 per 100,000 per year. Um, in, in home value. So it's actually a, a smaller impact than it would have been last year um, by quite a bit. And a lot of that is the, the, the um, number of homes changing and of course um, our tax structure changing altogether. Okay, and then um, finally I just want to show you um, ballot language. So we've done a lot of work with our consultant and in response to polling and the focus groups. I can't even tell you how helpful the focus groups were in terms of um, working on our ballot language and making it as understandable as we possibly can while making sure, of course, that it is compliant with the legal language that needs to be in the ballot language. So the mill levy override ballot language has actually been simplified quite a bit from last year. Um, and so I will read it out loud. Shall Douglas County School District taxes be increased $66 million annually, commencing in collection year 2024, and remaining at this amount, amount each year thereafter in order to retain and attract excellent teachers and staff by increasing salaries to be more competitive with neighboring districts, and increase and maintain school security support, such as school resource officers. Um, and shall such tax increase be imposed pursuant to and in accordance with section 2254-108 COS, CRS, and shall the district collect property tax revenue previously approved by the voters notwithstanding any mill limitation. 
um, and shall the district's expenditures be subject to oversight by a citizens committee. So this is um, a lot less words and a little more compact and a little more clear. Um, so that's the mill levy override language. The ballot, uh, the bond language, um, as mentioned previously, um, what taxpayer, what, what people really wanted to see from the bond language was providing safe and adequate facilities for staff and students and reducing overcrowding. Um, so the, the bond language starts out with, without any expected increase, in the district's current debt service mill levy of 6.7 mills. So I'm gonna stop there for a moment. So there will not be an increase. In fact, there will be a decrease. And what we talked about is having language that said with an expected decrease of one mill in the district's 6.7 mills, that turned out to be not helpful. Um, that turned out to actually be super confusing because taxpayers you know, would kind of look at that and go, wait wait so you're taking on more debt and there's a decrease it, it actually caused confusion in the in the question so this is the language that staff is recommending without any expected increase in the district's current debt service mill levy of 6.7 mills um, shall our debt be increased um, and we would be using for these three bullet items implementing school safety and security as previously discussed expanding career and technical education opportunities for students, and updating, maintaining, equipping, replacing, and constructing educational facilities consistent with the district bond plan, as may be amended, because we may have to amend it. If, if, if a roof caves in somewhere else, we're gonna have to reprioritize the caved in roof. Um, to provide safe and adequate learning spaces for students and staff, and to reduce overcrowding. So just keeping it really simple. And then the second part of the bond language is simpler, but still what is required by law. Um, and then of course, and shall the district's expenditures be subject to oversight by a citizens committee. Okay, so in conclusion, um, we are recommending a $66 million mill levy override to pay teachers and staff more competitively and to increase security support in our schools, including school resource officers. A $484 million bond to expand career and technical education opportunities, do safety and security upgrades, and make sure that we have safe, adequate educational facilities that avoid overcrowding. Um, and again, the net impact to taxpayers if both initiatives pass is $100 a year for a $500,000 home. So for our taxpayers of a million dollar home, that's $200 a year. So it is not. Um, it is not a huge uh, change to taxpayers. It is absolutely an increase, but we hope that it isn't um, a huge increase. That estimate is based on an assumption of a 35% increase in assessed values. Um, so that is a summary of our proposal. And then finally, next steps would be um, first of all, we would need some direction from the Board of Education as to if you would like us to bring recommended resolutions forward, and if so, would you like those for the first meeting in August or the second meeting in August? The resolutions that we would have to put forward for the Board of Education's consideration would be a $60 million, uh, sorry, it should say $66 million mill levy override. I don't know how I missed that. A compensation resolution um, and an election resolution for a $450 million bond. Um, we recommend that the Board of Education uh, extend the charter for MBOC should the election be successful. And then finally, of course, note that the Fair Campaign Practices Act kicks in once a vote is taken. Um, so that is a, a high level summary of staff's proposal. Um, I would welcome any questions that the Board of Education may have. And my whole team is here as well to uh, help address questions. Directors, questions, comments? Director Myers, then Director Meek. Well, thank you. Um, I think we heard specifically from our candidates tonight that this is something that's important for our community. We've got our work cut out for us, but um, 
All I ask is that I not walk with Matt Reynolds this year because he walks too fast. <laughs> so, <laughs> but otherwise, I'm, you know, I just think this is what we need for our teachers. This is what we need for our community. And clearly, clearly, I, we just really have to communicate the importance of this. Thank you. Uh, Director Meek, then Director Williams. Yeah, so thank you so much. This is really, really helpful. Um, gosh, I have a few questions. The polling that was done, was it based on the impact, financial impact? So it used that language in the recent polling? Yeah. Um, the, the, yes, it used the financial impact language, but the dollar amount was a little bit different. It was a higher dollar amount. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just because we didn't net out the decreases. Um, so it was a, a slightly higher dollar amount. So I was kind of shocked to see the difference now from before. And I think that's going to be um, important to be able to explain. And I haven't had time to digest it. But basically, it's because we have more people, right? And because of our fixed MLO amount, it would be going down because we have more individuals moving into our county. Is that the main reason or are there other reasons? Yeah, that's that's a good part of the reason. And last time we weren't on a reassessment year, so it was much easier to make a lot of these calculations because it was just plain growth. Now we're in reassessment, and now we have all these significant increases in property values. So it makes it very different atmosphere this year than it was last time. Thank you, uh, Director Williams. Then Director Ray. Actually, I just. First of all, thank you. I know that was a lot of work. But I just wanted to make a comment on the bond language, that first sentence that we talked a lot about last year, wanting to say that we're not increasing um, taxes. And that was not put in the bond language last year. So I'm really happy to see that as the first part of the sentence. So thank you. Director Ray. Uh, can we go to slide 16? I think this. It's the breakdown. Um, so I heard you say we're sharing some of the bond proceeds with charters. And my understanding is that $8 million goes to for them for capital renewal and replacement. Mm -hmm. Is that included already in that $145 million itemized? Yes, okay. it is included already in the $145 million. So one out of the, here's, the, here's what totals up to the $145 million. Right. And part of that is the $8 million for charter school facilities, which yeah. equates to about 1.6% of the overall bond. And then you also mentioned that they would also be getting um, the same amount for security or, or an amount for security. Where, does that, where is that reflected in that itemized list? Um, that's a very good question. So in terms of safety and security upgrades for the bond, um, that does impact every single educational facility, including our charter schools. Um, so as new cameras or um, whatever other upgrades may be needed over time, um, that is something that we take ownership of and look at as a district-wide um, district, district issue. So that $15 million that you have itemized on that previous slide includes making sure that all buildings, neighborhood charters, yeah, meet that it. standard for security. Correct. Okay. And then on the MLO, same question with charters. You mentioned that the charters will get um, a slice of the MLO for security purposes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm going. I went the wrong way. For some reason, this is backwards from how it should be, at least in my head. Yes. So for the MLO, so if you look at the security component of the MLO, um, our charters would receive a per student share of that, and then um, the expectation would be that that per student share, they. The expectation of our charters is that they are consistent with the ballot language, just as we are. So um, the ballot language doesn't break out exactly what dollars need to be for security and what dollars need to be for compensation, but it is expected that they would follow the ballot language. Um, it is my assumption that they would use this um, $1.4 million for security, but they, they, as long as they follow the ballot language, they're fine. So the ballot language has such as 
security resource mm -hmm. officer. So I guess that's where I'm going with this is yep. that I know we've always prided ourselves in, in standardizing our security standards in all our buildings, that we don't just say you can be an anomaly and you can decide right. what kind, you know, whether you have an SRO or whether you have some guy that's, you know, a, a campus specialist. So I'm just wondering, that's my concern is yep. how are we standardizing that so that all schools are meeting the same standard of security? Thank you for that question. Um, I actually started doing a slide on that issue in particular, and then it just got so convoluted that I took it out. So I'm going to attempt to explain. Um, for, for school resource officers, um, the district has IGAs with our um, law enforcement partners for us to get school resource officers from them. In the case of our elementary schools, where the school resource officers um, patrol multiple elementary schools, that includes our charter schools. So our school resource officers, as you said, we have um, that coverage. And then the charters pay for that through their purchase services contract. So when we get additional school resource officers through this mill levy override, and they're covering our entire district, including our charters. The charter school's um, purchase service for school resource officers would go up appropriately. So part of this money, they would turn around and spend on purchase services to send back to us. I start, like, as I said, I started to put that in a slide and and that's when I stopped because yeah, it's, feel it's very I mean, confusing. Like I said, I mean, I'm just concerned about yes. anomalies and us you know, having some schools as a one-off um, you know, we had the tragedy of STEM that I think um, we saw an example of that. And so I just want to make sure that uh, we're taking care of all kids, regardless of what roof they're under. So thank you for that. I hope that helps. It does. Yeah, relative to the ballot language, if we can bring up the MLO language, Mr. Blair. I, I think it. it's. No, except I always go the wrong direction. <laughs> I don't know. Or the superintendent, right. whoever's really driving. Uh, MLO, please. Thank yep. you. Um, neither of the ballot languages mentioned charter schools, and Director Ray just mentioned that. Uh, and I know that shorter is better. Um, do we expect to potentially modify this, or uh, at least explain in the Tabor guide or the uh, the taxpayers guide um, how that would work? Uh, I know last year the MLO there was a discussion on sharing or not sharing with CSI authorized schools. As you mentioned, that has completely been mitigated by actions of the legislature. The legislature, in fact, it's even better than what was asked for because that sharing would come or that match rather than sharing, I guess match is a more yeah. appropriate term. That match comes from the state and does not dilute our funds in terms of total per pupil from neighborhood schools and district authorized charters. So do you think we, I guess what I'm looking for is a recommendation, should we add explicit and district authorized charters to one or both of these initiatives? Or do we think we just explain that uh, in the, the voter's guide? It is um, explained on our website and in our bond mill levy override um, uh, plan that we put together. Um, and in our communications, I think that's the place where um, we explain it in terms of what my recommendation would be. And as you know, it isn't staff who puts together the Tabor guide um, in terms of picking that language that comes from citizens, but it would be great if that were in the citizens guide, including the fact that CSI schools um, also have a benefit from the um, from the mill levy override due to matching funds from the state. Yeah, just wondering out loud, I wonder if Citizen King could write that response. I don't know if that's prohibited as an employee. <laughs> um, in uh, Along with that, the um, if we can just go to slide seven, Mr. Blair, uh, I think that's where we have the buckets. And it discusses HH and, and where we are. So just to be clear, uh, sorry, back to the, well, I guess that was the right there. Thank okay. you, just the buckets. Mm -hmm. I guess it's slide five, thank you. Um, if HH should pass, and in exchange for a slight reduction in rates, um, ultimately the taxpayers give up a, a extra percentage in withholding in Tabor. And my understanding is assessments go up, that black outline does not change at all. 
property taxes next year could double, assessment rates could double, and all that would happen is we would see a much bigger blue portion of that and a much smaller green portion. So as local taxes stay here in the district, which I think is a good thing, but the state green bar goes down, 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 less and less, where does that state money go? So if our local share goes up and then the state share decreases, if the state share is decreasing um, across the board for, for all school districts, it means they would have more money in their K-12 education fund um, to be able to either increase the black box for everybody um, ultimately or to be able to allocate to other places. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily, it could go to education, but it could go to general fund, other things. Obviously, we already heard the proposal to eliminate the rest of the um, uh, budget stabilization factor next year. It could go to that or any other non-education related purposes, correct? That is a complicated answer. I think that we would have to research based on what statute currently says about the K-12 education fund. Yeah, last thing I'd, I'd like to bring up is uh, last year this board took, I don't know, 45 minutes messing with the MLO language to try to make it more and more and more restrictive. Right now it says in order to, I would even propose exclusively for whatever we can to let the taxpayers know that the MLO can only go for those purposes. However, I do appreciate for Mr. Cosgrove and everybody else's sake, the flexibility that is intentionally left into the bond language, because as you stated, we don't know over the spend and the life cycle of that bond what unknown priorities may arise. So uh, I think the board should um, maintain that very tight exclusive language that frankly doesn't give us any wiggle room. And I also support the superintendent's recommendation of uh, Ideally, as one director, and I'd like other directors to weigh in, what I heard from our MBEC is first meeting in August would be preferred. It does seem to, it does trigger the statutory triggers for staff and others, but it does give us some other flexibility around fundraising, other things like that, certainty, messaging to the public. So um, what I'm proposing as one director is we target the first meeting in August to vote on bond language, to vote on MLO language, and to do what we did last year, which is to preemptively lock in those salary schedules that then can go out to staff and then we are done. We have committed to staff exactly how uh, that money is going to be spent and frankly, not leaving ourselves any discretion. I think that's key to trust building internally with our staff. So if board members would just like to comment on that, does anyone disagree with the first meeting for votes and does anyone disagree with also including a vote on fixing schedules that would automatically trigger. I'll go to Director Weiniger. I think you had your hand. Um, that's what I was about to mention is um, I agree we should bring forward those resolutions you had listed on the last slide. And I, I think the first meeting in August works, yeah. I'm not opposed to that. Other director comments on the timing of vote and uh, including schedules, Director Meek. Yeah, I was going to say slide 17 with the language. Um, I, I agree being able to make it explicitly clear that anyone can come to the district website and see exactly, you know, the salary schedules. I think, I, I don't know what the right language is to do that, but under the first bullet, you know, retain and attract excellent teachers and staff by increasing salaries as indicated on whatever. Similar that. to with the district uh, plan. Okay. Yeah, something, something to that effect. So it's absolutely clear. I mean, I, I do think we have, and I mean, we have trust issues with our public as indicated in polls and everything else. And I, I think the more we can, be explicit, the better. Um, I also wonder, you know, does it make sense for us to wait until August? Is there a benefit to, you know, voting on this earlier? I know MBEC discussed this quite a bit. I remember election night where people were saying, why didn't we go out earlier? And so I know there are pros and cons and it triggers, you know, certain requirements, but I think it's worthy of a discussion if we are ready sooner is it worth going out sooner if 
yeah, just to reply to that, I, I think I specifically call the discussion or the recommendation with the MBAC, and then really the dis discussion was, do you do it the first one in August or the second one? Um, as one director, I believe we would want to wait until August because too early um, it does trigger statutory restrictions on our staff, uh, not just our superintendent cabinet, but all our teachers, uh, other staff members, and their ability to advocate uh, for that measure uh, once we vote. However, they can always, after hours, not on school time, continue to do what they need. Director Williams. So you're right. We did have this discussion, I think, about whether or not we should put the ballot on and the, and the pros and cons. I hate to call you out, Krista Gilstrap, but um, since she has kind of taken up running the campaign, do you mind speaking to that? Well, hi. Um, honestly, um, it's a complicated question. I think my preference from the campaign perspective would probably be early August. I don't think we get a, a huge benefit of going earlier than that. Um, what I learned last time is we're not going to have ballot numbers until September, early September, regardless of when you vote because of how the county works. Um, so we're not going to be able to have yes on 5A, 5B, whatever signs, we're not going to be able to have that till September regardless. But I'm early August should help us reel in that fundraising. Like I mentioned, the campaign is working on fundraising. And a lot of the people that we're talking to, they'll pledge, but they don't want to give us an actual check until there's an actual measure. Um, and because some of these corporations have some red tape, they've got to go through their accounting department, it can take time. So even if you vote early August, I still might not get a check for the campaign till September. You know, So the sooner the better. Um, but I know that there's benefits to not handcuffing the staff sooner, so it's kind of a balance. So I think the campaign's perspective would be probably early August as opposed to late August, if that helps. Thank you, sorry to put you on the spot. The comment that I would make is that um, staff is working over the summer to make sure that we do everything we can to communicate with our community um, about why we are making the recommendation that we are making and, and um, the details behind it. And one example of that, similar to how the county sent a letter to taxpayers um, explaining your new assessed value and you know where the money is going and all of that. Um, the district would like to send a letter, an actual hard letter to taxpayers um, that talks about um, our funding and um, our, the impact of assessed value changes on the school district and why we, the staff of the school district, made the recommendation to the Board of Education that we did. Um, and that it would be nice for that letter to be able to um, go to taxpayers prior to a vote. Director Ray. I wanted to talk about the explicitness of the of the language and then I'll I'll throw the suggestion out, but then I'm gonna back away and just say I know that you guys have worked really hard with Bond Council and so I'm not an expert. But if I'm reading this as a Joe Parent type of a person, um, when I look at Mill Levy the Mill Levy language, um, my preference would be to get to the increasing all employees. Uh, salaries right away as opposed to the fluff that I, I feel like there's fluff words like retain and attract excellent teachers it seems like that's what I that's what I hit first as a as a lay person and then I get to the increased salaries so I would I would reverse that mm -hmm. and and say to increase all employees salaries in order to retain and attract um, would be would be just something I would throw out there again take that and don't don't feel like you need to act on that, but I just, I'm the kind of person like, get to it. And because I think it's what our community wants is to hear guarantee that this is gonna go to teachers. You're not gonna just go out there and go to job fairs and attract and retain. You're gonna increase salaries. Um, so that's just one suggestion I have on that. The other on this language is school resource officers. Um, our district, you know, definitely, and I value our SROs, but we also know a neighboring district where this is really highly controversial, you know, where they're going through if the, they should bring SROs back in buildings or whatnot. Um, and so the only wondering I have is, is 
I know this is, says such as, but do we also want to include and campus security, for instance, because um, it, it appears that we're taking a position that SROs is our main way of, of increasing security in our schools. Okay, thank you for those suggestions. Um, let me tackle them one at a time. Okay. Um, so we can absolutely look at switching the language on the first bullet to have increasing salaries um, as the lead. And actually my question for the whole board is, um, one option is to have that first bullet simply say, increasing salaries to be more, increasing salaries for teachers and staff to be more competitive with neighboring districts and just leave it. Yeah. Okay, um, the second, now in response to your second question, Director A, um, alternatively, if we left it as increase and maintain school security support, um, I think our concern in recommending this language was we don't want to reheat up this whole, oh my God, they're gonna arm teachers and they're asking for money to arm teachers. So um, one of the reasons we called out school resource officers in particular is to send the message of um, we're talking about law enforcement officials and not arming um, teachers and staff in the schools that that aren't armed today. So that was actually kind of our thinking in calling out school resource officers. Um, I think that in our community there is a lot of support for school resource officers and it is a nice way to communicate that we believe partnership with law enforcement is how we handle physical security um, in our schools rather than arming our staff and teachers. Yeah, that's, that's a good rationale. I, I'm good with that. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, sorry, I'll, I'll go then, Director Weininger. Um, as I was sitting here thinking about, the, I agree with both things that you just said. I, I even like the shorter first bullet. I, I like keeping the second bullet. Um, but I'm still worried that some people, based on discussions or just lack of education, will think that this is purely for our neighborhood schools and there's not that sharing that you explained. And we have one in four, you know, approximately one quarter of our students in the district attend one of our district authorized charter schools. So I'm wondering if there wouldn't be a concise way to stick in somewhere, maybe even at the front, um, commencing in, uh, uh, and remain this amount for each year for local or district operated uh, and something, whatever, you figure out the word to say local public schools and district authorized charters and just insert that brief language into both the mill levy and the bond so we don't lose potential charter votes, which are one quarter of our students. Again, I'm not asking for a specific recommendation right now just to maybe take it back to the staff over the summer, consider it, give us an option uh, in August as a board to maybe look at version one, version two, but I'm, I'm afraid that that'll just get lost in the minutia of a explanation in a book and people want to read it on the ballot and know that this is um, being shared with our district authorized charters. Um, so when, one thing we could do, President Peterson, is um, it, could, it could have increasing salaries of teachers and staff to be more competitive with neighboring districts, increasing salaries of teachers and staff, including district charter schools to be more competitive with neighboring districts. Yeah, we I'll, could I'll, do something along you, those lines, I'll but let we'll you think about it. Thank think you. about it, don't need an answer okay. now, but I just think that we may want to insert some explicit reference to our district authorized charters in both languages. Um, so they understand that this is all of Douglas County. And now that we've had legislative changes for CSI, don't want to put that in there. That would make it super wonky and super long. But it truly is benefiting all the students in the county. Okay. Uh, Director Weininger. Yeah, I like that idea, Director Peterson, because I think that does get forgotten that charter schools are included in this. Um, I have a question. Is it ballot language law that you have to mention the dollar amount first? Because I was just thinking people might stop there and not go past what it's used for if we show what it's used for and then it mention the dollar amount. Just a thought. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not going to answer that question. Um, okay, well, if, we if can, the board wants to seek legal it. advice, that is um, something we can do separately. But um, I don't have an easy answer for that outside of executive session. Okay, that's fine. We can figure it out another time. Thank you, though. Mm -hmm. Director Ray. On the uh, bond language, we could look at that for a second. Yeah. 
So again, as I was reading through this, I was really trying to put the hat on of the of the ultimate uh, critic that's like looking for reasons to say they're they're going to try to uh, sneak one in, and and so from the first sentence, without any expected increase, um, that word is you know that for me, Joe Lehman says ah, but that isn't that they're going to increase it though. Uh, they, they're saying they're, they're just covering their bases by using the word any expected increase. So one of my questions there is, can, do we need to have, have that in there? I understand that probably from the bond council's point of view, it covers our bases just in case. It's a safety net, I get that. And then the other phrase, and I think you addressed this, was as may be amended. And I, and I get the rationale that if we have a collapsing roof, we may need to amend our bond plan. Um, I guess I would hope that we could stick with the bomb plan and use other funds to take care of the emergency roof, um, whether that's contingency funds for emergencies or whatnot. Because when I read that as a layperson, it's it's a slippery again. It's like you know, it's not definite. They may amend it, you know. And we even heard that even after the 2018, you know, they went out and bought the legacy campus, and we didn't approve the bonds for the legacy campus, you know. So. My question is, those are two words that struck me as something we may want to look at if we can. Um, thank you for that question. We will look into the second question. Um, our bond plan, our MLO bond plan, also states that those individual capital projects may be amended from time to time. So perhaps that is sufficient. Um, but we will look into that. On, on your first question, um, the theory, in theory, in theory, property values could crater. Um, and if property values crater, then that's why it says expected, without any expected increase. Um, because if property values completely crater, there could, in theory, there could be an increase. Um, and so that's, that's the reason for that language. Um, I don't feel like there's a lot of flexibility on that. Um, however, the second, um, let us look into. Thank you. And I'm sure all the bond councils out there listening hate this board, but uh, <laughs> we are we are just trying to oh, convey intent. Um, any other directors, questions, comments? Okay, so to summarize, that although this is not an action item, uh, what I believe I heard from the board was we'd like something uh, for the first meeting in August. We will plan three items to vote bond language, you know, post modification, MLO language, and the salary schedule. So we'll expect all of those three items to be ready um, for that meeting. And then there's been a couple recommendations by various directors for consideration on some potential language changes, which of course you'll have to look at with staff and, and the lawyers. Did I miss anything, other directors? Okay, thank you, Superintendent Kane. Thank you. And I, again, I want to say thank you to my entire team, even though I was up here doing most of the talking. Um, this amazing team of people have put together all of the details behind this um, and have been amazing. So, um, and then President Peterson, in response to the language, um, we will come back with revised language based on the feedback from the board. My suggestion would be that um, we be careful about um, changing language on the spot. So hopefully I can, hopefully I can deliver to you um, based on your feedback, what will be satisfactory. So thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you, Superintendent Kane. We're moving on to item 30, proposed new policy, JLCDC, medically necessary treatment in school, second, uh, school setting. This is a second reading and the recommendation will be that the Board of Education consider adopting proposed new policy JLCDC medically necessary treatment in a school setting. Thank you, Mr. Blair, for, for having the red line version available to us. And I believe we're going to have some preemptive remarks by Director, uh, excuse me, Assistant Deputy Director Hyatt. Got to get my two uh, superintendents. Thank you, Director, uh, Deputy Superintendent Hyatt. Thank you. Thank you, President Peterson. Let me give you a few overview remarks uh, as you consider the second reading of policy JLCDC. 
Um, as stated at the last Board of Education meeting, uh, Colorado State Law, House Bill 221260, which was signed into law in June 22, 2022, requires school districts to adopt a policy that addresses how a student who has an order or a recommendation from a qualified health care pro provider for medically necessary treatment receives such treatment in the school setting as required by federal and state laws. The District, school districts are required to have a policy in place by July 1st, 2023. The intention of JLCDC, the medically necessary treatment in schools, is to ensure our students have meaningful access to medically necessary services in schools. So the first reading of this policy was at the June 6th Board of Education meeting. This policy was developed by a district team, including special education directors, health wellness and prevention directors, um, our coordinators and leads, legal counsel, and was based on CASB's policy. After the first reading, we collected additional feedback on the policy from community members, from staff and our community partners. The themes from this feedback included such things as clarification about how this policy is different than previous policy. And I just wanna reiterate, this is a brand new policy. So there wasn't a redlined version that compared a previous policy to a new policy. So there was some questions about that in the community feedback form. So this is not a change to an existing policy. Um, better clarity on what types of services are being discussed in this policy. So as I stated at the June 6th Board of Education meeting, uh, the law does make mention of treatments that include such things as behavioral health treatment for our students um, who have autism spectrum disorder um, and may receive such um, treatment as ABA therapy in the school setting. So that is specifically stated in the law. This is not just solely based on that, but that is one example of medically necessary treatment in the school setting. Some, um, some questions and concerns by community members included that this is going to replace what our obligations are um, under to provide a free appropriate public education for our students with disabilities. Um, and I just want to again reiterate this, that, that this still, we are still obligated to provide all services and supports for our students with disabilities, including related services like occupational therapy, physical therapy, et cetera. There was also some feedback and confusion um, that was mentioned via the feedback form about uh, medical treatment versus prescription medication. And um, this does not change any of our current policies, JLCD, which is administering med medication to students in the school setting. So this is not a replacement of those policies. Those policies also still do exist. Um, and then there was feedback about parent and guardian involvement and notification if medically necessary treatment is to be provided in the school setting. And parents are absolutely a part of the decision-making process and will very likely be the ones that would initiate this type of consideration by a school-based team around the services needed for their child in the school setting. So absolutely parents would be fully involved in, in this process and likely would take the lead on it. Um, and then um, what we did uh, in terms of um, suggested revision with a second reading is we, um, we brought in the team-based decision-making process for a student beyond just solely an IEP team or a 504 team because there may be a circumstance where a, a parent um, wants to um, initiate a consideration for medically necessary treatment by their medical provider that doesn't have an IEP or a 504, and therefore we broadened the team to 
to include IEP and 504, but not solely um, those two teams specifically as were in the original first reading of the policy. One of the things that a lot of um, feedback came about and questions were really on the operational aspect of how we actually apply the policy. And so it is staff's intention to um, compose a regulation, a superintendent regulation um, to this policy. Um, CASB has drafted a sample res regulation for this policy, so we will use that as a basis. Um, but the regulation will provide more specific information around who the members are of the decision-making team, um, also around the procedures required for private providers in the school setting, including background checks, um, fingerprinting, assumptions of risk, confidentiality agreements, and so forth. Also, the regulation would speak more specifically around the appeal process and define what a reasonable time period for appeal would be, because it's just generalized in the policy, as well as who the decision maker is in, in the appeal process. So a regulation will have more of that detail. Um, and then um, we will be required to, um, to develop a system to track um, the request for this medically necessary treatment in the school setting, and then we will be obligated to provide that data um, to CDE on an annual basis. And so that information, and it will be presented publicly by July 2025. Thank That's you. the overview. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Hyatt. I, you actually cleaned out almost all of my questions, so uh, I appreciate that. I'll now open it up to the other board members for questions, comments on the proposed changes to JLCDC. And, and I'll start off just with a quick comment. Uh, the changes from the first reading, I really do like the expansion of the team beyond just IEP and 504 and, and giving that that extra. And uh, you already beat me to it. I thought we would need a more granular how, but seeing as that's coming in a dash R policy, um, I, don't, I don't have any of those questions since that's forthcoming. Other directors? Director Ray. When I was reading the feedback to um, Superintendent Hyatt, I, um, I think some of the concern too was the actual ABA therapy in terms of whether it's a safe practice or not, that there's some controversy out there. I know it, the law certainly says it's recognized as an appropriate intervention. I see in the policy that there is a kind of a, a liability clause that says that we are not liable for any of the cost, but who is liable should something happen when an outside private therapist is in our building providing therapy and the student, something happens to the student during that time? What is your, and I know that's kind of legal counsel, so I, I see you looking at Ms. Clemish, and I, I apologize, but who is liable for that yeah. kind of circumstance? Thank you for that question, um, Director Ray, and I apologize. I'm loose, I've lost my voice today. Oh, yeah. But in any event, I think the question you're asking really requires some legal analysis, and it really would ask for us to provide you with a response to a legal question, which would be inappropriate to do in an open meeting. So we're happy to respond to that. But I do want to remind the board that we have insurance that handles a variety of circumstances in our schools. And those are the kinds of things that will be addressed consistent with our regulatory procedures um, with respect to looking at the question of allowing a private provider to come in. And I'd also ask the board to remember with respect to this policy that there are sometimes providers who are outside providers who come into our schools to provide services, but that is to provide services pursuant to a student's IEP. And you know, nothing really changes with respect to the district's obligations regarding those providers with, res with respect to assumption of risk of their services. I would distinguish those from these kinds of providers. And I think that's about as much as we can say in an open meeting in response to that. So please ask your questions, and we'd be happy to respond to them so let me ask in the question future. Just a little bit differently. You, you vetted this policy, is that correct? Ms. Clemish, or someone in your legal department yes. has? Yes. Uh, both Wendy Jacobs and I were part of the team 
of folks who reviewed this policy, and we will also be part of the team of professionals, school professionals, who will put together the regulations to implement the policy. And you're satisfied with the language that there needs no revisions to uh, protect from legal vulnerability? You're, you're satisfied with the language? We are satisfied with the language in this Great. policy. That's all I needed. Thank you. Other directors? Okay, seeing no further discussion, the recommendation is that the Board of Education uh, adopt the proposed new policy, JLCDC, medically necessary treatment in a school setting as submitted. Do I have a motion? So moved. Motion by Williams. Second. Second by Myers. I will now take the roll. Director Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson, aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. Aye. Passed six to zero. And we will now take up item number 31, proposed revisions to policy KBB, parent and family, family engagement, third reading as modified during the acceptance of the agenda. The recommendation is to the Board of Education vote on whether to adopt proposed revisions to board file KBB, parent and family engagement. I will now open it up uh, for comment and discussion. And Director Weiniger. Um. Just to recap what we were discussing about this policy, well not recap, but comment on what we were discussing about this earlier in the meeting. Um, while I respect the DAC's um, requests for more time, um, I personally feel like there has been enough time for them to know this has been a board item and we have, we're gonna vote on it. We actually delayed it last time for their um, comments and recommendations, and they haven't provided that. And so where I stand is they've known, I get that they need more time. Um, I'm, what Director Williams said, where they can spend next year going over it and giving more recommendations of changes, I think that's a great idea. So where I stand is, I think this is a good policy. Um, I wish the DAC, if they wanted to have changes, they would have put those forth. Even if they did feel rushed, they knew that was our deadline, and um, that's just where I stand right now. Thank you, Director Weiniger. And one of the things that I did see from the DAC, and I believe it was supplied to both Director Myers and um, Director Meek, was there was a proposed revision uh, that someone was socializing at DAC that broke out, uh, I think I saw eight to 10 bullets underneath each one of the national standards for family school partnerships. And I actually thought it was uh, very well written. It would break out things like under the community, um, you know, collaborating with the community, it would talk about uh, partnering with law, local law enforcement for safe schools. Uh, under the first one, welcoming all families in the school community, it talked about uh, having our ELL students and their families uh, 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 communicated with, with culturally and ling linguistically appropriate languages. It had a lot of really good stuff in it. And I looked at that, and uh, just like we talked about in the last policy, where there was a dash R needed for a granular interpretation, uh, I think that there was a lot of good work, whoever put that together for the DAC, but I also think that it probably oversteps the level of guidance that we should look for in a board. I think it would be outstanding recommendations if the DAC would like to take it forward to the superintendent for a dash R regulation version, because I saw almost all of those as being either interpretations or some type of metric or KPI or measurement. It really bordered into the how. Um, so while I was aware of those, thank you, Director Myers, for, for forwarding that uh, as part of the input. I just, as, as one director, thought that it was an overstep into the, from the board into the superintendent's lane. But I would personally, whatever's done with this tonight, um, like the last policy, I would encourage the superintendent and her staff to look at a dash R interpretation of this. Now, uh, I will say we have a KBB-R. It is very specific. It is around Title I and things like that. So if we go forward, one of the proposals right on the first line is to rename this KB. And so it would be a KB-R as to not conflict with the current KBB-R, which is already um, a policy that we approve and maintain. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll reserve further comments uh, after Director Meek. 
Sure, again, I just, I regret that I was out of town on business last Thursday and unable to attend, so I'll do my best to advocate for the committee that we select to give us feedback specifically on this area, and we have the law asking us to do that as well. And to see the level of emotion that we saw in here tonight from those individuals that serve on that committee, they are parents who are asking to create a bipartisan committee. There are various viewpoints that make up the DAC. And what I heard is they felt like they had assurances that they would get more time. And they feel betrayed from what I heard in that they were assured that they would have more time. I think had they known they wouldn't have more time, they may have stayed and worked on something to actually deliver to us. I think, I know I say this a lot, actions have consequences. And when we move forward, taking action on something like this, I, I just think there are consequences and I think we are sending a really bad message to to our committee members that, that dedicate, I mean, they show up <laughs> every month just like us, they're not paid, but they are showing up, they are doing the work and they're coming to it believing that they can listen to the board liaisons when they speak to them. And so I, I get, I'm hearing this isn't political. It felt really political when you listen to the, the public comments. You know, we elected you to, to put this in there and it felt very political. And so I, I don't wanna spend an hour here tonight arguing this. Um, if you're committed to passing something tonight, I'm ready to move on and, and look at tweaks. I just want to reiterate, I think it's a mistake to pass it tonight. Thank you, Director Meek. Other direct, <clears throat> excuse me, other director comments, questions? Director Williams. Well, I, I mean, I just want to go ahead and put a motion on the table so that we can start wordsmithing if that's what everyone wants to start doing. So I motion to approve uh, the way it was proposed. Okay, we have. We have a motion by, uh, sorry, Director Williams to approve the resolution as submitted. Is there a second? Second. Second by Director Weiniger. Um, discussion and then any subsequent motion, motions on there, and I, I'm sure we'll have some. Uh, Director Ray. So my first question is which policy are we referring to? Because the policy that has been handed out is very different than the policy that we heard public comment uh, responding to. The whole section of this original policy, Director Peterson, that you submitted had this whole section around parent rights and expectations about parents having the right to raise their children as they see fit. That's not in this policy. That's, that section is not there. Um, yeah, and I can quickly address that. Um, one of the feedback, uh, some of the feedback that I received was, it did not flow well and that it would make sense to consolidate those bulleted points into actual, uh, take them out of bullets and just summarize them in sentence form. And they have simply moved. Director, I think you'll see the entire content and substance is there, but it is simply being consolidated into a new second paragraph. And that was based on input that I received. Okay. And, and just, if, if I may, just to talk to the, the differences. So um, what we are looking at here tonight, the red, and thank you, Mr. Blair, for having on there. Blue, uh, as we've done with some other policies before on the screen, that is any additions from the original current KBB, not a first reading or second reading, but that is additions compared to the existing policy. And then, Mr. Blair, if you can just go down so we can see some examples. Um, reds are uh, a little bit farther, but red, reds are strikeouts. So um, one of the things I'd like to discuss in a second, I'll go back to you, Director Ray, is everything under the national standards for family school partnerships uh, attached to this item was 
that uh, document, the most recent document that the national PTA produced. And these suggested uh, deletions with replacements under all six bullets are simply word for word verbatim from the updated, the latest 2021 standard. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you just to discuss what was retained and what was moved. Well, and, and I appreciate that, but I still don't see the statement we heard over t tonight that said, um, I, will, I can parent, to, or parent as I see fit. I mean, I see language changing to accordance with their own personal beliefs and convictions, but that's not what we heard public commenters referencing when they were quoting the policy. So um, my concern is that um, they're, they may not have the most updated version of the policy, and here we're pushing through revisions that our community may not. I know it's been posted on our agenda, so I'm not questioning that, but I'm just stating again, going back to earlier conversation, how um, discombobulated this process has been. I also believe that it is in violation of my motion that was passed at our last meeting for us to continue on without having DAC input because the motion, you made a friendly amendment, uh, Director Peterson, that said pending DAC input. That's in the minutes. That was the motion that was approved. And for us to continue to have this conversation and a vote, to me, is in, vi is in direct violation of that motion. Um, and again, uh, breaking policy when we have a motion that was approved, DAC input was pending, um, and DAC has not given their input. They have shared with us revisions, things that other members have done. I appreciate your accolades of some of the things you saw, but that was not an official um, input from the DAC. That was just a lot of individuals messing with the words and trying to, to do some work on it before the DAC meeting actually happened. So my pleading with you, because this board needs to govern lawfully, this board needs to govern according to policy, you have a motion that says pending DAC input. That was approved six to zero. And we need to hold that motion as being the one that we operate from. So that would be my initial pleading with you because I just think, again, we're making a big mistake by moving forward. Director Meek certainly captured, uh, we certainly heard the emotion from our DAC members, the very people that are volunteering. And for us to make that disconnect with them, to me, is just <laughs> absolutely counter to what this policy intends to do. So those are my opening remarks. Okay, thank you, Director A. Other director comments? Uh, director Williams, then Director Myers. Just to respond, Director A, I actually do recall people saying personal beliefs and convictions during um, public comment. At least uh, two people that I recall that actually used those specific words. I heard two that said, as they see fit. So I don't know. We can, we can play yeah. back the tape. But my point is, I don't think there's clarity. And I think we're violating a motion that we approved at our last meeting. Director Myers, then Director Meek. Well, I, I did state some things earlier, and I do apologize if there was a miscommunication because I spent so much time on this and really was involved in the DAC meeting as of last Thursday and read through. I, I'm almost embarrassed that that's the only thing I spent my weekend on was the DAC. I purposely made a point of going through all the DAC recommendations we talked about, and I explicitly please asked for some kind of a timeline so we would not keep drawing this out. So I did never, I never heard an August date, but I knew that it was going to be going forward, that they were going to get a subcommittee, they were going to get together, but I just needed to hear that this was something that was not going to go on and on. Now, I and I think I said I met with Chester Friday morning. We explicitly talked about language. We talked about uh, going forward. And at the end of the day on Friday, I did share with all of the DAC, I shared all the information on the newly posted agenda. So they saw it. I And like I said, I read through the DAC. 
suggestions. I and with the last time with me approving the to go forward with them and their DAC suggestions and their um, SAC feedback, there was. I believe every opportunity to come forward with something, but because of the language in this now KBB policy, I I was felt that it was okay, and I felt like it was just a definite green light for this committee to for DAC to go ahead and get that committee while we needed to get this KBB and policy in place because it updated the national standards. And there was several wordings in here that were explicitly what was brought forth with DAC and SAC. And at the I realized there were emotions. But what I'm concerned about most of all is that, that I feel there was a coordinated attack to humiliate and intimidate a school board member. And that's not okay. And so I uh, was very disappointed with knowing that I reached out specifically, made sure I communicated, I read every DAC email, responded, and so I, I just feel this KBB policy, this KB policy needs to go forward. And Director Meek. Sure. I was just going to ask you, Director Myers. It felt like the DAC members had an assurance that it wasn't moving forward, but it's sounding like you're saying right now that you communicated to the DAC members once the new policy was posted and indicated that you would be supporting moving forward with the new policy. I'm just trying to understand because I don't think I've seen any of those communications. Well, with the Thursday night meeting with DAC, I, I did say I would I would move forward. I would support a resolution by the DAC to extend. But I asked them, I, and that was where I really was adamant. I just felt I needed to hear an end date because we I think we could get into the process of where where we go over and over and over, and then we keep using the narrative. You didn't give us enough time. You're pushing policy too fast. And so then nothing gets completed. Yet the whole year, I have heard through one ear that we need to work on policy. And so if that's a major piece of what DAC wanted to do, they could have come forward with reading through this and let us know some changes. So as of Friday, when I sent out the newly revised, I just made it clear, especially to Chester, and I know that I saw him vehemently shake his head the whole time, and I wondered over and over where was the communication breakdown, because we had that. We spent over two hours Friday morning together. So I am concerned about where the breakdown was. Yeah, I think there definitely has been a breakdown because it felt to me our DAC members were saying you assured us that you would advocate to give us the more time that we passed this motion. And I'm hearing now, though, you communicated with them through an email later. And I guess I wasn't on that email because I'm not sure I saw anything. So I'm just trying to figure out the communication issue because we're going to have to repair this. No, you know, no matter what, we're going to have to figure out how to rectify this. And what I heard tonight was our DAC members felt like they were told Thursday night that they would get more time to give us recommendations. And Director Ray is reminding us that we passed a resolution saying that we would allow DAC to give us those recommendations. So I think we just find ourselves in a very tricky situation. Yeah, I think we certainly allowed time. Uh, KBB or KB parent engagement was something that I've announced publicly from the dais multiple times we were going to work on. As Director Ray rightly noted, this is a third reading. If you look at the DAC meetings 
from May 11th. KBB was certainly discussed at that meeting uh, with input there. I reviewed, uh, I uh, talked to Director Myers uh, Friday morning to get a summary of the meeting that happened. And uh, I was also provided by staff with all the Jamboard results um, of concerns and issues that they have. That actually triggered a, uh, an additional change and insertion before things were posted on uh, Friday evening to be attached to this agenda S explicitly. And Mr. Uh, Blair, if you can just go down a little bit to the bottom of the first page. Um, the addition that says uh, the district will conduct uh, and the district will conduct a periodic review uh, and it should say DAC, but the district will conduct a periodic review of this policy at least biennially, biennially or whenever national standards for family school partnerships are updated. And it's this exact issue of we had standards in the previous policy that are from 2018. The standards changed in 2021 something that the DAC did not bring to the board, something that the board, uh, I was made aware of by a community member that says, hey, those things have been updated. Uh, so I thought it was worth uh, enshrining in the policy itself uh, that the DAC will look at this at least every two years. And if, frankly, if we're gonna maintain, although some public speakers tonight said that we should actually abandon uh, the national standards for family school partnerships, uh, we can certainly debate that. Uh, but as long as they're still in this policy, I think we absolutely have an obligation as a board to react and update if we're going to link to those and we know that they've been updated for over a year. Um, but that specific uh, every two year periodic review and a hawking of the standards to which this policy references was explicitly added as part of the feedback that I received on Friday from the Thursday meeting. Director Ray. So I will say that part of the communication breakdown is, is Thursday night because I did read to the DAC the motion that um, was causing them to take this task on. And so I think the assurances were based on the motion that I read to them, which not only says DAC, pending DAC input, but ample time. For, for feedback from staff and community. And so I don't know what happened on Friday. Um, and I respect Director Meyer's uh, testimony that evidently there was a change of flavor um, based on her conversation with Mr. Shaw. Um, but I will say Thursday, it was very clear to me that uh, two things were going to happen. One is the two of us were going to advocate for the DAC on behalf of the motion that they approved and that the second was that they felt like they were assured that they did have more time um, because of the way the motion read. Um, I am sympathetic with what Director Meyer's concern is that you keep kicking the can down the road, but I think we the, we're the ones that direct our committees. So we're the ones that say, by such and such date, we need to have your input. We need to have your recommendations. That's us. Um, we shouldn't ask, we shouldn't leave that up to the DAC to decide. Um, they're there to help us. They're, help, they're, they're, they're there to help us do our work. Um, and so just, just to kind of clarify that, I think that's where the breakdown of communication must have happened is between whatever happened Thursday night and whatever happened Friday. Um, but I still think we have a group, and we saw four of them that get up and make testimony that they're frustrated that they're frustrated that uh, this board is not listening to their request. And I think we need to adhere to that and we need to adhere to the motion that was passed. Director Williams. So just to respond to that, I think whether we like it or not, the, the DAC did provide feedback. It might not have come in the way that we wanted. They said we want more time. And that was certainly not my intention um, with that resolution. What I suggested earlier was to put it onto their um, next year's agenda to then come back again. And I think that that, um, that that certainly gives them an entire year instead of one month to do that. And I think we as a board can, can do that. Number two, um, while I appreciate you saying that you'll have more time, 
we can't promise as one member or two members to any committee that there give them assurances that that's going to happen because it takes the entire board to approve those things. And then lastly, when it comes to community feedback, I, we did do a community feedback. We did receive that from the community. So we have given ample time to our community to give us feedback. And that includes the members on the deck. And to echo Director Williams' comments, we did get a significant amount of community feedback, not just on policy ADB, but on a large series of policies, many of which were approved at a previous meeting. And um, I think that the, represent the changes in here are representative of feedback, not just from um, what I heard through the formal survey and the outreach, but these are things that I have been hearing um, since uh, even be prior to being sworn in. One of the reasons that I personally decided to run for position on the board as we heard from many interviewees that sat in front of us tonight was what I perceived to be the, dis the uh, silencing of parent voice and a disruption in what was the traditional role of the parent, especially in deciding educational and health outcomes. We heard some uh, interviewees speak to it uh, prior to tonight. So I think that this update here not only reflects some recent input from the DAC, certainly it reflects a lot of input from the community, but this reflects um, my entire culmination of a year and a half of being on the board. And one of the reasons that I stated that I was uh, seeking this office and seeking to elect, which was simply to reset and restore the voice and the role of parents and make it clear. And I would like to be very clear because there's been a lot of accusations or, or perceptions, and I, you know, I, everyone's entitled to their perceptions, that this is somehow a very political policy. I don't see certainly any of the um, national standards as being political. They're coming from our uh, national PTA, uh, although there's been uh, accusations by some public commenters tonight that they are political or that they're charged. I would say the one paragraph insertion that I put into the policy is not for conservative parents, it is not for liberal parents, it is not for libertarian parents in the middle, it is independent of your identity, it is just simply to recommit as a district, as a board, to parents that we understand that their role is different than that of the system, different than that of the educators, but is stated uh, explicitly in the policy ADB which was passed by this board. We believe as a board in the partnership the mutually respectful partnership of parents and educators and staff for the benefit of the student. And we, speaking of trust, because it's often brought up by Director Meek, I believe the district, the board, broke a lot of trust with parents during the COVID uh, issues where we were supposedly following data, which has been proven in retrospect. Now I'm not gonna 2020 it, but we weren't following good data. We weren't following, quote, good science. And we made some pretty bad, in my opinion, recommendations around restricting, uh, we talked a lot about FAPE here tonight, a free and appropriate education. Well, we put kids in the rooms, we put them on distance learning, and that was not what many parents wanted. So re to restore trust, to restore and reset that proper relationship with parents in the district, it is important in my mind to recognize that parents have a unique role and I cannot say it any better than the very first sentence of the second paragraph which is simply the board recognizes the fundamental right of parents and guardians to raise their children in accordance with their own personal beliefs and convictions. Uh, I'm not going to do the, the straw poll thing and say how many people disagree with that but I would be amazed if anybody on this board disagreed with that fundamental right that has been enshrined and upheld by the Supreme Court as being uh, fundamental to a parent's rights, even under the US Constitution at the US Supreme Court. So I would just hope that we would focus not on process, not on obligations or potential promises that were made on the part of one board liaison and frankly, one board director who was just for some reason, stepping in for another liaison not approved by this board, but I would focus on the content and the substance of these changes because, and I will shut up after this, um, they are for all parents, just like policy ADB is for all students and all staff, not some parents and not others. Other directors' comments, questions? Audience, other directors. Oh. Uh, 
Director uh, Weiniger, then Director Meek. Sorry, this is just a grammar cr um, correction, and it's so small that I, let me know if it's um, good to correct it. But on the last sentence of the second paragraph, um, procedures to opt into of the use of selected resources. Thank you. Get rid of of. Yeah. Um, do I need a motion to? I'm um, sorry, my mic was off. We okay. we can we'll entertain that as a as a um, a friendly um, motion to modify due to poor grammar. Thank you, uh, Director Meek. So I think I brought this up last time. The comma at the end of the first sentence or first paragraph should be a period. Thank you. And I guess since we are going to move forward even though it's against a motion that we all approved and against the committee that represents our parent voices. Um, on the first sentence in the second paragraph, I move that we strike everything after, let's see, I will read it, how it should read and then what to strike. So the board recognizes the fundamental right of parents and guardians to raise their children in accordance with their own personal beliefs and convictions, to include ensuring students will not be compelled to share personal information or make statements about themselves, period. I would strike the rest of that sentence. We have a, is that a formal motion? Yes. Okay, we have a motion by Director Meek to amend as stated to basically place a period after the word themselves in the first sentence of the second paragraph and to strike the rest of the sentence. Do we have a second? I'll second uh, to understand Director Meek's rationale. Okay, motion, uh, second motion is by Meek and a second by Ray. Discussion by board members. Sure, I just don't understand what, I think the language is problematic, where it says, or regarding others that conflict with their deeply held personal beliefs or circumstances. I, I would need someone to explain to me why that language is in there and what it would do. Yeah, the intent of uh, adding that entire sentence as originally presented, was to um, recognize that we will not, first of all, obviously around compelled speech, that we will not compel speech that may conflict with not just students' deeply held beliefs, the inferences is those beliefs may reflect those of the parents or the family. And that the, uh, it is not the district's job or individual staff member's job to try to countermand beliefs that may be of the family or certainly of the students uh, themselves that are deeply held, uh, you know, as it says there, that are, that are uh, excuse me, that are uh, deeply held personal beliefs or to share information around their circumstances. Sometimes we may request information from a student or ask them to volunteer things which may frankly be uh, embarrassing, make them feel othered if they are requested. Yeah, that's, or that's not what was struck though. It's or well, that's, regarding that's the circumstances. others, that's right? the, No, that's the end part I'm addressing, the deeply held beliefs or circumstances. And I'm talking about compelling someone to answer about their particular circumstance, whether it is um, a financial poverty issue, whether it's about a, a heritage, whether it is about uh, a health issue, um, that if they have a particular circumstance that they do not wish to speak on, that we should not compel them to do so. So that's, that's addressing the circumstances part if I answered your question. But I think you don't need it. I mean, it just says they should not be compelled to share personal information or make statements about themselves, period. And, and I could, and I as one director could uh, live with that as long as the period were moved three words later or regarding others because I don't believe we need to compel speech not just around um, beliefs about themselves or their circumstances, as I indicated, but also to compel speech 
of students around others. Um, I can give you an example. If there's a religious uh, statement, I do not, uh, and this is whether you're a Christian, Muslim, atheist, Jew, you pick the religion. Um, if there is a statement made uh, in the context of an educational discussion um, around God, I do not want a person of one religion having to make a statement about someone else's religion or even being required to comment on it as one example. Director Myers. I just personally would like to keep that conflict with, that conflict with their deeply held personal beliefs or circumstances. I would like to keep that. Other directors comments discussion on the proposed motion. Could someone just give me an example of what it is we're trying to achieve with this? I'll give you my example and then others could comment or discuss as appropriate. Um, I am a big believer and I've stated it multiple times from this dais in First Amendment rights and freedom of speech. I am also a big, uh, I do not believe in compelled speech. I think compelled speech, especially in the larger context of honoring family values and honoring individual beliefs uh, is something that we should never encourage uh, because it is, again, counter to family values. And uh, I think it is coercive if we have compelled speech uh, of any kind in the district and especially for our students. Director Williams. Did you want an answer from everyone, Director Meek? I mean, I, I think ultimately it's, it's putting the parents at the center, and I feel much to what President Peterson was saying earlier, a lot of parents weren't feeling like they were in charge of, of, their, um, of their children and, and, and what was happening, and whether that's true or not is not the point, it's the perception. And what we need to do as a board is ensure that we are giving parents that right to raise their own children. And if there's no more discussion, we can vote on the motion on the floor, the subsequent motion, which is to strike everything, uh, put a period and strike everything after the words themselves in the first, uh, first sentence of the second paragraph. So let right, me go just, ahead, Director. Yeah, Mead. let me just ask, so, for example, say there is a student that is a trans student, and they, at the beginning of the school years, I go by pronouns he and him. And if other students have deeply held personal beliefs against that, are those other students and teacher able to purposefully say she? when a student has said, my pronouns are he and him. I would interpret that in this case, that those students would not be compelled to use the word him, I believe if I get your, um, your scenario correctly, but they would still be required to treat that student with respect. If you were coming to me and you said tonight, uh, Director Peterson, um, I, Susan Meek, I'm now going by the pronouns he and him. I would like to be called that, and I had a deeply held personal belief against um, identity or something like that. Um, would I just constantly say she as one director? No, I wouldn't, but I would probably just call you Director Meek uh, or use some other polite and respectful form of address. So that's very helpful talking through this because I think that is extremely important because if other students refuse to use the pronoun or, or intentionally use and misgender, that is a form of harassment, which we would then be opening ourselves up to litigation. And not only is it wrong, but we would be opening ourselves up to litigation. And so I think when we put language in here like this, we need to think deeply about how we have respectful classrooms so everyone is respected. No one is above anyone else. We are looking to respect every single student and, and teacher. And we have heard over and over from our community that we are struggling with homophobic slurs in the classroom. 
and racial slurs and other forms of bullying. And so I would ask us to think deeply about the language that we're using so that we are respecting and honoring all of the students in our classrooms. And I agree that, and just to be clear for anybody that's listening, bullying, harassment, intimidation, coercion, all of those things, I think we've said, especially over the last few months in light of some of our public speakers, is completely unacceptable. But we need to empower and trust our staff, our, our building leaders, our classroom leaders, uh, our district leadership team, principals on down, to navigate the complexities. While uh, some of those things, and certainly bullying, um, even if it's verbal, uh, cyberbullying is can definitely be cruel. I also believe that compelled speech can be very cruel to force people to say things that are against their deeply held beliefs. And I also believe we need to protect um, students from, frankly, bullying that could come in the form of compelled speech as well. I'll be very clear once again, all bullying and harassment is not to be tolerated in Douglas County. And I think we have a lot of policies and rules. And I think the superintendent has certainly set an expectation um, from the cabinet all the way down to our individual classroom leaders and staff that that is not acceptable and something we need to continue to promote. Other directors, uh, Director Ray. So it's a couple of things. I, I think we need to be, remember this is a parent engagement policy. It's not a uh, student behavior expectations policy and it feels like we're adding words in that direction um, that to me is more appropriate if we want to talk about what we expect of our students in terms of their behavior. Um, I, I also am concerned if we start putting language that encourages people to say, well, my student has a right to call you whatever you want, whatever he wants based on his convictions, that's different to me. I mean, I, I understand the compelled speech concern, but then there's also just basic respect. Um, you know, and if I ask you that I want to be referred to as whatever, it's just basic respect for you to refer to me as that. Regar I mean, it doesn't have to be pronouns. If I say I want you to call me Dave instead of director, you know, I mean, out of just sheer respect, that's what we do as, as humans. And I feel like what we're doing with this policy, again, is trying to make a statement uh, that doesn't belong and certainly doesn't belong in a parent engagement statement, but again, tries to address a conviction, I think, that you have, Director Peterson, and feeling like that there have been occasions where students have been asked to refer to someone that is against their conviction or their religion or, or whatnot. I don't think it belongs here. If you want to, if you want to get on a, you know, have convictions about that, let's talk about the student uh, discipline policy or the student behavior policy. But I don't see the the rationale for inserting it into a family engagement. And I, as Director Meek stated, I feel like the statement covers what you're concerned about when it says that regarding, or it, it says. Um, Ensuring students will not be compelled to share personal information or, or make statements about themselves. I think that covers it. I, I, I don't think there's any, and you said you always talk about our teachers in a positive light, but I can't imagine any of our teachers compelling our students to say, you need to call this person that, or you're in trouble. Um, so so you're, it seems like there's two different messages. I trust staff to do the right thing, but I don't trust them enough, so I'm going to put something in policy. Um, to the, so anyway, that's, that, I guess that's the confusion. The engagement policy, I don't see why we have words in there about that. And, and two, I think it's the statement, as Director Meek suggested, says what you needed to have said. Yeah, again, I, I think we need to uh, not restrict it to just about themselves because that opens up compelled speech about others. And the reason that it's included in a parent engagement policy is it links back to family values and that we generally see, um, whether you agree, whether you disagree, uh, miraculously students kind of, many of them, some of them certainly not, and I can give personal examples from my family, um, but many of the students follow um, and link or associate closely with parents' beliefs. 
And so this is to ensure parents that when your child goes off to spend a majority of the day, over the waking hours, in a school district, again, it's trust building. It's that your child will not be asked to uh, make statements about themselves and others that may conflict with what the parents are expecting is happening in, in, in the district. Again, we heard a lot of people talking about the fundamentals reading, literacy, uh, mathematics, and the basics of education. And this statement, I believe, if we were to pass it as a board, will assuage parents' concerns that there are other um, items or agendas being pursued that are not purely academic in nature that may occur in the schools. Of course, I trust our, our staff and our students, but this is about um, assuaging concerns about what may happen. And I think, again, because trust was previously broken and needs to be repaired, my opinion, with many of our parents, that this is appropriate to um, make absolutely sure that there will not be a, a transgression against uh, beliefs that parents may share as well as the students. Any other director comments? We do have a specific motion on the table so we can move forward. Okay, we have a motion from Director Meek as stated and seconded by Director Ray. Um, the motion again was to add a period after the word themselves, first sentence, second paragraph, and strike the rest of the sentence. Um, an I vote will strike uh, the rest of the sentence. A no vote will maintain uh, the sentence intact as is. Director Meek. Aye. Director Myers. No. Director Peterson, no. Director Ray. Aye. Ray is an aye. Director Williams. No. Director Weiniger. No. Motion is defeated two to four. Are there other issues or motions? I guess we should just go to the next sentence because we're really talking about three sentences in a paragraph. The next sentence, thank you, Mr. Blair, is to build trust with families and maintain their ability to make appropriate decisions regarding their children. The board supports open communication and disclosure of information concerning their students, or excuse me, their children's health, identity, and education to include parent access to educational materials when requested. Are there concerns or issues with the second sentence, second paragraph? Director Meek. Right. I'm not sure why the word identity was added back after we all agreed to take it out last time when we went through the board discussion. Yeah, I, I don't think there was agreement to take it out. I do remember your question and objection, and then I believe there was a motion to uh, postpone you, you to this You agreed meeting. to take it out. You okay. said, fine, we'll take it out. Yeah. I think was exactly what was said. So I'm just curious why it's added back in. Yeah, the reason it's added back in is, again, back to an issue of trust. Um, relative to identity, we had uh, professional development that was recorded and circulated wide in this district by a former employee that was asked by other counselors during a professional development session, what should I do, back to your scenario, what should I do if I have a student that is identifying or expressing in a way um, that is not consistent with what they believe the parents to believe that identity to be? And the answer from that individual was, well, you code switch. And when someone said, well, what is code switching? The answer was basically to lie to parents, to tell them to use different words, to use different pronouns, to use different names when referring to the student, where the district, the system, the individuals knew that that was not that person's identity. And we cannot have any policy or any guidance in this district that encourages deception, whether it's lies of omission or whether it is actual lies between the district, the system, and the parents. We are the service provider, they are the customer, them and their students, and we cannot have that because that will shatter and break trust. So that's why I included that word in the original uh, drafting of revision of this policy. Relative to health, that's in there for obvious reasons, especially in the wake of COVID and things that were done. And the last one, obvious one, is education because we expect parents to be, uh, again, respectful partners and support um, programs that are being put out in school and support their child's education. To make good decisions, they need to have 
accurate and complete information on all three of those areas. Other directors' comments, concerns with the second, par uh, second sentence in the second paragraph as written. Director Myers. I absolutely have no problem with the statement. Other directors. Okay, and that brings us to the third and final uh, addition uh, in the second paragraph, that, which is the district will honor, honor parental decisions to stop their children from selected instructional materials or activities per current policy. I want to be very clear, you can't opt your child out of 12th grade. There are certain policies, um, we have them well established by the district. Some of those were the ones that we previously voted on. There are processes for um, uh, protesting a resource. There are processes to opt your child out of selected curriculum and request a replacement. Uh, so that's why it says current district policy. One of the additions here is the procedures to opt into the use of selected resources and activities will be developed by the superintendent. We have plenty of micro level policies. We're gonna show a movie, you need a permission slip from a parent. We're gonna go on a trip, you need to affirmatively opt into that. But if there are addition, additional policies that uh, the superintendent and her staff believe rise to the higher level of actually affirmatively opting into, we would delegate those to the superintendent. And I would expect to see those either in separate board policy or in a KB-R. So that is the intent of that. This is not a new right, this is just to reaffirm the existing opt-out rights that are already in several other district policies. Again, to honor parent decisions around their child's education. Questions, comments on the third sentence in that paragraph. Okay, seeing none, I will cover two more additions because the rest are purely an adoption of the updated standards national standards for family school partnerships. There was, based on a recommendation of a community member, an explicit, this is the center, if you can go down, Mr. Blair, to the third paragraph. This is the line in blue in the center of that paragraph. There was an addition to, we explicitly invite families to contribute to the school community through volunteer opportunities. Again, not only were students uh, kept out of schools during shutdowns due to COVID, um, frankly, we, we kicked all our parents out as well. And as I was touring schools during my year and a half on the board, one of the most remarkable things that I saw, and I think one of the greatest indicators, leading indicators of success of our students, was how many parents re-entered the classroom, how many were assisting with testing, how many were assisting, especially with our staffing issues as uh, teacher's aides. And I think we should explicitly encourage more of that, thus the addition. And then the last one I addressed earlier, which was a uh, explicit requirement for DAC to look at this policy and provide input at least every other year or when the, or when the uh, reference national standards change. Any comments on the invitation for volunteers and for parents uh, in the policy that was inserted or the requirement to have a DAC review of this policy at a minimum of every two years so we don't let it sit? Director Myers. I agree. I like both of them. Any other directors' comments? Any directors like to comment on any of the updated language on the six national standards um, for family school partnerships? Any director requirements on any of the other proposed changes or additions to the policy? We do have an original primary motion on the table having resolved secondary uh, subsequent motions. The original motion was made by Director Williams and seconded by Director Weiniger to approve policy KBB as submitted. I believe the only change that uh, we have agreement upon by the board was a period at the end of the first uh, paragraph and the striking of the word of in the last sentence in the second paragraph. Uh, Director Williams, you made the motion, uh, friendly amendment to uh, approve the policy with those two additions as noted. I accept those. Okay, and by Director Weiniger. 
Without further discussion, I will take the roll on the motion. Director Meek. So the timing on this is a problem with the end of the school year and pushing this through. When the DAC sent out a request for feedback from the SACs, they only received 10 individual feedbacks because everyone's checked out. Like all of these policy changes that we've done recently have occurred at the absolute worst time of the year. The process we've talked about has been flawed from the beginning with an individual board member taking on writing policy edits and then there's so many different versions out there because it changes outside of board meetings even though this is the third reading. Um, not adhering to our board motions that we've had in the past is a problem. Ignoring our official parent feedback committee, the DAC, is a problem. And for all of these reasons, I cannot vote or support this, so I'm a no. Meek, no. Myers? I've stated earlier why I support this policy, so it's a yes. Peterson, um, I do believe that we did receive feedback, as I stated, both from previous meeting minutes from the DAC and the materials that I was provided on Friday morning and feedback from the appointed liaison that was at the meeting. Uh, I believe for all the reasons I stated previously that this is long time in coming to reset um, one of the most valuable commodities in this district, which is trust between parents and the district and restore not only parent voice, but properly reset the roles and partnership between parents and the district. So I am a affirmative aye. Director Ray. Um, so similar to Director Meek, um, I can't support unlawful actions of this board. And I believe we're committing unlawful actions by not receiving formally input from our DAC. I also cannot tolerate violations of process. And I believe we're violating an approved motion. Um, ironically, there's many things in this policy, many revisions that I can support. Um, but it is about process. It is about how we gain the trust of the people that we put in place to carry out specific responsibilities. And it's ironic to me that you have severed the trust of a committee in order to reset trust of other people that you think are going to all of a sudden trust us more because of this policy. And we heard tonight the public commenters that were discussing I don't think they're pleased with the revisions. I don't think they're pleased with PTA being the driving force behind the standards. So I don't think, I honestly don't think you gained anything by pushing this forward. So um, for all those reasons, I'm a, I'm a definite no. Director Williams. As stated before, I think that we have been talking about this policy for over two months now. Um, so we have had community feedback through our policy process, sent out on to an email to anybody who wanted to respond. Um, we did we did postpone the initial um, the initial policy to to send it to the DAC. So I do feel like we 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 followed what we said we were going to do, and I believe that they can then make any revisions over the next year. So with all that said, I'm an aye. Director Weiniger. Aye. Policy is passed, four to zero. Uh, let us take a 10 minute break before we do item number 32, board selections of finalists for board of directors. Uh, we'll just round it up to 10.30. We will come back at 10.40.
Board of Education will come back into order. We are on item number 32, Board Selection of Finalists for Board of Education Vacancy Director District C. The board shall determine no more than three finalists to be considered to fill the vacant board position. The finalists shall be determined by the following process. The presiding officer of the meeting shall call for nominations to fill the vacancy from the pool of those applicants who participated in initial interviews at the special meeting earlier today. Multiple nominations and seconds may be made. Then nominations that receive a second shall be open for discussion by the board. So we will have uh, potentially multiple nominations sequentially. We will then stop and discuss all the potential, all the um, uh, nominees that received a second. Once that macro discussion is concluded, nominees to be finalists shall be voted on in the order of their nomination by a roll, roll call vote. Once a nominee receives the majority of the votes, that nominee shall be selected to be a finalist to be considered to fill the vacancy. And again, no more than three finalists shall be selected for a final interview. So that means we could have one finalist selected. We could have up to seven finalists because we had seven people um, selected in there that, for nominations. But the first three, if there are seven nominations for finalists, the first three that receive majority votes will be the finalists. So if there are seven, all seven interviewees are nominated and we vote and the first one receives a majority and the second one receives a majority and the third one does not and the fourth one receives a majority, we are done because we have reached a quota of three. Do any board members have any questions on the process that we will use or potential outcomes of how that will occur? Okay, with that, uh, being the presiding officer, are there any nominations to fill the vacancy for director, uh, for director District C? I nominate Brad Geiger. Uh, oh, sorry. Well, hold on. It's just uh, we got to assign the floor. Oh, uh, I will. Sorry. Let, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just tired. If, if, this were, if this were jeopardy, I'd give out buzzers. <laughs> okay, so we have a nomination from Director Ray for, excuse me, Brad Geiger uh, to be a finalist uh, for the vacancy. Uh, do we have a second? Second. So Ray, second by Weiniger. Do we have additional nominations uh, for finalist for the vacancy in District C? Uh, Director Myers, and then we'll go to Director uh, Weininger next. Director Myers. I nominate Jason Page for uh, board member Director C. Okay, we have a nomination from Director Myers for Jason Page. Is there a second? Second. Second is by Williams. Uh, director Weininger, I believe you were next. Do you have a nomination for a director, uh, for a finalist for a director? Director for District C. Um, I nominate Michael Burmeister. We have a motion by Director Weiniger for Mr. Burmeister. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Meek. Do we have any additional nominations for finalists? Uh, to be considered for the vacancy in Directorate C. Hearing none, we have in order, we have uh, Brad Geiger, uh, motion by Ray, seconded by Weiniger, Jason Page, motion by Myers, seconded by Williams, and we have Mr. Burmeister, Motion by Weiniger, seconded by Meek. We will now have discussion on all three uh, potential candidates by directors before going to a vote in that order. Um, obvious, I'll state the obvious here. We only have three uh, nominations for finalists. We could vote for all three. We could vote for one or two. We could vote for none, but that would probably be really bad. So uh, with that, I will open up uh, director discussions, uh, comments on any of the folks that they nominated, seconded, or otherwise. Director Williams. So first, I'd like to say to 
everyone who applied. I'm so incredibly thankful for you throwing your name into the hat to fill this board vacancy. I appreciate your passion and your willingness to serve. If you are not selected, I urge you to stay connected. Join a board committee, join your SAC, just please stay involved. Last meeting we discussed what attributes and preferences we have as a board to select a new board of education member. Some of the ones that were mentioned were not being divisive or political, being diverse, committing to the time commitment, having watched a meeting, preferably more, being involved in the district, having knowledge, having some tie to the district or skin in the game. I personally believe there are two candidates who fulfill most, if not all of those, and those are Mr. Geiger and Mr. Page. Thank you, Director Williams. Other director comments on any or all of the uh, nominees? Uh, director Weiniger. Uh, just ditto what um, Director Williams said around um, thanking all the applicants who applied. That was not an easy thing to do to come before us and interview. And um, thank you for putting in the effort and your interest in the school district. And like uh, Director Williams mentioned, there's so many other ways to volunteer and we would welcome any of those. Any other director's comments on the nominees? Uh, Director Myers. I personally wa was very impressed with the number of applicants that we did have come forward. I thought that was great. Thank you to the community, the people of District C. And um, I believe we've come down to some very good candidates. Um, Mr. Geiger, Mr. Page, definitely um, involved, no policy, no what's going on in the district. And so th those are the two I definitely would recommend. Any other directors? No, I was just going to say I would not be opposed to sending all three forward. Um, I don't know that uh, I, mean, I can certainly take the time to talk about the merits of each one of them, but I think they certainly, um, to me, um, impressed me with their um, focus on our district, their dedication, and their desire to, to serve as a board director. So I would. Uh, I would be glad to, to make a motion that all three be moved forward as finalists unless we want to continue to have this discussion yeah, and I, deliberation. I think just to follow the rules, we'll, because we have the resolution, we'll vote on them one at a time. Okay. Um, but uh, I do not disagree with you, and, and I'd like to echo the comments and the other directors. Um, I, I did not make a motion or a second. I would have made a motion or a second for multiple of these three gentlemen up here. Um, I think that they each bring some unique skills um, and perspectives to the board. I'd be happy to have any of the three nominees uh, from what I know at this point on the board, but uh, we're going to do another round of interviews with whoever goes forward and we'll make a selection one week from now. I'd like to speak to the other candidates that were not uh, nominated to be finalists. I think that each one of them had unique traits and attributes that they also would have offered, been on the board. And again, I thank everyone for putting their name in the hat. Uh, not intentional, but uh, those folks got to see yet another board meeting and what they're signing up for, at least through uh, a period through the end of November. Uh, and you've got to be a little kind of crazy uh, because uh, this board pays exactly zero and it's, it's a lot of time and effort. And, and I'm only saying that to honor the folks that, that applied tonight and were willing to make that commitment uh, to them, themselves, to the communities they represented it, and, and frankly, to make that commitment to the, the six directors that are up here. Uh, so again, I thank all the candidates. Uh, Director Meek, did you have anything or, or no? I think everyone's tired of hearing us talk. Thank you to everyone that applied. It is immensely appreciated. It's a large job and we look forward to working with one of you. So thank you. Okay, thank you. With that, if there are no other director comments, um, we will now, uh, let me go back to the official rules here. We will now um, go by the finalist in their order of nomination and a roll call vote. An I indicates that you uh, would like that individual to be one of our three maximum finalists and to appear in an interview next week for consideration as we will down select one. No means you are opposed to that individual. 
any individual that receives a majority of the votes goes on to be a finalist. So we will start with Mr. Geiger. I will call the roll on the uh, nomination of Mr. Brad Geiger for a finalist to fill the director vacancy for District C. Director Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weininger. Aye. Passed by a vote of six to zero. Congratulations, Mr. Geiger. Uh, now we will take a roll call vote for the nomination of Mr. Jason Page to be a finalist to fill the director vacancy for District C. Director Meek. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weininger. Aye. Passed six to zero. Congratulations, Mr. Page. Uh, we will now take uh, the roll call for nomination for Mr. Michael Burmeister to be a finalist to fill the director vacancy for uh, District C. Director Meek. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weininger. Aye. Passed six to zero. Congratulations to Mr. Burmeister. Um, for, uh, again, congratulations to our three named finalists. Just to be clear, finalists are asked to return for another round of interviews on Tuesday, June 27th at a special meeting, which will be scheduled to start at 5 p.m. I understand that one or more of our three finalists may not be able to be here physically in person. We will arrange a link for you to um, participate virtually in another round of interviews. Uh, expect a repeat, an opening statement, multiple questions. We will probably do at least two per director. We've got a little bit more time with three. It's the sole focus of our meeting. And then we will have a final statement, uh, uh, closing statements. That will be followed by public debate and selection of a single person to fill the vacancy by the six current members of the Board of Education that will be followed immediately by a swearing in ceremony. And if you're attending, uh, attending remotely, uh, we will have legal counsel and the board secretary get you some documents that you will have to sign. Uh, I do expect more than just the uh, selection of a candidate to potentially be on the agenda. Uh, for Tuesday, there may be an executive session, and if following swearing in and signing of documents, my intent would be to include whoever the newly selected board member is in that session and everything, obviously, going forward. Um, let's see. As allowed by Colorado Revised Statute, in the case of board vacancies, the president of the board will administer the oath of office. Uh, and remember, this will only go until we have an election in November certification of the results in November, and then we will determine a special meeting within the days allowable to seat the duly elected person, whoever he or she may be, for a director at C. Um, with that, do any board members have any additional statements or comments on the process for our three finalists going forward? Okay, thank you, finalists, and again, congratulations to all present and including Mr. Burmeister. We will now move on to item number 30. Uh, excuse me, we have a, uh, an amendment to the agenda. We now have an opportunity for director statements on the judge's order of 16 June 2023 uh, as the agenda was amended. And we will just go in uh, roll call order if uh, any directors would like to make a statement about the judge's order. I will start with Director Meek. Thank you, I appreciate putting this comment section on the agenda. I've been thinking about this quite a bit since the ruling came out and um, actually prepared a resolution that I was hoping we would have a chance to talk through and, and put on a future agenda. And so maybe I'll just read that as my statement. Um, so whereas the DCSD Board of Ed relies on its board governance policies to provide transparency and accountability to its public, and whereas the board policies state that the board will enforce upon itself whatever discipline is needed to govern with excellence, the board will allow no officer, individual, or committee of the board to hinder or excuse the fulfillment of its commitments. When there are suspected substantial violations of board policy, 
And if it involves both the president and vice president, the board will bring the violations to the entire board. So whereas on February 4th, 2022, Robert Marshall filed a complaint alleging that Douglas County School District Board of Ed Directors, Myers, Peterson, Williams, and Weiniger engaged in activity that violated the Colorado Open Meeting Laws by discussing and deciding to terminate the employment of former Superintendent Corey Wise outside of a public meeting of the Board of Ed. And whereas de declaratory relief was requested, barring board directors from violating the Colorado Open Meeting Law, and whereas on June 16th, 2023, the court granted declaratory judgment regarding four board directors past violations of the Colorado Open Meeting Law, and whereas a substantial violation has occurred in regard to governance process 1.1, the board will govern lawfully. As determined by the findings of fact, conclusions of law and orders under the case Robert Marshall versus Board of Ed. Michael Peterson, Rebecca Myers, Kaylee Weiniger, and Christy Williams dated June 16, 2023, as cited the Colorado Open Meeting Law, and he is entitled to a declaratory judgment to that effect. The court finds that the decision made at the February 4th, 2022 meeting was a rubber stamping of the discharge discussion and decision that constituted the Colorado Open Meeting Law violation by the individual defendants, and the violation therefore went uncured. Whereas a substantial violation has occurred in regard to Governance Process 1.3, Board President Responsibilities, which states that, quote, the president has no authority to supervise or direct the superintendent, end quote, and explicitly prohibits the president to take action concerning employment or termination of the superintendent. As evidenced by, this is a quote from the ruling, the evidence supports and the court finds that four members of the board discussed and collectively committed outside of a public meeting to terminate Wise's employment. On Friday, January 28, 2022, two of the majority board members, Peterson, the board president, and Williams, the vice president, met with Wise. Though disguised as a choice, Wise was not given an opportunity to continue his employment. The only options presented were options about how his job would end. Whereas it is the board's responsibility to uphold the highest standards of transparency fiduciary duty, and collective decision-making, all of which are essential for effective and ethical governance. And whereas disregarding and violating the Colorado Open Meeting Law undermines the principles of transparency, public engagement, and accountability that are the bedrock of an open and democratic governance process. And whereas the fiduciary duty entrusted to board members requires the highest standard of care, loyalty, and diligence in managing the affairs of our school district, and violations compromise the best interests of our students, staff, and community. Whereas legal fees, court costs, and other expenses related to defending the actions related to the Colorado Open Meeting Law violation are taken from the DS Douglas County School District operating budget and would otherwise be available to support other areas of the budget, the actions and decisions made by the individual board defendants have disregarded their financial stewardship responsibilities. Whereas such violations go against the values and expectations set by our community, and the ethical standards to which board members are bound, we recognize the impact these actions have on the functioning of our school district and the trust of our stakeholders. And now therefore be it resolved that the Douglas County School District Board of Ed will take the following steps to address these violations and safeguard the best interests of our district. One, engage in comprehensive training 
on board governance, including the Colorado Open Meeting Law, fiduciary duties, and the principle of board holism. Two, conduct a thorough review of our policies and procedures to strengthen safeguards against future violations. And three, implement regular evaluations and audits to ensure compliance with the law, fiduciary responsibilities, and the principles of effective governance. The well-being, success, and future of our students remain at the forefront of our efforts. We will work tirelessly to rebuild trust, repair the damage caused by these violations, and provide the exceptional education our students deserve. That would be my statement. Thank you, Director Meek. Uh, Director Myers. Well, um, all I was going to say tonight is just thank you to Judge Holmes for lifting the injunction on the board and trusting that we will honor the court's decision. Uh, for myself, I'll just reiterate the public statement that I released as one director, and it reads, as one director and an individual defendant, I am glad to move forward and put the termination of the former superintendent in the past. I believe the court was accurate when the judge's order stated, quote, while the individual defendants believe their behavior did not violate Colorado Open Meeting Law, it does not appear they were purposely acting in an unlawful manner. They did not blatantly violate the statute, end quote. I believe the court was right to dismiss the claim to declare the termination of the former superintendent null and void and in the decision not to impose an injunction against the board as we will simply re rely on existing Colorado Open Meeting Law going forward. And that's the end of my statement. Director Ray. So as I've stated to all of you many times, I believe this is the black eye that will never heal of this board unless we respond in an appropriate manner. And to me, that appropriate manner is to present to our community with a clear plan for how these violations will not occur in the future. I get it and I understand the refusal to admit fault, but the fact that the court has ruled twice that Colorado Open Meetings laws were violated should be enough to simply apologize and move on. As I mentioned before, this is the black eye of the board and it is an embarrassment to our district to continue to deny and refuse to accept the consequences has already had a significant impact on our ability to build trust with the community, which ultimately has deprived our students of critical funding for their education. It is egregious and negligent that we have spent and continue to spend much needed district funding on this issue. An issue that could have been resolved over a year ago by simply admitting to mistakes and making a commitment to do better in following the Colorado Open Meetings Law. The language of the court ruling has already been spun to mean many different things to different people, but bottom line is mistakes were made regardless of whether they were intentional, unintentional, or based on insufficient legal advice. As I have repeatedly pleaded over the past year and a half, let's put this to rest by showing our community that we have a plan for ensuring that the board holds itself to a high standard of accountability and is ethical enough to own its actions and take corrective measures as needed. Regardless of whether you agree that Colorado Open Meetings laws were violated or not, there surely is no, no debate that our own policies were violated. When you look at board policy uh, 1.3, the president has no authority to supervise or direct the superintendent. The evidence is clear that the superintendent was directed to consider his employment options and to come back with a response. It also a violation of 1.8.3, board members may not attempt to exercise individual authority over the organization. Meeting with the superintendent 
to discuss his employment options and to talk about going into a different direction is a direct violation of that. I can only imagine if Director Meek and myself were to invite Superintendent Kane to coffee and say, you know what, we want to take a different direction and we would like you to consider your employment options. How outraged the rest of you would be. That's the parallel that I'd like you to think about when you think about owning the mistakes that were made. Regardless of whether you want to admit to breaking the law, you committed a violation against our very own policies. As required by our policy, the board will govern lawfully. And the board will enforce upon itself whatever discipline is needed to govern with excellence. Thank you. When Dr. we oh, are a financial <laughs> liability to this district, I don't believe we are governing with excellence. Part of governing with excellence means accepting consequences for actions and committing to improve so that we are not a distraction to what this great district needs to accomplish. My statement is now finished. Thank you, Director Ray. Uh, Director Williams. Um, mine will be quick. I am thankful to be moving on from this lawsuit. Overall, I am satisfied with the findings within the ruling. I have had the chance to read the ruling in, it, in its entirety. I respect and understand what the court has determined, and as one director, I intend to behave and act accordingly. Director Weininger. Um, I wasn't prepared to have a statement, so I have no statement. Thank you. We'll now move on to item number 33, President Reports. A Board of Education special meeting will be scheduled for 27 June. A Board of Education summer retreat is scheduled for 31 July, Monday. Agenda planning for both meetings is scheduled for this Thursday, 22 June at 10.30 a.m. Um, already just covered the June 27 uh, directions for our finalists. And then I'd just like to summarize by saying thank you to all our committee members for serving this year. And then a final thank you to Chief HRO Thompson for her well-deserved reward. Uh, having been at the first legacy job fair, um, it was a hell of a home game. Uh, what I saw our staff do to um, prioritize people and uh, steer them towards employment with DCSD was outstanding. And again, uh, thank you uh, to Chief HRO Thompson in uh, addressing our needs and everyone that was involved in the Legacy Fair. With that, I will turn it over to Vice President Williams for Vice President items. Um, really, the only thing I have is LRPC, actually, I don't even remember if we talked about this at the last meeting, so tell me if I've already done this, because I might have said did it in my sleep, and I don't really remember. So did we talk, I know Director Meek, with LRPC, we talked about doing a board retreat um, as, as a board with committees. I, before, I think most of us were on the board, I think the only person that's been part of uh, board retreats with the committees is perhaps Director Ray. Um, the rest of us, I don't think, have been a part of those. And I didn't even know they existed before um, LRPC brought it to our attention during um, our, our meeting. I think it was in May, might have been June. But um, anyway, just a thought to maybe consider scheduling those uh, again. I don't, I think they've met at Stone Canyon before. I mean, we can talk about this in greater depth at another time, but just maybe something to put on the agenda in the future, President Peterson. So that's all I have. Uh, Director Meek. I have nothing additional, thanks. Director Ray. Yeah, just to respond to Director Williams, we that was our practice to combine our board retreat with bringing up our committees in the afternoon and we just do some collaborative work with helping them find their focus for the year and that then that work turned into a resolution that we would pass at the following meeting and I, I thought it was really beneficial for all of us to be together and, and work together and and talk about the board's goals and then also encourage our committees to develop their own areas of focus as well so I, I would support something of that nature again I have nothing else to report director Myers 
I just want to give, I had a couple of things and I was kind of considering this, not the last meeting, but the last um, bit of what I want to say to the community. But I do want to have up here, look what they, Mr. Blair put up for me. This is Douglas County um, Foundation, Community Foundation. I'm putting a plug in for our Heroes Gala for the honoring our first responders. And so this will be Thursday, September the 21st, 2023. They're, they're, th this is really a huge fundraiser for this group. And so um, it does conflict with our Hope Online <laughs> fundraiser. So we'll have to figure out who goes where, but I wanted to put the plug in for that. Thank you, Mr. Blair. Um, also, we did, of course, I think you've heard over and over, we've had the DAC meeting. And um, other than the KBB policy, we did have um, Allison Rausch did uh, talk about family, school, and community and a little update on partnerships. Dr. Deanna Kirby talked about the site rubric recommendations and a CDE update. And uh, Colleen Doan gave us, gave us the budget update. So um, kind of my last little bit. Um, as the school year closes, we're kind of closing out the school year. We're going to go forward next week and get our board member. I want to thank those in the community who placed their trust in me to serve on this board. And I want you to continue to remind me that I'm here to serve the Douglas County community, to protect our students, to ensure that we have the highest academic standards free from political bias, to honor our school choice and to work for the rights of parents to be involved in their ch children's education. I'm reminded in Psalm 127 that children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. So this summer, I'm telling our community, parents, play with your kids. Guide them, teach them respect and to take responsibility for their actions, but most of all, love them. And kids, take a break from social media. Hang with your friends, read, get some physical activity, and work on your relationships with your parents, but most of all, have some fun. Douglas County community, I will not quit on you. Finishing is better than starting. Thank you. Director Weininger. Um, the FOC um, also put together a memo regarding their comments on the potential 2023 MLO and bond, and I didn't realize it was final t until today. Um, so I will send that out to everyone and then just have it also attached um, on our August meeting. So it's not forgotten, but I'll make sure everyone has that as well. Okay, hey, thank you, Director Weiniger. Moving on to uh, what should be our last item for this evening. Item number 36, convening executive session to close session pursuant to CRS 246402-4FI for the purpose of conducting a superintendent evaluation. The recommendation is that the Board of Education adjourn the meeting and convene an executive session, a closed session, pursuant to CRS 246402-4FI to discuss a personnel matter specifically for the purpose of conducting the superintendent's evaluation and that superintendent will be present in the closed session and the session will be facilitated by the board's attorney. Request in the meeting will be all six directors, Superintendent Kane and Kristen Egger from the law firm of Kaplan and Ernest for facilitation. Do I have a motion to adjourn and convene in executive se session as stated? So moved. Motion by Myers. Second. Second by Weiniger. I will now take the roll. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. Aye. Passed by a vote of six to zero. This meeting is hereby adjourned and we will convene in the superintendent's conference room in five minutes.